Introduction to The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction As this work professes in its title page to be a descriptive tale, they who will take the trouble to read it may be glad to know how much of its contents is literal fact, and how much is intended to represent a general picture. The author is very sensible that, had he confined himself to the latter, always the most effective, as it is the most valuable mode of conveying knowledge of this nature, he would have made a far better book. But in commencing to describe scenes, and perhaps he may add characters, that were so familiar to his own youth, there was a constant temptation to delineate that which he had known, rather than that which he might have imagined. This rigid adhesion to truth, an indispensable requisite in history and travels, destroys the charm of fiction. For all that is necessary to be conveyed to the mind by the latter had better be done by delineations of principles and of characters in their classes than by too fastidious attention to originals. New York having but one county off Otsego, and the Susquehanna but one proper source, there can be no mistake as to the site of the tale. The history of this district of country, so far as it is concerned with civilized men, is soon told. Otsego, in common with most of the interior of the province of New York, was included in the county of Albany previously to the War of the Separation. It then became, in a subsequent division of territory, a part of Montgomery, and finally, having obtained a sufficient population of its own, it was set apart as a county by itself shortly after the peace of 1783. It lies among those low spurs of the Alleghenies, which cover the Midland counties of New York, and is a little east of a meridional line drawn through the center of the state. As the water of New York flow either southerly into the Atlantic or northerly into Ontario and its outlet, Otsego Lake being the source of the Susquehanna is of necessity among its highest lands. The face of the country, the climate as it is found by the whites, and the manners of the settlers are described with a minuteness for which the author has no other apology than the force of his own recollections. Otsego is said to be a word compounded of ot, a place of meeting, and sago or sago, the ordinary term of salutation used by the Indians of this region. There is a tradition which says that the neighboring tribes were accustomed to meet on the banks of the lake to make their treaties, and otherwise to strengthen their alliances, and which refers the name to this practice. As the Indian agent of New York had a log dwelling at the foot of the lake, however, it is not impossible that the appellation grew out of the meetings that were held at his council fires. The war drove off the agent, in common with the other officers of the crown, and his rude dwelling was soon abandoned. The author remembers it a few years later, reduced to the humble office of a smokehouse. In 1779, an expedition was sent against the hostile Indians who dwelt about a hundred miles west of Otsego on the banks of the Cayuga. The whole country was then in wilderness, and it was necessary to transport the baggage of the troops by means of the rivers, a devious but practicable route. One brigade ascended the Mohawk until it reached the point nearest to the sources of the Susquehanna, 
whence it cut a lane through the forest to the head of the Otsego. The boats and baggage were carried over this portage, and the troops proceeded to the other extremity of the lake, where they disembarked and encamped. The Susquehanna, a narrow though rapid stream at its source, was much filled with floodwood or fallen trees, and the troops adopted a novel expedient to facilitate their passage. The Otsego is about nine miles in length, varying in breadth from half a mile to a mile and a half. The water is of great depth, limpid, and supplied from a thousand springs. At its foot, the banks are rather less than thirty feet high, the remainder of its margin being in mountains, intervals, and points. The outlet, or the Susquehanna, flows through a gorge in the low banks just mentioned, which may have a width of two hundred feet. This gorge was dammed, and the waters of the lake collected. The Susquehanna was converted into a rill. When all was ready, the troops embarked. The dam was knocked away, the Otsego poured out its torrent, and the boats went merrily down with the current. General James Clinton, the brother of George Clinton, then governor of New York, and the father of DeWitt Clinton, who died governor of the same state in 1827, commanded the brigade employed on this duty. During the stay of the troops at the foot of the Otsego, a soldier was shot for desertion. The grave of this unfortunate man was the first place of human internment that the author ever beheld, as the smokehouse was the first ruin. The swivel alluded to in this work was buried and abandoned by the troops on this occasion, and it was subsequently found in digging the cellars of the author's paternal residence. Soon after the close of the war, Washington, accompanied by many distinguished men, visited the scene of this tale, it is said, with a view to examine the facilities for opening a communication by water with other points of the country. He stayed but a few hours. In 1785, the author's father, who had an interest in extensive tracts of land in this wilderness, arrived with a party of surveyors. The manner in which the scene met his eye is described by Judge Temple. At the commencement of the following year, the settlement began, and from that time to this, the country has continued to flourish. It is a singular feature of American life that at the beginning of this century, when the proprietor of the estate had occasion for settlers on a new settlement and in a remote county, he was enabled to draw them from among the increase of the former colony. Although the settlement of this part of Otsego a little preceded the birth of the author, it was not sufficiently advanced to render it desirable that an event so important to himself should take place in the wilderness. Perhaps his mother had a reasonable distrust of the practice of Dr. Todd, who must then have been in the novitiate of his experimental acquirements. Be that as it may, the author was brought an infant into this valley, and all his first impressions were here obtained. He has inhabited it ever since, at intervals, and he thinks he can answer for the faithfulness of the picture he has drawn. Otsego has now become one of the most populous districts of New York. It sends forth its immigrants, like any other old region, and it is pregnant with industry and enterprise. Its manufacturers are prosperous, and it is worthy of remark that one of the most ingenious machines known in European art is derived from the keen ingenuity which is exercised in this remote region. In order to prevent mistake, it may be well to say that the incidents of this tale are purely a fiction. 
the literal facts are chiefly connected with the natural and artificial objects and the customs of the inhabitants. Thus the academy and the courthouse and jail and inn and most similar things are tolerably exact. They have all long since given place to other buildings of a more pretending character. There is also some liberty taken with the truth in the description of the principal dwelling. The real building had no firstly and lastly. It was of bricks and not of stone, and its roof exhibited none of the peculiar beauties of the composite order. It was erected in an age too primitive for that ambitious school of architecture. But the author indulged his recollections freely when he had fairly entered the door. Here, all is literal, even to the severed arm of Wolf and the urn which held the ashes of Queen Dido. Footnote. The forests still crown the mountains of Otsego. The bear, the wolf, and the panther are nearly strangers to them. Even the innocent deer is rarely seen bounding beneath their arches, for the rifle and the activity of the settlers have driven them to other haunts. To this change, which in some particulars is melancholy to one who knew the country in its infancy, it may be added that the Otsego is beginning to be a niggard of its treasures. End footnote. The author has elsewhere said that the character of leather stocking is a creation, rendered probable by such auxiliaries as were necessary to produce that effect. Had he drawn still more upon fancy, the lovers of fiction would not have so much cause for their objections to his work. Still, the picture would not have been in the least true without some substitutes for most of the other personages. The great proprietor resident on his lands, and giving his name to instead of receiving it from his estates as in Europe, is common over the whole of New York. The physician, with his theory rather obtained from than corrected by experiments on the human constitution, the pious, self-denying, laborious, and ill-paid missionary, the half-educated, litigious, envious, and disreputable lawyer, with his counterpoise, a brother of the profession, of better origin and of better character, the shiftless, bargaining, discontented seller of his betterments, the plausible carpenter, and most of the others are more familiar to all who have ever dwelt in a new country. It may be well to say here, a little more explicitly, that there was no real intention to describe with particular accuracy any real characters in this book. It has been often said, and in published statements, that the heroine of this book was drawn after the sister of the writer, who was killed by a fall from a horse now near half a century since. So ingenious is conjecture that a personal resemblance has been discovered between the fictitious character and the deceased relative. It is scarcely possible to describe two females of the same class in life who would be less alike personally than Elizabeth Temple and the sister of the author who met with the deplorable fate mentioned. In a word, they are as unlike in this respect as in history, character, and fortunes. Circumstances rendered the sister singularly dear to the author. After a lapse of half a century, he is writing this paragraph with a pain which would induce him to cancel it, were it not still more painful to have it believed that one whom he regarded with a reverence that surpassed the love of a brother was converted by him into the heroine of a work of fiction. From circumstances which, 
after this introduction, will be obvious to all. The author has had more pleasure in writing The Pioneers than the book will probably ever give any of its readers. He is quite aware of its numerous faults, some of which he has endeavored to repair in this edition. But, as he has an intention at least done his full share of amusing the world, he trusts to its good nature for overlooking this attempt to please himself. End of Introduction This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in the spring of 2008Chapter 1 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Quote, See, winter comes to rule the varied years, sullen and sad, with all his rising train, vapors and clouds and storms. Unquote. By Thompson Near the center of the state of New York lies an extensive district of country whose surface is a succession of hills and dales, or, to speak with greater deference to geographical definitions, of mountains and valleys. It is among these hills that the Delaware takes its rise, and flowing from the limpid lakes and thousand springs of this region, the numerous sources of the Susquehanna meander through the valleys, until, uniting their streams, they form one of the proudest rivers of the United States. The mountains are generally arable to the tops, although instances are not wanting where the sides are jutted with rocks that aid greatly in giving the country that romantic and picturesque character which it so eminently possesses. The vales are narrow, rich, and cultivated, with a stream uniformly winding through each. Beautiful and thriving villages are found interspersed among the margins of the small lakes, or situated at those points of the streams which are favorable for manufacturing. And neat and comfortable farms, with every indication of wealth about them, are scattered profusely through the vales, and even to the mountain tops. Roads diverge in every direction from the even and graceful bottoms of the valleys to the most rugged and intricate passes of the hills. Academies and minor edifices of learning meet the eye of the stranger at every few miles as he winds his way through this uneven territory, and places for the worship of God abound with that frequency which characterize a moral and reflecting people, and with that variety of exterior and canonical government which flows from unfettered liberty of conscience. In short, the whole district is hourly exhibiting how much can be done. In even a rugged country with a severe climate, under the dominion of mild laws, and where every man feels a direct interest in the prosperity of a commonwealth of which he knows himself to form a part. The expedience of the pioneers who first broke ground in the settlement of this country are succeeded by the permanent improvements of the yeoman who intends to leave his remains to molder under the sod which he tills, or perhaps of the sun, 
who, born in the land, piously wishes to linger around the grave of his father. Only forty years have passed since this territory was a wilderness. Footnote. Our tale begins in 1793. About seven years after the commencement of one of the earliest of those settlements, which have conduced to effect that magical change in the power and condition of the state to which we have alluded. End footnote. Very soon after the establishment of the independence of the states by the peace of 1783, the enterprise of their citizens was directed to a development of the natural advantages of their widely extended dominions. Before the War of the Revolution, the inhabited parts of the colony of New York were limited to less than a tenth of its possessions. A narrow belt of country, extending a short distance on either side of the Hudson, with a similar occupation of fifty miles on the banks of the Mohawk, together with the islands of Nassau and Staten, and a few insulated settlements on chosen land along the margins of streams, composed the country, which was then inhabited by less than 200,000 souls. Within the short period we have mentioned, the population has spread itself over five degrees of latitude and seven of longitude, and has swelled to a million and a half inhabitants, who are maintained in abundance, and can look forward to ages before the evil day must arrive when their possessions shall become unequal to their wants. It was near the setting of the sun, on a clear, cold day in December, when a sleigh was moving slowly up one of the mountains in the district we have described. The day had been fine for the season, and but two or three large clouds, whose color seemed brightened by the light reflected from the mass of snow that covered the earth, floated in a sky of the purest blue. The road wound along the brow of a precipice, and on one side was upheld by a foundation of logs piled one upon the other, while a narrow excavation in the mountain in the opposite direction had made a passage of sufficient width for the ordinary traveling of that day. But logs, excavation, and everything that did not reach several feet above the earth lay alike buried beneath the snow. A single track, barely wide enough to receive the sleigh, denoted the route of the highway, and this was sunk nearly two feet below the surrounding surface. Footnote. Sleigh is the word used in every part of the United States to denote a traineau. It is of local use in the west of England, whence it is most probably derived by the Americans. The latter draw a distinction between a sled or sledge and a sleigh. The sleigh being shod with metal. Sleighs are also subdivided into two horse and one horse sleighs. Of the latter, there are the cutter, with fill so arranged as to permit the horse to travel in the side track, the pung or tow pung, which is driven with a pole, and the gumper, a rude construction used for temporary purposes in the new countries. Many of the American sleighs are elegant, though the use of this mode of conveyance is much lessened with the amelioration of the climate consequent to the clearing of the forest. And footnote. In a vale which lay at a distance of several hundred feet lower, there was what in the language of the country was called a clearing, and all the usual improvements of a new settlement. These even extended up the hill to the point where the road turned short and ran across the level land which lay on the summit of the mountain. But the summit itself remained in the forest. There was glittering in the atmosphere, 
as if it was filled with innumerable shining particles, and the noble bay horses that drew the sleigh were covered in many parts of their coat of hoarfrost. The vapor from their nostrils was seen to issue like smoke, and every object in the view, as well as every arrangement of the travelers, denoted the depth of winter in the mountains. The harness, which was of a deep, dull black, differing from the glossy varnishing of the present day, was ornamented with enormous plates and buckles of brass that shone like gold in those transient beams of the sun which found their way obliquely through the tops of the trees. Huge saddles studded with nails and fitted with cloth that served as blankets to the shoulders of the cattle supported four high square-topped turrets through which the stout reins led from the mouths of the horses to the hands of the driver, who was a negro of apparently twenty years of age. His face, which nature had colored with a glistening black, was now mottled with the cold, and his large shining eyes filled with tears, a tribute to its power that the keen frost of those regions always extracted from one of his African origin. Still, there was a smiling expression of good humor in his happy countenance that was created by the thoughts of home and a Christmas fireside with its Christmas frolics. The sleigh was one of those large, comfortable, old-fashioned conveyances which would admit a whole family within its bosom, but which now contained only two passengers besides the driver. The color of its outside was a modest green, and that of its inside a fiery red. The latter was intended to convey the idea of heat in that cold climate. Large buffalo skins trimmed around the edges with red cloth cut into festoons covered the back of the sleigh, and were spread over its bottom and drawn up around the feet of the travelers one of whom was a man of middle age, and the other a female just entering into womanhood. The former was of large stature, but the precautions he had taken to guard against the cold left but little of his person exposed to view. A great coat that was abundantly ornamented by a profusion of furs enveloped the whole of his figure excepting the head, which was covered with a cap of marten skins lined with morocco, the sides of which were made to fall if necessary, and were now drawn close over the ears and fastened beneath his chin with a black ribbon. The top of the cap was surmounted with the tail of the animal whose skin had furnished the rest of the materials, which fell back not ungracefully, a few inches behind the head. From beneath this mask were to be seen part of a fine manly face, and particularly a pair of expressive large blue eyes that promised extraordinary intellect, covert humor, and great benevolence. The form of his companion was literally hid beneath the garments she wore. There were furs and silks peeping from under a large camlet cloak with a thick flannel lining that by its cut and size was evidently intended for a masculine wearer. A huge hood of black silk that was quilted with down concealed the whole of her head, except that a small opening in front for beneath through which occasionally sparked a pair of animated, jet-black eyes. Both the father and daughter, for such was the connection between the two travelers, were too much occupied with their reflections to break a stillness that derived little or no interruption from the easy gliding of the sleigh by the sound of their voices. The former was thinking of the wife 
that had held this their only child to her bosom, when, four years before, she had reluctantly consented to relinquish the society of her daughter, in order that the latter might enjoy the advantages of an education which the city of New York could only offer at that period. A few months afterward, death had deprived him of the remaining companion of his solitude. But still, he had enough real regard for his child not to bring her into the comparative wilderness in which he dwelt, until the full period had expired to which he had limited her juvenile labors. The reflections of the daughter were less melancholy, and mingled with a pleased astonishment at the novel scenery she met at every turn in the road. The mountain on which they were journeying was covered with pines that rose without a branch some seventy or eighty feet, and which frequently doubled that height by the addition of the tops. Through the innumerable vistas that opened beneath the lofty trees, the eye could penetrate until it was met by a distant inequality in the ground, or was stopped by a view of the summit of the mountain, which lay on the opposite side of the valley to which they were hastening. The dark trunks of the trees rose from the pure white of the snow in regularly formed shafts, until at a great height their branches shot forth horizontal limbs that were covered with the meager foliage of an evergreen, affording a melancholy contrast to the torpor of nature below. To the travelers there seemed to be no wind, but these pines waved majestically at their topmost boughs, sending forth a dull plaintive sound that was quite in consonance with the rest of the melancholy scene. The sleigh had glided for some distance along the even surface, and the gaze of the female was bent in inquisitive and, perhaps, timid glances into the recesses of the forest, when a loud and continued howling was heard, pealing under the long arches of the woods like the cry of a numerous pack of hounds. The instant the sounds reached the ear of the gentleman, he cried aloud to the black, Hold up, Aggie! There is old Hector! I should know his bay among ten thousand. The leather stocking has put his hounds into the hills this clear day, and they have started their game. There is a deer track a few rods ahead, and now, Bess, if thou canst muster courage enough to stand fire, I will give thee a saddle for thy Christmas dinner. The black drew up with a cheerful grin upon his chilled features, and began thrashing his arm together in order to restore the circulation of his fingers, while the speaker stood erect, and throwing aside his outer covering, stepped from the sleigh upon a bank of snow, which sustained his weight without yielding. In a few moments the speaker succeeded in extricating a double-barreled filing piece from among a multitude of trunks and bandboxes. After throwing aside the thick mittens which had encased his hands, there now appeared a pair of leather gloves tipped with fur. He examined his priming, and was about to move forward when the light bounding noise of an animal plunging through the woods was heard, and a fine buck darted into the path a short distance ahead of him. The appearance of the animal was sudden, and his flight inconceivably rapid but the traveler appeared to be too keen a sportsman to be disconcerted by either. As it came first into view, he raised the filing piece to his shoulder, and with a practiced eye and steady hand, drew the trigger. The deer dashed forward, undaunted and apparently unhurt. Without lowering his piece, the traveler turned its muzzle toward his victim and fired again, Neither discharge, however, seemed to have taken effect. The whole scene had passed with a rapidity that confused the female, who was unconsciously rejoicing in the escape of the buck. As he rather darted like a meteor 
then ran across the road, when a sharp, quick sound struck her ear, quite different from the full round reports of her father's gun, but still sufficiently distinct to be known as the concussion produced by firearms. At the same instant that she heard this unexpected report, the buck sprang from the snow to a great height in the air, and directly a second discharge, similar to the sound of the first, followed, when the animal came to the earth, failing headlong and rolling all over on the crust with its own velocity. A loud shout was given by the unseen marksman and a couple of men instantly appeared from behind the trunks of two of the pines, where they had evidently placed themselves in expectation of the passage of the deer. Ha, ah, Natty! Had I known you were in ambush, I should not have fired, cried the traveller, moving toward the spot where the deer lay, near to which he was followed by the delighted black with his sleigh. But the sound of old Hector was too exhilarating to be quiet, though I hardly think I struck him, either. No, no, Judge, returned the hunter, with an inward chuckle, and with that look of exultation that indicates a consciousness of superior skill. You burnt your powder only to warm your nose this cold evening. Did ye think to stop a full-grown buck with Hector and the slut, open upon him within sound? With that pop gun in your hand? There's plenty of pheasants among the swamps, and the snowbirds are flying round your own door where you may feed them with crumbs and shoot them at pleasure any day. But if you're for a buck, or a little bear's meat, Judge, you'll have to take the long rifle with a greased wadding, or you'll waste more powder than you'll fill stomachs, I'm thinking. As the speaker concluded, he drew his bare hand across the bottom of his nose and again opened his enormous mouth with a kind of inward laugh. The gun scatters well, Matty, and it's killed a deer before now, said the traveler, smiling good-humoredly. One barrel was charged with buckshot, but the other was loaded for birds only. Here are two hurts, one through the neck and the other directly through the heart. It is by no means certain, Natty, that I gave him one of the two. Let who will kill him, said the hunter rather surly. I suppose the creature is to be eaten. So saying, he drew a large knife from a leathern sheath, which was stuck through his girdle or sash, and cut the throat of the animal. If there are two balls through the deer, I would ask if there weren't two rifles fired. Besides, who ever saw such a ragged hole from a smooth bore as this through the neck? And you will own yourself, Judge, that the buck fell at the last shot, which was sent from a truer and younger hand than yourn or mine either. But for my part, although I am a poor man, I can live without the venison, but I don't love to give up my lawful dues in a free country, though for the matter of that, might often makes right here as well as in the old country, for what I can see. An air of sullen dissatisfaction pervaded the manner of the hunter during the whole of his speech, yet he thought it prudent to utter the close of the sentence in such an undertone as to leave nothing audible but the grumbling sounds of his voice. Nay, Natty, rejoined the traveller, with undisturbed good humour, it is for the honour that I contend. A few dollars will pay for the venison, but what will requite me for the lost honour of the buck's tail in my cap? Think, Natty, how I should triumph over that quizzling dog, Dick Jones, who has failed seven times already this season, and has only brought in one woodchuck and few gray squirrels. 
Ah, the game is becoming too hard to find. Indeed, Judge. With your clearings and betterments, said the old hunter, with a kind of compelled resignation, the time was when I have shot thirteen deer without counting the fawns standing in the door of my own hut. And for bear's meat, if one wanted a ham or so, he had only to watch a night's, and he could shoot one by moonlight through the cracks of the logs. No fear of oversleeping himself, either, for the howling the wolves was certain to keep his eyes open. There's old Hector, panting with affection, a tall hound of black and yellow spots with white belly and legs, that just then came in on the scent, accompanied by the slut he had mentioned. See where the wolves bit his throat the night I drove them from the venison that was smoking on the chimney top? That dog is more to be trusted than many a Christian man, for he never forgets a friend and loves the hand that gives him bread. There was a peculiarity in the manner of the hunter that attracted the notice of the young female, who had been a close and interested observer of his appearance and equipments. From the moment he came into view, he was tall, and so meager as to make him seem above even the six feet that he actually stood in his stockings. On his head, which was thinly covered with lank sandy hair, he wore a cap made of fox skin, resembling in shape the one we have already described, although much inferior in finish and ornaments. His face was skinny and thin, almost to emaciation, but yet it bore no signs of disease. On the contrary, it had every indication of the most robust and enduring health. The cold and exposure had, together, given a colorful uniform red. His gray eyes were glancing under a pair of shaggy brows that overhung them in long hairs of gray, mingled with their natural hue. His scraggy neck was bare, and burnt to the same tint with his face. Although a small part of a shirt collar made of the country check was to be seen above the overdress he wore. A kind of coat made of dressed deerskin, with the hair on, was belted close to his lank body by a girdle of colored worsted. On his feet were deerskin moccasins ornamented with porcupine's quills, after the manner of the Indians and his limbs were guarded with long leggings of the same material as the moccasins, which, gartering above the knees of his tarnished buckskin breeches, had obtained for him among the settlers the nickname of Leather Stocking. Over his left shoulder was slung a belt of deerskin, from which depended an enormous ox horn, so thinly scraped as to discover the powder it contained. The larger end was fitted ingeniously and securely with a wooden bottom, and the other was stopped tight by a little plug. A leathern pouch hung before him, from which, as he concluded his last speech, he took a small measure, and filling it accurately with powder, he commenced reloading the rifle, which, as its butt rested on the snow before him, reached nearly to the top of his fox-skin cap. The traveler had been closely examining the wounds during these movements, and now, without heeding the ill-humor of the hunter's manner, he exclaimed, I would fain establish a right, Maddy, to the honor of this death, and surely, if the hit in the neck be mine, it is enough, for the shot in the heart was unnecessary what we call an act of supererogation, leather stocking. You may call it what learned name you please, Judge, said the hunter, throwing his rifle across his left arm and knocking up a brass lid in the breech. 
from which he took a small piece of greased leather, and wrapping a bale in it, forced them down by main strength on the powder, where he continued to pound them while speaking. It's far easier to call names than to shoot a buck on the spring, but the creature came to his end from a younger hand than either urine or mine, as I said before. "'What say you, my friend?' cried the traveller, turning pleasantly to Natty's companion. "'Shall we toss up this dollar for the honour, and you keep the silver if you lose? What say you, friend?' "'That I killed the deer,' answered the young man, with a little haughtiness, as he leaned on another long rifle, similar to that of Natty. "'Here are two to one, indeed,' replied the judge with a smile. "'I am outvoted, overruled, as we say on the bench. "'There is Aggie. "'He can't vote, being a slave, and Bess is a minor. "'So I must even make the best of it. "'But you'll send me the venison and the deuces in it. "'But I make a good story about its death.' "'This meat is not mine to sell,' said Leatherstocking, adopting a little of his companion's hauteur. "'For my part, I've known animals travel for days with shots in the neck, and I'm none of them who rob a man of his rightful dues.' "'You are tenacious of your rights this cold evening, Natty,' returned the judge with unconquerable good nature. "'But what say you, young man?' Will three dollars pay you for the buck? First, let us determine the question of right to the satisfaction of us both, said the youth firmly, but respectfully, and with a pronunciation and language vastly superior to his appearance. With how many shot did you load your gun? With five, sir, said the judge, a little struck with the other's manner. Are they not enough to slay a buck like this? One would do it, but... Moving to the tree from behind which he had appeared, You know, sir, you fired in this direction. Here are four of the bullets in the tree. The judge examined the fresh marks in the bark of the pine, and shaking his head said with a laugh, You are making out the case against yourself. My young advocate, where is the fifth? Here, said the youth, throwing aside the rough overcoat that he wore, and exhibiting a hole in his undergarment, through which large drops of blood were oozing. Good God! exclaimed the judge with horror. Have I been trifling here about an empty distinction, and a fellow creature suffering from my hands without a murmur? But hasten, quick! Get into my sleigh. It is but a mile to the village, where surgical aid can be obtained. All shall be done at my expense, and thou shalt live with me until my, thy wound is healed. I am forever afterward. I thank you for your good intention, but I must decline your offer. I have a friend who would be uneasy were he to hear that I am hurt and away from him. The injury is but slight, and the bullet has missed the bones. But I believe, sir, you will now admit me title to the venison. Admit it, repeated the agitated judge. I here give thee a right to shoot deer or bears or anything thou pleasest in my woods forever. Leatherstocking is the only other man that I have granted the same privilege to, and the time is coming when it will be of value. But I buy your deer here. This bill will pay thee both for thy shot and my own. The old hunter gathered his tall person up into an air of pride during this dialogue, but he waited until the other had done speaking. There's them living who say that Nathaniel Bumpo's right to shoot on these hills is of older date than Marmaduke Temple's right to forbid him, he said. But if there is a law about it at all, though who ever heard of a law that a man shouldn't kill deer where he pleased, but if there is a law at all, it should keep people from the use of smoothbores. 
A body never knows where his lead will fly when he pulls the trigger on one of them uncertain firearms. Without attending to the soliloquy of Natty, the youth bowed his head silently to the offer of the banknote and replied, Excuse me, I have need of the venison. But this will buy you many, dear, said the judge. Take it, I entreat you. And lowering his voice to a whisper, he added, It is for a hundred dollars. For an instant only the youth seemed to hesitate, and then blushing, even through the high color that the cold had given his cheeks, as if an inward shame at his own weakness, he again declined the offer. During this scene the female arose, and regardless of the cold air she threw back the hood which concealed her features, and now spoke with great earnestness. Surely, surely, young man, sir, you you would not pain my father so much as to have him think that he leaves a poor fellow creature in this wilderness whom his own hand has injured. I entreat you will go with us and receive medical aid. Whether his wound became more painful or there was something irresistible in the voice and manner of the fair pleader for her father's feelings, we know not, but the distance of the young man's manner was sensibly softened by this appeal, and he stood in apparent doubt, as if reluctant to comply with, and yet unwilling to refuse her request. The judge, for such being his office much in future be his title, watched with no little interest the display of this singular contention in the feelings of the youth, and advancing kindly took his hand as he pulled him gently toward the sleigh, urged him to enter it. There is no human aid dearer than Templeton, he said, and the hut of Natty is full three miles from this. Come, come, my young friend, go with us, and let the new doctor Look to the shoulder of thine. Here is Natty. We'll take the tidings of thy welfare to thy friend, and, shouldst you thou require it, thou shalt return home in the morning. The young man succeeded in extricating his hand from the warm grasp of the judge, but he continued to gaze on the face of the female, who, regardless of the cold, was still standing with her fine features exposed which expressed feeling that eloquently seconded the request of her father. Leatherstocking stood, in the meantime, leaning upon his long rifle, with his head turned a little to one side, as if engaged in sagacious musing, when, having apparently satisfied his doubts, by revolving the subject in his mind, he broke silence. It may be best to go, lad, after all. For if the shot hangs under the skin, my hand is getting too old to be cutting into human flesh, as I once used to, though some thirty years agone, in the old war, when I was out under Sir William, I traveled seventy miles alone in the howling wilderness with a rifle bullet in my thigh, and then cut it out with my own jackknife. Old Indian John knows the time well. I met him with a party of the Delawares, on the trail of the Iroquois who had been down and taken five scalps on the Shoharry. But I made a mark on the redskin that I warrant he'll carry to his grave. I took him on the posterium, saving the lady's presence, as he got up from the ambushment, and rattled three buckshots into his naked hide, so close that you might have laid a broad joe upon them all. Here Natty stretched out his long neck, and straightened his body, as he opened his mouth which exposed a single tusk of yellow bone, while his eyes, his face, even his whole frame seemed to laugh, although no sound was emitted except that kind of thick hissing as he inhaled his breath in quavers. I had lost my bullet mold in crossing the Oneida outlet, and had to make shift with the buckshot, but the rifle was true, and didn't scatter like your two-legged thing here, Judge. 
which don't do, I find, to hunt in company with. Natty's apology to the delicacy of the young lady was unnecessary, for while he was speaking she was too much employed in helping her father to remove certain articles of baggage to hear him. Unable to resist the kind urgency of the travelers any longer, the youth, though still with an unaccountable reluctance, suffered himself to be persuaded to enter the sleigh. The black, with the aid of his master, threw the buck across the baggage, and entering the vehicle themselves, the judge invited the hunter to do so likewise. No, no, said the old roan, shaking his head. I have work to do at home this Christmas Eve. Drive on with the boy, and let your doctor look to the shoulder. Though if he will only cut out the shot, I have yerbs that will heal the wound quicker than all his foreign ointments. He turned, and was about to move off, when suddenly recollecting himself, he again faced the party and added, If you see anything of Indian John about the foot of the lake, you had better take him with you and let him lend the doctor a hand, for old as he is, he is curious at cuts and bruises, and he is likelier than not he'll be in with brooms to sweep your Christmas hearths. Stop! Stop! cried the youth, catching the arm of the black as he prepared to urge his horses forward. Natty, you need say nothing of the shot, nor of where I am going. Remember, Natty, as you love me. Trust old Leatherstocking, returned the hunter significantly. He hasn't lived fifty years in the wilderness, and not learnt from the savages how to hold his tongue. Trust me, lad, and remember old Indian John. And Natty, said the youth eagerly, still holding the black by the arm, I will just get the shot extracted, and bring you up to-night a quarter of the buck for the Christmas dinner. He was interrupted by the hunter, who held up his finger with an expressive gesture for silence. He then moved softly along the margin of the road, keeping his eyes steadfastly fixed on the branches of a pine. When he had obtained such a position as he wished, he stood, and cocking his rifle, threw one leg far behind him, and stretching his left arm to its utmost extent along the barrel of his piece, he began slowly to raise its muscle in a line with the straight trunk of the tree. The eyes of the group in the sleigh naturally preceded the movement of the rifle, and they soon discovered the object of Natty's aim. On a small dead branch of the pine, which at the distance of seventy feet from the ground shot out horizontally, immediately beneath the living members of the tree sat a bird that, in the vulgar language of the country, was indiscriminately called a pheasant or a partridge. In size, it was but little smaller than a common barnyard fowl. The baying of the dogs, and the conversation that had passed near the root of the tree on which it was perched, had alarmed the bird, which was now drawn up near the body of the pine, with a head and neck so erect as to form nearly a straight line with its legs. As soon as the rifle bore on the victim, Natty drew his trigger, and the partridge fell from its height with a force that buried it in the snow. "'Lie down, you old villain!' exclaimed Leatherstocking, shaking his ramrod at Hector as he bounded toward the foot of the tree. "'Lie down, I say!' The dog obeyed, and Natty proceeded with great rapidity, though with the nicest accuracy, to reload his piece. When this was ended, he took up his game, and showing it to the party, without a head he cried, "'Here is a tidbit for the old man's Christmas!' Never mind the venison boy, and remember Indian John. His yarbs are better than all the foreign intments. Here, Judge, holding up the bird again, do you think a smooth boar would pick game off of their roost, and not ruffle a feather? The old man gave another of his remarkable laughs, which partook so largely of exultation, mirth, and irony. And, shaking his head, he turned with his rifle at a trail, and moved into the forest with steps that were between a walk and a trot. At each movement he made his body lowered several inches. 
his knees yielding with an inclination inward. But as the sleigh turned at a bend in the road, the youth cast his eyes in quest of his old companion, and he saw that he was already nearly concealed by the trunks of the tree while his dogs were following quietly in his footsteps, occasionally scenting the deer track, that they seemed to know instinctively was now of no further use to them. Another jerk was given to the sleigh, and leather stocking was hid from view. End of chapter 1 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon Chapter 2 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 Quote, all places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Unquote. From Richard II. An ancestor of Marmaduke Temple had, about a hundred and twenty years before the commencement of our tale, come to the colony of Pennsylvania, a friend and co-religionist of its great patron. Old Marmaduke, for this formidable prenomen was a kind of appellative to the race, brought with him to that asylum of the persecuted an abundance of the good things of this life. He became the master of many thousands of acres of uninhabited territory, and the supporter of many a score of dependents. He lived greatly respected for his piety, and not a little distinguished as a secretary, was entrusted by his associates with many important political stations, and died just in time to escape the knowledge of his own poverty. It was his lot to share the fortune of most of those who brought wealth with them into the new settlements of the middle colonies. The consequence of an immigrant into these provinces was generally to be ascertained by the number of his white servants or dependents, and the nature of the public situations that he held. Taking this rule as a guide, the ancestor of our judge must have been a man of no little note. It is, however, a subject of curious inquiry at the present day to look into the brief records of that early period, and observe how regular, and with few exceptions, how inevitable, were the gradations on one hand of the masters to poverty, and on the other of their servants to wealth. Accustomed to ease, and unequal to the struggles incident to an infant society, the affluent immigrant was barely enabled to maintain his own rank by the weight of his personal superiority and acquirements. But the moment that his head was laid in the grave, his indolent and comparatively uneducated offspring were compelled to yield precedency to the more active energies of a class whose exertion had been stimulated by necessity. This is a very common course of things, even in the present state of the Union, but it was peculiarly the fortunes of the two extremes of society in the peaceful and unenterprising colonies of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. The posterity of Marmaduke did not escape the common lot of those who depend rather on their hereditary possessions than on their own powers and in the third generation they had descended to a point below which, in this happy country, it is barely possible for honesty 
intellect, and sobriety to fall. The same pride of family that had by its self-satisfied indolence conduced to aid their fail, now became a principle to stimulate them to endeavor to rise again. The feeling from being morbid was changed to a healthful and active desire to emulate the character, the condition, and, peradventure, the wealth of their ancestors also. It was the father of our new acquaintance, the judge, who first began to reascend in the scale of society, and, in this undertaking, he was not a little assisted by a marriage, which aided in furnishing the means of educating his only son in a rather better manner than the low state of the common schools of Pennsylvania could promise, or that had been the practice in the family for the two or three preceding generations. At the school, where the reviving prosperity of his father was enabled to maintain him, young Marmaduke formed an intimacy with a youth whose years were about equal to his own. This was a fortunate connection for our judge, and paved the way for most of his future elevation in life. There was not only great wealth, but high court interest among the connections of Edward Effingham. They were one of the few families then resident in the colonies who thought it a degradation to its members to descend to the pursuits of commerce, and who never emerged from the privacy of domestic life unless to preside in the councils of the colony or to bear arms in her defense. The latter had from youth been the only employment of Edward's father. Military rank under the crown of Britain was attained with much longer probation and by much more toilsome service sixty years ago than at the present time. Years were passed without murmuring in the subordinate grades of the service, and those soldiers who were stationed in the colonies felt, when they obtained the command of a company, that they were entitled to receive the greatest deference from the peaceful occupants of the soil. Any one of our readers who has the occasion to cross the Niagara may easily observe not only the self-importance, but the real estimation enjoyed by the humblest representative of the crown. Even in that polar region of royal sunshine, such and at no very distant period was the respect paid to the military in these states, where now happily no symbol of war is ever seen, unless at the free and tearless voice of their people. When, therefore, the father of Marmaduke's friend, after forty years' service, retired with the rank of major, maintaining in his domestic establishment a comparative splendor, he became a man of the first consideration in his native colony, which was that of New York. He had served with fidelity and courage, and having been according to the custom of the provinces, entrusted with commands much superior to those to which he was entitled by rank with reputation also, when Major Effingham yielded to the claims of age, he retired with dignity refusing his half-pay, or any other compensation for services, that he felt he could no longer perform. The ministry proffered various civil offices, which yielded not only honor, but profit. But he declined them all, with a chivalrous independence and loyalty that had marked his character through life. The veteran soon caused this set of patriotic disinterestedness to be followed by another of private munificence. That, however, little it accorded with prudence was in perfect conformity with the simple integrity of his own views. The friend of Marmaduke was his only child, and to this son, on his marriage with a lady to whom the father was particularly partial, the major gave a complete conveyance of his whole estate, 
consisting of money in the funds, a town and country residence, sundry valuable farms in the old parts of the colony, and large tracts of wild land in the new, in this manner throwing himself upon the final piety of his child for his own future maintenance. Major Effingham, in declining the liberal offers of the British ministry, had subjected himself to the suspicion of having attained his dotage by all those who thronged the avenues to court patronage, even in the remotest corners of that vast empire. But when he thus voluntarily stripped himself of his great personal wealth, the remainder of the community seemed instinctively to adopt the conclusion also that he had reached a second childhood. This may explain the fact of his importance rapidly declining, and, if privacy was his object, the veteran had soon a free indulgence of his wishes. Whatever views the world might entertain of this act of the major, to himself and to his child it seemed no more than a natural gift by a father of whose immunities, which he could no longer enjoy or improve, to a son, who was formed both by nature and education, to do both. The younger Effingham did not object to the amount of the donation, for he felt that while his parent reserved a moral control over his actions, he was relieving himself of a fatiguing burden. Such indeed, was the confidence existing between them, that to neither did it seem anything more than removing money from one pocket to another. One of the first acts of the young man, on coming into possession of his wealth, was to seek his early friend, with a view to offer any assistance that it was now in his power to bestow. The death of Marmaduke's father, and the consequent division of his small estate, rendered such an offer extremely acceptable to the young Pennsylvanian. He felt his own powers, and saw not only the excellences, but the foibles in the character of his friend. Effingham was by nature indolent, confiding, and at times impetuous and indiscreet. But Marmaduke was uniformly equable, penetrating, and full of activity and enterprise. To the latter, therefore, the assistance, or rather connection, that was proffered to him, seemed to produce a mutual advantage. It was cheerfully accepted, and the arrangement of its conditions was easily completed. A mercantile house was established, in the metropolis of Pennsylvania, with the avails of Mr. Effingham's personal property, all, or nearly all, of which was put into the possession of Temple, who was the only ostensible proprietor of the concern, while in secret the other was entitled to an equal participation in the profits. This connection was thus kept private for two reasons, one of which, in the freedom of their intercourse, was frankly avowed to Marmaduke, while the other continued profoundly hid in the bosom of his friend. The last was nothing more than pride. To the descendant of a line of soldiers, commerce, even in that indirect manner, seemed a degrading pursuit, but an insuperable obstacle to the disclosure existed in the prejudices of his father. We have already said that Major Effingham had served as a soldier with reputation. On one occasion, while in command of the western frontier of Pennsylvania against the League of the French and Indians, not only his glory, but the safety of himself and his troop were jeopardized by the peaceful policy of that colony. To the soldier, this was an unpardonable offense. He was fighting in their defense. 
he knew that the mild practices of this little nation of practical Christians would be disregarded by their subtle and malignant enemies, and he felt the injury the more deeply because he saw that the avowed object of the colonists in withholding their succors would only have a tendency to expose his command without preserving the peace. The soldier succeeded, after a desperate conflict, in extricating himself with a handful of his men from their murderous enemy, but he never forgave the people who had exposed him to a danger which they left him to combat alone. It was in vain to tell him that they had no agency in his being placed on their frontier at all. It was evidently for their benefit that he had been so placed and it was their, quote, religious duty, unquote, so the Major always expressed it, it was their religious duty to have supported him. At no time was the old soldier an admirer of the peaceful disciples of Fox. Their disciplined habits, both of mind and body, had endowed them with great physical perfection, and the eye of the veteran, was apt to scan the fair proportions and athletic frames of the colonist with a look that seemed to utter volumes of contempt for their moral imbecility. He was also a little addicted to the expression of a belief that, where there was so great an observance of the externals of religion, there could not be much of the substance. It is not our task to explain what is or what ought to be the substance of Christianity, but merely to record in this place the opinions of Major Effingham. Knowing the sentiments of the father in relation to this people, it was no wonder that the son hesitated to avow his connection with, nay, even his dependency on the integrity of a Quaker. It had been said that Marmaduke deduced his origin from the contemporaries and friends of Penn. His father had married without the pale of the church to which he belonged, and had, in this manner, forfeited some of the privileges of his offspring. Still, as young Marmaduke was educated in a colony and society, where even the ordinary intercourse between friends was tinctured, with the aspect of this mild religion, his habits and language were somewhat marked by its peculiarities. His own marriage, at a future day, with a lady without not only the pale, but the influence of this sect of religionists, had a tendency, it is true, to weaken his early impressions. Still, he retained them in some degree to the hour of his death and was observed uniformly, when much interested or agitated, to speak in the language of his youth. But this is anticipating our tale. When Marmaduke first became the partner of young Effingham, he was quite the Quaker in externals, and it is not too dangerous an experiment for the son to think of encountering the prejudices of the father on this subject. The connection, therefore, remained a profound secret to all those who were interested in it. For a few years Marmaduke directed the commercial operations of his house with a prudence and sagacity that afforded rich returns. He married the lady we have mentioned, who was the mother of Elizabeth, and the visits of his friends were becoming more frequent. There was a speedy prospect of removing the veil from their intercourse, as its advantages became each hour more apparent to Mr. Effingham, when the troubles that preceded the War of the Revolution extended themselves to an alarming degree. Educated in the most dependent loyalty, Mr. Effingham had, from the commencement of the disputes between the colonists and the Crown, warmly maintained that he believed to be the just prerogatives of his prince while on the other hand the clear head and independent mind of Temple had induced him to espouse the cause of the people. Both might have been influenced by early impressions, 
forth the son of the loyal and gallant soldier, bowed in implicit obedience to the will of his sovereign, the descendant of the persecuted followers of Penn, looked back with little bitterness on the unmerited wrongs that had been heaped on his ancestors. This difference in opinion had long been a subject of an amical dispute between them, but latterly the contest was getting to be too important to admit of a trivial discussions on the part of Marmaduke, whose acute discernment was already catching faint glimmerings of the important events that were in embryo. The sparks of dissension soon kindled into a blaze, and the colonies, or rather as they quickly declared themselves, the states, became a scene of strife and bloodshed for years. A short time before the Battle of Lexington, Mr. Effingham, already a widower, transmitted to Marmaduke for safekeeping all his valuable effects and papers, and left the colony without his father. The war had, however, scarcely commenced in earnest when he reappeared in New York, wearing the livery of his king, and in short time he took the field at the head of a provincial corps. In the meantime, Marmaduke had completely committed himself in the cause, as it was then called, of the rebellion. Of course, all intercourse between the friends ceased. On the part of Colonel Effingham, it was unsought, and on that of Marmaduke, there was a cautious reserve. It soon became necessary for the latter to abandon the capital of Philadelphia, but he had taken the precaution to remove the whole of his effects beyond the reach of the royal forces, including the papers of his friend also. There he continued serving his country during the struggle, in various civil capacities, and always with dignity and usefulness. While, however, he discharged his functions with credit and fidelity. Marmaduke never seemed to lose sight of his own interests, for when the estates of the adherents of the crown fell under the hammer by the acts of confiscation, he appeared in New York and became the purchaser of extensive possessions at comparatively low prices. It is true that Marmaduke, by thus purchasing estates that had been wrestled by violence from others, rendered himself obnoxious to the censures of that sect, which at the same time that it discards its children from a full participation in the family union, seems ever unwilling to abandon them entirely to the world. But either his success, or the frequency of the transgression in others, soon wiped off this slight stain from his character. And although there were a few who, dissatisfied with their own fortunes, or conscious of their own demerits, would make dark hints concerning the sudden prosperity of the, of the unportioned Quaker, yet his service, and possibly his wealth, soon drove the recollection of these vague conjectures from men's minds. When the war ended, and the independence of the states was acknowledged, Mr. Temple turned his attention from the pursuit of commerce, which was then fluctuating and uncertain, to the settlement of those tracts of land which he had purchased. Aided by a good deal of money, and directed by the suggestions of a strong and practical reason, his enterprise throve to a degree that the climate and rugged face of the country which he selected would seem to forbid. His property increased in a tenfold ratio, and he was already ranked among the most wealthy and important of his countrymen. To inherit this wealth, he had but one child, the daughter whom we have introduced to the reader, and whom he was now conveying from school to preside over a household that had too long wanted a mistress. When the district in which his estates lay had become sufficiently populous to be set off as a county, Mr. Temple had, according to the custom of the new settlements, 
been selected to fill its highest judicial station. This might make a Templar smile, but in addition to the apology of necessity, there is ever a dignity in talents and experience that is commonly sufficient in any station for the protection of its possessor, and Marmaduke, more fortunate in his native clearness of mind than the judge of King Charles, not only decided right, but was generally able to give a very good reason for it. At all times, such was the universal practice of the country, and the times and Judge Temple, so far from ranking among the lowest of his judicial contemporaries in the courts of the new counties, felt himself and was unanimously acknowledged to be among the first. We shall here close this brief explanation of the history and character of some of our personages, leaving them in future to speak and act for themselves. End of chapter 2 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania Chapter 3 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 Quote, All that thou seest is nature's handiwork. These rocks that upward throw their mossy brawl, like castled pinnacles of elder times, these venerable stems that slowly rock their towering branches in the wintry gale, that field of frost which glitters in the sun, mocking the whiteness of a marble breast, yet man can mar such works with his rude taste like some sad spoiler of a virgin's fame. Unquote. Duo. Some little while elapsed ere Marmaduke Temple was sufficiently recovered from his agitation to scan the person of his new companion. He now observed that he was a youth of some two or three and twenty years of age, and rather above the middle height. Further observation was prevented by the rough overcoat which was belted close to his form by a worsted sash, much like the one worn by the old hunter. The eyes of the judge, after resting a moment on the figure of the stranger, were raised to a scrutiny of his countenance. There had been a look of care visible in the features of the youth when he first entered the sleigh that had not only attracted the notice of Elizabeth, but which she had been much puzzled to interpret. His anxiety seemed the strongest when he was enjoining his old companion to secrecy, and even when he had decided, and was rather passively suffering himself to be conveyed to the village, the expression of his eyes by no means indicated any great degree of self-satisfaction at the step. But the lines of an uncommonly prepossessing countenance were gradually becoming composed, and he now sat silent and apparently musing. The judge gazed at him for some time with earnestness, and then smiling as if at his own forgetfulness, he said, I believe, my young friend, that terror has driven you from my recollection. Your face is very familiar, and yet... For the honor of a score of bucks tails in my cap, I could not tell your name. I came into the country, but three years since, returned the youth coldly, and I understand you have been absent twice that time. It will be five tomorrow, yet your face is one that I have seen, though it would not be strange. Such has been my affright. Should I see thee in thy winding sheet, walking past my bed to-night? What sayest thou, Bess, 
am I composimentous or not? Fit to charge a grand jury, or what is this now of more pressing necessity, able to do the honors of Christmas Eve in the hall of Templeton? More able to do either, my dear father, said a playful voice from under the ample enclosures of the hood, than to kill a deer with a smooth bore. A short pause followed, and the same voice, but in a different accent, continued. We shall have good reasons for our thanksgiving to-night, on more accounts than one. The horses soon reached a point where they seemed to know by instinct that the journey was nearly ended, and bearing on the bits as they tossed their heads, they rapidly drew the sleigh over the level land which lay on top of the mountain and soon came to the point where the road descended suddenly, but circuitously, into the valley. The judge was roused from his reflections when he saw the four columns of smoke which floated above his own chimneys. As house, village, and valley burst on his sight, he exclaimed cheerfully to his daughter, See, Bess, there is thy resting place for life, and thine too, young man, if you will consent. To dwell with us, the eyes of his auditors involuntarily met, and if the color that gathered over the face of Elizabeth was contradicted by the cold expression of her eye, the ambiguous smile that again played about the lips of the stranger seemed equally to deny the probability of his consenting to form one of this family group. The scene was one, however, which might easily warm a heart less given to philanthropy than that of Marmaduke Temple. The side of the mountain on which our travelers were journeying, though not absolutely perpendicular, was so steep as to render great care necessary in descending the rude and narrow path which in that early day wound along the precipices. The negro reined in his impatient steeds, and time was given Elizabeth to dwell on a scene which was so rapidly altering under the hands of man that it only resembled in its outlines the pictures she had so often studied with delight in childhood. Immediately beneath them lay a seeming plain, glittering without in equality, and buried in mountains. The latter were precipitous, especially on the side of the plain, and chiefly in forest. Here and there the hills fell away in long, low points, and broke the sameness of the outline or setting to the long and wide field of snow, which without house, tree, fence, or any other fixture, resembled so much spotless cloud settled to the earth. A few dark and moving spots were, however, visible on the even surface, which the eye of Elizabeth knew to be so many sleighs going their several ways to or from the village. On the western border of the plain, the mountains, though equally high, were less precipitous, and as they receded opened into irregular valleys and glens, or were formed into terraces and hollows that admitted of cultivation. Although the evergreens still held domain over many of the hills that rose on this side of the valley, yet the undulating outlines of the distant mountains, covered with forests of beech and maple, gave a relief to the eye and the promise of a kinder soil. Occasionally spots of white were discoverable amidst the forest of the opposite hills, which announced by the smoke that curled over the tops of the trees, the habitations of man, and the commencement of agriculture. These spots were sometimes, by the aid of united labor, enlarged into what were called settlements, but more frequently were small and insulated. Though not so rapid were the changes, and so persevering the labors of those who had cast their fortunes on the success of the enterprise, that it was not difficult for the imagination of Elizabeth to conceive they were enlarging under her eye while she was gazing in mute wonder at the alterations that a few short years had made in the aspect of the country. The points on the western side of this remarkable plain, on which no plant had taken root, were both larger and more numerous than those on its eastern, and one in particular thrust itself forward 
in such a manner as to form beautifully curved bays of snow on either side. On its extreme end, an oak stretched forward, as if to overshadow with its branches a spot which its roots were forbidden to enter. It had released itself from the faldron that a growth of centuries had imposed on the branches of the surrounding forest trees, and threw its gnarled and fantastic arms abroad in the wildness of liberty. A dark spot of a few acres in extent at the southern extremity of this beautiful flat, and immediately under the feet of our travelers, alone showed by its rippling surface and vapors which exhaled from it, that what at first might seem a plain was one of the mountain lakes, locked in the frost of winter. A narrow current rushed impetuously from its bosom at the open place we have mentioned, and was to be traced for miles as it wound its way toward the south through the real valley, by its borders of hemlock and pine, and by the vapor which arose from its warmer surface into the chill atmosphere of the hills. The banks of this lovely basin at its outlet, or southern end, were steep but not high, and in that direction the land continued, far as the eye could reach, a narrow but graceful valley, along which the settlers had scattered their humble habitations, with a profusion that bespoke the quality of the soil and the comparative facilities of intercourse. Immediately on the bank of the lake and at its foot, stood the village of Templeton. It consisted of some fifty buildings, including those of every description, chiefly built of wood, and which in their architecture bore no great marks of taste, but which also, by the unfinished appearance of most of the dwellings, indicated the hasty manner of their construction. To the eye they presented a variety of colors, a few were white in both front and rear, but more bore that expensive color on their fronts only, while their economical but ambitious owners had covered the remaining sides of the edifices with a dingy red. One or two were slowly assuming the russet of age, while the uncovered beams that were to be seen through the broken windows of their second stories showed that either the taste or the vanity of their proprietors had led them to undertake a task which they were unable to accomplish. The whole were grouped in a manner that aped the streets of a city, and were evidently so arranged by the directions of one who looked to the wants of posterity rather than to the convenience of the present incumbents. Some three or four of the better sort of buildings, in addition to the uniformity of the color, were fitted with green blinds which, at that season, at least, were rather strangely contrasted to the chill aspect of the lake, the mountains, the forest, and the wide fields of snow. Before the doors of these pretending dwellings were placed a few saplings, either without branches or possessing only the feeble shoots of one or two summer's growth, that looked not unlike tall grandeurs on posts near the threshold of princes. In truth, the occupants of these favored habitations were the nobles of Templeton, as Marmaduke was its king. They were the dwellings of two young men who were cunning in the law, an equal number of that class who chafed to the wants of the community under the title of storekeepers, and a disciple of Asculapius, who for a novelty brought more subjects into the world than he sent out of it. In the midst of this incongruous group of dwellings rose the mansion of the judge, towering above all its neighbors. It stood in the center of an enclosure of several acres, which was covered with fruit trees. Some of the latter had been left by the Indians, and began already to assume the moss and inclination of age, therein performing a very marked contrast to the infant plantations that peered over most of the picketed fences of the village. In addition to this show of cultivation were two rows of young Lombardy poplars, a tree but lately introduced into America, formerly lining either side of a pathway, 
which led from a gate that opened on the principal street to the front of the building. The house itself had been built entirely under the superintendence of a certain Mr. Richard Jones, who we have already mentioned, and who, from his cleverness in small manners, and an entire willingness to exert his talents, added to the circumstances of their being sisters' children, ordinarily superintended all the minor concerns of Marmaduke Temple. Richard was fond of saying that this child of invention consisted of nothing more nor less than what should form the groundwork of every clergyman's discourse, viz. Firstly, and lastly, he had commenced his labor in the first year of their residence by erecting a tall, gaunt edifice of wood, with its gable toward the highway. In this shelter, for it was little more, the family resided three years. By the end of that period, Richard had completed his design. He had availed himself, in his heavy undertaking, of the experience of a certain wandering eastern mechanic, who, by exhibiting a few soiled plates of English architecture, and talking learnedly of frises, and tablatures, and particularly of the composite order, had obtained a very undue influence over Richard's taste in everything that pertained to that branch of the fine arts. Not that Mr. Jones did not affect to consider Hiram Doolittle a perfect empiric in his profession, being the constant habit of listening to his treatises on architecture with a kind of indulgent smile. Yet either from an inability to oppose them by anything plausible from his own stores of learning, or from secret admiration, Richard generally submitted to the arguments of his co-adjutor. Together they had not only erected a dwelling for Marmaduke, but they had given a fashion to the architecture of the whole country. The composite order, Mr. Doolittle would contend, was an order composed of many others, and was intended to be the most useful of all, for it admitted into its construction such alterations as convenience or circumstances might require. To this proposition Richard usually assented, and when rival geniuses who monopolized not only all the reputation, but most of the money of a neighborhood are of a mind, it is not uncommon to see them lead the fashion even in grave matters. In the present instance, as we have already hinted, the castle, as Judge Templeton's dwelling was termed in common parlance, came to be the model, in some one or other of its numerous excellences, for every aspiring edifice within twenty miles of it. The house itself, or the lastly, was of stone, large, square, and far from comfortable. These were four requisites on which Marmaduke had insisted with a little more than his ordinary pernacity, but everything else was peaceably assigned to Richard and his associate. These worthies found the material a little too solid for the tools of their workmen, which in general were employed on a substance no harder than the white pine of the adjacent mountains a wood so proverbially soft that is commonly chosen by hunters for pillows. But, for this awkward dilemma, it is probable that the ambitious taste of our two architects would have left us more to do in the way of description. Driven from the faces of the house by the obduracy of the material, they took refuge in the porch and on the roof. The former, it was decided, should be severely classical, and the latter a rare specimen of the merits of the composite order. A roof, Richard contended, was a part of the edifice which the ancients always endeavored to conceal, it being an excrescence in architecture that was only to be tolerated on account of its usefulness. Besides, as he wittily added, a chief merit in a dwelling was to present a front on whichever side it might happen to be seen, for, as it was exposed to all eyes in all weathers, 
there should be no weak flank for envy or unneighborly criticism to assail. It was therefore decided that the roof should be flat, and with four faces. To this arrangement, Marmaduke objected the snows that lay for months, frequently covering the earth to a depth of three or four feet. Happily, the facilities of the composite order presented themselves to effect a compromise, and the rafters were lengthened, so as to give a descent that would carry off the frozen element. But unluckily, some mistake was made in the admeasurement of these material parts of the fabric, and one of the greatest recommendations of Hiram was his ability to work by the square rule. No opportunity was found of discovering the effect until the massive timbers were raised on the four walls of the building. Then, indeed, it was soon seen that, in defiance of all rule, the roof was by far the most conspicuous part of the whole edifice. Richard and his associate consoled themselves with the relief that the covering would aid in concealing this unnatural elevation. But every shingle that was laid only multiplied objects to look at. Richard essayed to remedy the evil with paint, and four different colors were laid on by his own hands. The first was a sky blue, in the vain expectation that the eye might be cheated into the belief it was the heavens themselves that hung so impossibly over Marmaduke's dwelling. The second was what he called a cloud color, being nothing more or less than an imitation of smoke. The third was what Richard termed an invisible green, an experiment that did not succeed against a background of sky. Abandoning the attempt to conceal, our architects drew from their invention for means to ornate the offensive shingles. After much deliberation and two or three essays by moonlight, Richard ended the affair by boldly covering the hole beneath a color that he christened sunshine, a cheap way, as he assured his cousin, the judge, of always keeping fair weather over his head. The platform, as well as the caves of the house, were surmounted by gaudily painted railings, and the genius of Hiram was exerted in the fabrication of divers' urns and moldings, which were scattered profusely around this part of their labors. Richard had originally a cunning expedient by which the chimneys were intended to be so low and so situated as to resemble ornaments on the balustrades. But comfort required that the chimneys should rise with the roof, in order that smoke might be carried off, and thus that became for extremely conspicuous objects in the view. As this roof was much the most important architectural undertaking, in which Mr. Jones was ever engaged, his failure produced a correspondent degree of mortification. At first, he whispered among his acquaintance that it proceeded from ignorance of the square rule on the part of Hiram, but as his eye became gradually accustomed to the object, he grew better satisfied with his labors, and instead of apologizing for the defects, he commenced praising the beauties of the mansion house. He soon found hearers, and, as wealth and comfort, are at all times attractive. It was, as has been said, made a model for imitation on a small scale. In less than two years from its erection, he had the pleasure of standing on the elevated platform, and of looking down on three humble imitators of its beauty. Thus it is ever with fashion which ever renders the faults of the great subjects of admiration. Marmaduke bore his deformity in his dwelling with great good nature, and soon contrived, by his own improvements, to give an air of respectability and comfort to his place of residence. Still, there was much of incongruity, even immediately about the mansion house. Although poplars had been brought from Europe to ornament the grounds, and willows and other trees were gradually springing up nigh the dwelling, yet many a pile of snow betrayed the presence of the stump of a pine, and even in one or two instances unsightly remnants 
of trees that had been partly destroyed by fire were seen rearing their black, glistening columns twenty or thirty feet above the pure white of the snow. These, which in the language of the country are termed stubs, abounded in the open fields adjacent to the village, and were accompanied occasionally by the ruin of a pine or a hemlock that had been stripped of its bark and which waved in melancholy grandeur its naked limbs to the blast, a skeleton of its former glory. But these and many other unpleasant additions to the view were unseen by the delighted Elizabeth, who, as the horses moved down the side of the mountain, saw only in gross the cluster of houses that lay like a map at her feet, the fifty smokes that were curling from the valley to the clouds, the frozen lake as it lay embedded in mountains of evergreen, with the long shadows of the pine on its white surface, lengthening in the setting sun, the dark ribbon of water that gushed from the outlet and was winding its way toward the distant Chesapeake, the altered, though still remembered, scenes of her childhood. Five years had wrought greater changes than a century would produce in countries where time and labor have given permanency to the works of man. To our young hunter and the judge, the scene had less novelty, though none ever emerged from the dark forest of that mountain and witnessed the glorious scenery of that beauteous valley, as it burst unexpectedly upon them, without a feeling of delight. The former cast one admiring glance from north to south, and sank his face again beneath the folds of his coat, while the latter contemplated with philanthropic pleasure the prospect of affluence and comfort that was expanding around him, the result of his own enterprise, and much of it the fruits of his own industry. The cheerful sound of sleigh bells, however, attracted the attention of the whole party as they came jingling up the sides of the mountain at a rate that announced a powerful team and a hard driver. The bushes which lined the highway interrupted the view, and the two sleighs, were close upon each other before either was seen. End of chapter Chapter 4 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 Quote, How now? Whose mare's dead? What's the matter? Unquote. Falstaff a large lumber sleigh, drawn by four horses, was soon seen dashing through the leafless bushes which fringed the road. The leaders were of gray, and the pole horses of a jet black. Bells innumerable were suspended from every part of the harness, where one of the tinkling balls could be placed, while the rapid movement of the equipage, in defiance of the steep ascent, announced the desire of the driver to wring them to the utmost. The first glance of this singular arrangement acquainted the judge with the character of those in the sleigh. It contained four male figures. On one of those stools that are used at writing desks, lashed firmly to the sides of the vehicle, was seated a little man, enveloped in a great coat fringed with fur. In such a manner, that no part of him was visible except the face of an unvarying red color. There was a habitual upward look about the head of this gentleman, as if dissatisfied with its natural proximity to the earth, and the expression of his countenance was that of busy care. He was the charioteer, and he guided the meddled animals along the precipice with a fearless eye and a steady hand. Immediately behind him, with his face toward the other two, was a tall figure, 
to whose appearance not even the duplicate overcoats which he wore, aided by the corner of a horse blanket, could give the appearance of strength. His face was protruding from beneath a woolen nightcap, and when he turned to the vehicle of Marmaduke, as the sleighs approached each other, it seemed formed by nature to cut the atmosphere with the least possible resistance. The eyes alone appeared to create any obstacle, for from either side of his forehead their light blue glassy balls projected. The sallow of his countenance was too permanent to be affected even by the intense cold of the evening. Opposite of this personage sat a solid, short, and square figure. No part of his form was to be discovered through his overdress, but a face that was illuminated by a pair of black eyes that gave the lie to every demure feature of his countenance. A fair jolly wig furnished a neat and rounded outline to his visage, and he, well as the other two, wore martin-skin caps. The fourth was a meek-looking, long-visaged man, without any other protection from the cold than that which was furnished by a black surcoat, made with some little formality, but which was rather threadbare and rusty. He wore a hat of extremely decent proportions, though frequent brushing had quite destroyed its nap. His face was pale, and withal a little melancholy, or what might be termed of a studious complexion. The air had given it, just now, a light and somewhat feverish flush. The character of his whole appearance, especially contrasted to the air of humor in his next companion, was that of habitual mental care. No sooner had the two sleighs approached within speaking distance than the driver of this fantastic equipage shouted aloud, Draw into the quarry, Agamemnon! or I shall never be able to pass you. Welcome home, cousin Doke. Welcome, welcome, black-eyed Bess. Thou seest, Marina Duke, that I have taken the field with an assorted cargo to do thee honor. Monsieur Lacroix has come with only one cap. Old Fritz would not stay to finish the bottle. And Mr. Grant has got to put the lastly to his sermon yet. Even all the horses would come by the by, Judge. I must sell the blacks for you immediately. They interfere, and the high one is a bad goer in double harness. I can get rid of them, too. Sell what thou wilt, Dickon, interrupted the cheerful voice of the Judge, so that thou leavest my daughter and my lands. And Fritz, my old friend, this is a kind compliment, indeed, for seventy to pay to five and forty. Monsieur Le Coy, I am your servant. Mr. Grant, lifting his cap, I feel indebted to your attention. Gentlemen, I make you acquainted with my child. Yours are names with which she is very familiar. Welcome, welcome, Tushi said the elder of the party, with a strong German accent. Miss Patsy, will thou owe me a kiss? And cheerfully I will pay it, my good sir, cried the soft voice of Elizabeth, which sounded in the clear air of the hills like tones of silver amid the loud cries of Richard. I always have a kiss for my old friend, Major Hartman. By this time the gentleman in the front seat who had been addressed as Monsieur Le Coy, had risen with some difficulty, owing to the impediment of his overcoats, and steadying himself by placing one hand on the stool of the charioteer. With the other, he removed his cap, and bowing politely to the judge and profoundly to Elizabeth, he paid his compliments. "'Cover my pole, Gaul! Cover my pole!' cried the driver, who was Mr. Richard Jones. Cover thy pole, or the forest will pluck out the remnant of thy locks. 
Have the hairs on the head of Absalom been as scarce as thine? He might have been living to this day. The jokes of Richard never failed of exciting risibility, for he uniformly did honor to his own wit, and he enjoyed a hearty laugh on the present occasion, while Mr. Lecoy resumed his seat with a polite reciprocation in his mirth. The clergyman, for such was the office of Mr. Grant, modestly, though quite affectionately, exchanged his greetings with the travelers also, when Richard prepared to turn the heads of the horses homeward. It was in the quarry alone that he could effect this object, without ascending to the summit of the mountain. A very considerable excavation had been made in the side of the hill, at the point where Richard had succeeded in stopping the sleighs, from which the stones used for building the village were ordinarily quarried, and in which he now attempted to turn his team. Passing itself was a task of difficulty and frequently of danger in that narrow road, but Richard had to meet the additional risk of turning his fort in hand. The black civilly volunteered his services to take off the leaders, and the judge very earnestly seconded the measure with his advice. Richard treated both proposals with great disdain. "'Why and wherefore, Cousin Duke?' he exclaimed, a little angrily. "'The horses are as gentle as lambs. "'You know that I broke the leaders myself, "'and the pole horses are too near my whip to be restive. "'Here is Mr. Lecoy now, who must know something about driving, "'because he has rode out so often with me. "'I will leave it to Mr. Lecoy whether there is any danger.' It was not in the nature of the Frenchman to disappoint expectations so confidently formed. Although he sat looking down the precipice which fronted him, as Richard turned his leaders into the quarry with a pair of eyes that stood out like those of lobsters, the German's muscles were unmoved, but his quick sight scanned each movement. Mr. Grant placed his hands on the side of the sleigh in preparation for a spring, but moral timidity deterred him from taking the leap that bodily apprehension strongly urged him to attempt. Richard, by a sudden application of the whip, succeeded in forcing the leaders into the snowbank that covered the quarry, but the instant that the impatient animals suffered by the crust through which they broke at each step, they positively refused to move an inch further in that direction. On the contrary, finding that the cries and blows of their driver were redoubled at this juncture, the leaders backed upon the pole horses, who in turn backed the sleigh. Only a single log lay above the pile which upheld the road on the side toward the valley, and this was now buried in snow. The sleigh was easily bred across so slight an impediment, and before Richard became conscious of his danger, one half of the vehicle was projected over a precipice, which fell perpendicularly more than a hundred feet. The Frenchman, who by his position had a full view of their threatened flight, instinctively threw his body as far forward as possible and cried, Oh, mon cher, mon cher Dick, mon dul, the fight's full! Donder and Blitzen, Richard! exclaimed the veteran German, looking over the side of the sleigh with unusual emotion. Put you will speak the sleigh in curt to houses! Good Mr. Jones, said the clergyman, be prudent, good sir, be careful! "'Get up, obstinate devils!' cried Richard, catching a bird's-eye view of his situation, and in his eagerness to move forward, kicking the stool on which he sat. "'Get up, I say, Duke! I shall have to sell the greys, too! They are the worst broken horses! Mr. Lacoy. Richard was too much agitated to regard his pronunciation, of which he had, was commonly a little vain. "'But, Sir Lacoy, pray get off my leg!' You hold my leg so tight that it's a no wonder the horse is back. Merciful providence, exclaimed the judge. They will all be killed. 
Elizabeth gave a piercing shriek, and the black of Agamemnon's face changed to a muddy white. At this critical moment, the young hunter, who during the salutations of the parties had sat in rather sullen silence, sprang from the sleigh of Marmaduke to the heads of the refractory leaders. The horses, which were yet suffering under the injudicious and somewhat random blows of Richard, were dancing up and down with that ominous movement that threatens a sudden and uncontrollable start, still pressing backward. The youth gave the leaders a powerful jerk, and they plunged aside, and re-entered the road in the position in which they were first halted. The sleigh was whirled from its dangerous position and upset with the runners outward. The German and the Divine were thrown, rather unceremoniously, into the highway, but without danger to their bones. Richard appeared in the air, describing the segment of a circle, of which the reins were the radii, and landed at the distance of some fifteen feet, in that snowbank which the horses had dreaded, right and uppermost. Here, as he instinctively grasped the reins as a drowning man sees its straws, he admirably served the purpose of an anchor. The Frenchman, who was on his legs in the act of springing from the sleigh, took an aerial flight also, much in the attitude which boys assume when they play leapfrog, and lying off in a tangent to the curvature of his course, came into the snowbank head foremost, where he remained exhibiting two latchy legs on high, like scarecrows waving in a cornfield. Major Hartman, whose self-possession had been admirably preserved during the whole evolution, was the first of the party that gained his feet and his voice. "'The devil, Richard!' he exclaimed in a voice half-serious, half-comical. "'Put you unload your sleigh very hotly. It may be doubtful whether the attitude in which Mr. Grant continued for an instant after his overthrow was the one into which he had been thrown, or was assumed, in humbling himself before the power that he reverenced, in thanksgiving at his escape. When he rose from his knees, he began to gaze about him, with anxious looks, after the welfare of his companions, while every joint in his body trembled with nervous agitation. There was some confusion in the facilities of Mr. Jones also, but as the mist gradually cleared from before his eyes, he saw that all was safe, and with an air of great self-satisfaction, he cried, Well, that was neatly safe, anyhow. It was a lucky thought in me to hold on to the reins, or the fiery devils would have been over the mountain by this time. How well I recovered myself. Duke, another moment would have been too late but I knew just the spot where to touch the off-leader. That blow under his right flank, and the sudden jerk I gave the rein, brought them round quite in rule. I must own myself. Footnote. The spectators, from a memorial usage, have a right to laugh at the casualties of a sleigh ride, and the judge was no sooner certain that no one was done than he made full use of the privilege. And footnote. Thou jerk, thou recover thyself, Dickon, he said, but for that brave lad yonder, thou and thy horses, or rather mine, would have been dashed to pieces. Where is Monsieur Le Coy? Oh, mon cher judge, mon me, cried the smothered voice. Praise be God, I live. Will you, Mr. Agamemnon, be pleased come down, I see, and help me on my leg? The divine and the negro seized the incarcerated Gaul by his legs, and extricated him from a snowbank of three feet in depth, whence his voice had summoned as from the tombs. The thoughts of Mr. Lecoy immediately on his liberation were not extremely collected, and when he reached the light, he threw his eyes upward in order to examine the distance he had fallen. His good humor returned, however, with a knowledge of his safety, though it was some little time before he clearly comprehended the case. What, monsieur, 
said Richard, who was busily assisting the black in taking off the leaders. Are you there? I thought I saw you flying toward the top of the mountain just now. Praise be God, I no fly down into the lake, returned the Frenchman, with a visage that was divided between pain, occasioned by a few large scratches that he had received in forcing his head through the crust, and the look of compliance that seemed natural to his pliable features. Ah, oh, Monsieur, Mr. Dick, what you do next? There be nothing you no try. The next thing, I trust, will be to learn to drive, said the judge, who had busied himself in throwing the buck, together with several other articles of baggage, from his own sleigh into the snow. Here are seats for you all, gentlemen. The evening grows piercingly cold, and the hour approaches for the service of Mr. Grunt. We will leave friend Jones to repair the damages with the assistance of a gomenon, and hasten to a warm fire. Here, Dickon, are a few articles of best trumpery that you can throw into your sleigh when ready. And there is also a deer of my taking that I will thank you to bring. Aggie, remember that there will be a visit from Santa Claus tonight. Footnote. The periodic visits of St. Nicholas, or Santa Claus as he is termed, were never forgotten among the inhabitants of New York, until the immigration from New England brought in the opinions and usages of the Puritans. Like the bon homme de Noël, he arrives at each Christmas. End footnote. The black grinned, conscious of the bribe that was offered him for silence on the subject of the deer, while Richard, without in the least, waiting for the termination of his cousin's speak, began his reply. Learn to dry, sayest thou, cousin Duke. Is there a man in the country who knows more of horse flesh than myself? Who broke in the filly that no one else dare mount? Though your coachman did pretend that he had tamed her before I took her in hand. But anybody could see that he lied. He, he was a great liar. That John, what's, what's that, a buck? Richard abandoned the horses and ran to the spot where Marmaduke had thrown the deer. It's a buck. I am amazed. Yes, there are two holes in him. He has fired both barrels and hit him each time. E God! How Marmaduke will brag. He is a prodigious bragger about any small matter like this. Now, well, to think that Duke has killed a buck before Christmas. There will be no such thing as living with him. They are both bad shots, though. Mere chance, mere chance now. I never fired twice at a cloven foot in my life. It is hit or miss with me. Dead or run away. Had it been a bear or a wildcat, a man might have wanted both barrels. Here, you Aggie, how far off was the judge when this buck was shot? Oh, Massa, Richard, maybe a ten-rod, cried the black, bending under one of the horses with the pretense of fastening a buckle, but in reality to conceal the grin that had opened a mouth from ear to ear. Ten-rod? echoed the other. Why, Aggie, the deer I killed last winter was at twenty, yes, if... Anything, it was near thirty than twenty. I wouldn't shoot a deer at ten rod. Besides, you may remember, Aggie, I only fired once. Yes, Massa Richard, I remember him. Natty Bumpo fire the other gun. You know, sir, all the folks say Natty kill him. The folks lie, you black devil, exclaimed Richard in great heat. I have not shot a gray squirrel for these four years to which that old rascal has not laid claim, or someone else or him. This is a damned envious world that we live in. People are always for dividing the credit of a thing in order to bring down merit to their own level. Now they have a story about the patent that Hiram Doolittle helped plan the steeple to St. Paul's when Hiram knows that it is entirely mine. 
a little taken from a print of his namesake in London, I own, but essentially, as to all points of genius, my own. Footnote. The grants of land made either by the crown or the state were but letters patent under the great seal, and the term patent is usually applied to any district of extent thus conceded. Though under the crown, manorial rights being often granted with the soil, in the older counties, the word manor is frequently used. There are many manors in New York, though all political and judicial rights have ceased. I don't know where he came from, said the black, losing every mark of humor in the expression of admiration. But everybody say he wonderful handsome. And well they may say so, Aggie, cried Richard, leaving the buck and walking up to the negro with the air of a man who has new interest awakening in him. I think I may say without bragging that it is the handsomest and the most scientific country church in America. I know that the Connecticut settlers talk about their West Herfield meeting house, but I never believe more than half what they say. They are such unconscionable braggers. Just as you have got a thing done, if they see it likely to be successful, they are always for interfering, and then it's tea to one, but they lay claim to half, or even all of the credit. You may remember, Aggie, when I painted the sign of the bold dragoon for Captain Hollister, there was that fellow who was about town laying brick dust on the horses. Came one day and offered to mix what I call the streaky black for the tail and mane, and then, because it looks like horse hair, he tells everybody that the sign was painted by himself and Squire Jones. If Marmaduke don't send that fellow off the patent, he may ornament his village with his own hands for me. Here Richard paused a moment, and cleared his throat by a loud hem, while the negro, who was all this time busily engaged in preparing the sleigh, proceeded with his work in respectful silence. Owing to the religious scruples of the judge, Aggie was the servant of Richard, who had his service for a time, and who, of course, commanded a legal claim to the respect of the young Negro. Footnote. The manumission of the slaves in New York has been gradual. When public opinion became strong in their favor, there grew up a custom of buying the services of a slave for six or eight years, with a condition to liberate him at the end of the period. Then the law provided that all born after a certain day should be free, the males at twenty-eight and the females at twenty-five. After this, the owner was obliged to cause his servants to be taught to read and write before they reached the age of eighteen, and finally that few that remained were all unconditionally liberated in 1826, or after the publication of this tale. It was quite unusual for men more or less connected with the Quakers, who have never held slaves to adopt the first expedient. End footnote. But when any dispute between his lawful and his real master occurred, the black felt too much deference for both to express any opinion. In the meanwhile, Richard continued watching the negro as he fastened buckle after buckle, until, stealing a look of consciousness toward the other, he continued, Now, if that young man who was in your sleigh is a real Connecticut settler, he will be telling everybody how he saved my horses, when if he had just let them alone for half a minute longer, I would have brought them in much better, without upsetting with the whip and the mid Rain it spoils a horse's to give him his heel. I should not wonder if I had to sell the whole team just for that one jerk he gave him. Richard paused and hemmed, for his conscience smote him a little for censuring a man who had just saved his life. Who is the lad, Aggie? I don't remember to have seen him before. The black recollected the hint about Santa Claus and while he briefly exclaimed how they had taken up the person in question 
on the top of the mountain, he forbore to add anything concerning the accident or the wound, only saying that he believed the youth was a stranger. It was so usual for men of the first rank to take into their sleighs anyone they found toiling through the snow, that Richard was perfectly satisfied with this explanation. He heard Aggie with great attention, and then remarked, Well, if the lad has not been spoiled by the people in Templeton, he may be a modest young man, and he certainly meant well. I shall take some notice of him, perhaps, in his land hunting. I say, Aggie, maybe he is out hunting. Ah, oh, yes, Master Richard, said the black, a little confused, for as Richard did all the flogging, he stood in great terror of his master in the main. Yes, sir, I believe he be. He had a pack and an axe? No, sir, only he rifle. Rifle! exclaimed Richard, observing the confusion of the negro, which now amounted to terror. By Jove, he killed the deer. I knew that Marmaduke couldn't kill a buck on the jump. How was it? Aggie, tell me all about it. And I'll roast do quicker than he can roast his saddle. How was it, Aggie? The lad shot the buck, and the judge bought it. Ha! Ah! And he was taking the youth down to get the pay? The pleasure of this discovery had put Richard in such a good humor that the negro's fears in some measure vanished, and he remembered the stalking of Santa Claus. After a gulp or two, he made out to reply, You forget it. A two-shot, sir. Don't lie, you black rascal, cried Richard, stepping on the snow bank to measure the distance from his lash to the negro's back. Speak truth, or I'll trounce you. While speaking, the stalk was slowly raising in Richard's right hand and the lash drawing through his left, in the scientific manner which drummers apply the cat. And Agamemnon, after turning each side of himself toward his master and finding both equal unwilling to remain there, fairly gave in. In a very few words he made his master acquainted with the truth, at the same time earnestly conjuring Richard to protect him from the displeasure of the judge. I'll do it, boy, I'll do it, cried the other, rubbing his hands with delight. Say nothing, but leave me to Manny Duke. I have a great mind to leave the deer on the hill, and to make the fellow send for his own carcass. But no, I will let Marmaduke tell a few bounces about it, before I come upon him. Come, hurry in, Aggie. I must help to dress the lad's wound. This Yankee doctor knows nothing of surgery. I had to hold out Milligan's leg for him while he cut it off. Footnote. In America, the term Yankee is of local meaning. It is thought to be derived from the manner in which the Indians of New England pronounce the word English, or Yankees. New York, being originally a Dutch province, the term, of course, was not known there. And farther south, different dialects among the natives themselves probably produced a different pronunciation. Marmaduke and his cousin, being Pennsylvanians by birth, were not Yankees in the American sense of the word. End footnote. Richard was now seated on the stool again, and, the black taking the hind seat, the steeds were put in motion toward home. As they dashed down the hill on a fast trot, the driver occasionally turned his face to Aggie and continued speaking for, notwithstanding their recent rupture, the most perfect cordiality was again existing between them. This goes to prove that I turned the horses with the rein, for no man who is shot in the right shoulder can have strength enough to bring round such obstinate devils. I knew I did it from the first, but I did not want to multiply words with Marmaduke about it. Will you bite, you villain? Hip, boys, hip! Oh, Natty, too! That is the best of it! Well, well, Duke will say no more about my deer, and the judge fired both barrels, and hit nothing but a poor lad who was behind a pine tree. I must help that quack to take out the buckshot for the poor fellow. 
In this manner, Richard descended the mountain, the bells ringing and his tongue going until they entered the village, when the whole attention of the driver was devoted to a display of his horsemanship, to the admiration of all the gaping women and children who thronged the windows to witness the arrival of their landlord and his daughter. End of chapter 4 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in December of 2008Chapter 5 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 Quote Nathaniel's coat, sir, was not fully made, and Gabriel's pumps were all unpinked in the heel. There was no link to color Peter's hat, and Walter's dagger was not come from sheathing. There were none fine but Adam, Ralph, and Gregory. Unquote. Shakespeare After winding along the side of the mountain, the road on reaching the gentle declivity which lay at the base of the hill turned at a right angle to its former course and shot down an inclined plane directly into the village of Templeton. The rapid little stream that we have already mentioned was crossed by a bridge of hewn timber which manifested by its rude construction and the unnecessary size of its framework both the value of labor and the abundance of materials. This little torrent, whose dark waters gushed over the limestones that lined its bottom, was nothing less than one of the many sources of the Susquehanna, a river to which the Atlantic herself has extended an open arm in welcome. It was at this point that the powerful team of Mr. Jones brought him up to the more sober steeds of our travelers. A small hill was risen, and Elizabeth found herself at once amidst the incongruous dwellings of the village. The street was the ordinary width, notwithstanding the eye might embrace in one view thousands and ten thousands of acres, that were yet tenanted only by the beast of the forest. But such had been the will of her father, and such had also met the wishes of his followers. To them, the road that made the most rapid approaches to the condition of the old, or as they expressed it, the down countries, was the most pleasant, and surely nothing could look more like civilization than a city, even if it lay in a wilderness. The width of the street, for so it was called, might have been one hundred feet, but the track of the sleighs was much more limited. On either side of the highway were piled huge heaps of logs that were daily increasing rather than diminishing in size, notwithstanding the enormous fires that might be seen through every window. The last object which Elizabeth gazed when they renewed their journey, after their encounter with Richard, was the sun, as it expanded in the refraction of the horizon and over whose disk the dark umbrage of a pine was stealing, while it slowly sank behind the western hills. But his setting rays darted along the openings of the mountain he was on, and lighted the shining covering of the birches, until their smooth and glossy coats nearly rivaled the mountain sides in color. The outline of each dark pine was delineated far in the depths of the forest, and the rocks, too smooth and too perpendicular to retain the snow that had fallen, brightened, as if smiling at the leave-taking of the luminary. But at each step as they descended, 
Elizabeth observed that they were leaving the day behind them. Even the heartless but bright rays of a December sun were missed as they glided into the gloom of the valley. Along the summits of the mountains in the eastern range, it is true, the light still lingered, receding step by step from the earth into the clouds that were gathering with the evening mist above the limited horizon. But the frozen lake lay without a shadow on its bosom. The dwellings were becoming already gloomy and indistinct, and the woodcutters were shouldering their axes and preparing to enjoy throughout the long evening before them the comforts of those exhilarating fires that their labor had been supplying with fuel. They paused only to gaze at the passing sleighs, to lift their caps to Marmaduke, to exchange familiar nods with Richard, and each disappeared in his dwelling. The paper curtains dropped behind our travelers in every window, shutting from the air even the firelight of the cheerful apartments, and when the horses of her father turned with a rapid whirl into the open gate of the mansion-house, and nothing stood before her but the cold, dreary stone walls of the building as she approached them through an avenue of young and leafless poplars. Elizabeth felt as if all the loveliness of the mountain view had vanished like the fancies of a dream. Marmaduke retained so much of his early habits as to reject the use of bells, but the equipage of Mr. Jones came dashing through the gate after them, sending its jingling sounds through every cranny of the building, and in a moment the dwelling was in an uproar. On a stone platform of rather small proportions, considering the size of the building, Richard and Hiram had conjointly reared four little columns of wood, which in their turn supported the shingle roofs of the portico. This was the name that Mr. Jones had thought proper to give to a very plain covered entrance. The ascent to the platform was by five or six stone steps, somewhat hastily laid together, and which the frost had already begun to move from their symmetrical positions. But the evils of a cold climate and a superficial construction did not end there. As the steps lowered, the platform necessarily fell also, and the foundations actually left the superstructure suspended in the air, leaving an open space of a foot between the base of the pillars and the stone on which they had originally been placed. It was luckily for the whole fabric that the carpenter who did the manual part of the labor had fastened the canopy of this classic entrance so firmly to the side of the house that when the base deserted the superstructure in the manner we've described, the pillars, for want of a foundation, were no longer of service to support the roof. The roof was able to uphold the pillars. Here was, indeed, an unfortunate gap left in the ornamental part of Richard's column, but like the widow in Aladdin's palace, it seemed only left in order to prove the fertility of its master's resources. The composite order again offered its advantages, and a second edition of the base was given, as the booksellers say, with additions and improvements. It was necessarily larger, and it was properly ornamented with moldings. Still, the steps continued to yield, and at the moment when Elizabeth turned to her father's door, a few rough wedges were driven under the pillars to keep them steady, and to prevent their weight from separating them from the pediment which they ought to have supported. From the great door which opened into the porch emerged two or three female domestics and one male. The latter was bareheaded but evidently more dressed than usual, and on the whole was of no singular a formation and attire as to deserve a more minute description. He was about five feet in height, of a square and athletic frame, with a pair of shoulders that would have fitted a grenadier. 
his low stature was rendered the more striking by a bend forward that he was in the habit of assuming, for no apparent reason, unless it might be to give greater freedom to his arms in a particularly sweeping swing that they constantly practiced when their master was in motion. His face was long, of a fair complexion, burnt to a fiery red, with a snub nose, cocked to an inveterate pug, a mouth of enormous dimensions filled with white teeth, and a pair of blue eyes that seemed to look about them on surrounding objects with habitual contempt. His head composed full one-fourth of his whole length, and the cue that depended from its rear occupied another. He wore a coat of very light drab cloth, with buttons as large as dollars, bearing the impression of a foul anchor. The skirts were extremely long, reaching quite to the calf, and were broad in proportion. Beneath there were a vest and breeches of red plush, somewhat worn and soiled. He had shoes with large buckles, and stockings of blue and white stripes. This odd-looking figure reported himself to be a native of the county of Cornwall in the island of Great Britain. His boyhood had passed in the neighborhood of the tin mines, and his youth as the cabin boy of a smuggler between Falmouth and Guernsey. From this trade he had been impressed into the service of his king and for the want of a better had been taken into the cabin first as a servant, and finally as steward to the captain. Here he acquired the art of making chowder, lobster, and one or two other sea dishes, and, as he was fond of saying, had an opportunity of seeing the world. With the exception of one or two outports in France, and an occasional visit to Portsmouth, Plymouth and Deal, he had, in reality, seen no more of mankind, however, than if he had been riding a donkey in one of his native mines. But being discharged from the navy at the peace of eighty-three, he declared that, as he had seen all the civilized parts of the earth, he was inclined to make a trip to the wilds of America. We will not trace him in his brief wanderings under the influence of that spirit of immigration that sometimes induces a dapper cockney to quit his home and lands him, before the sound of cowbells is out of his ears, within the roar of the cataract of Niagara. But Shea only add that, at a very early day, even before Elizabeth had been sent to school, he had found his way into the family of Marmaduke Temple, where, owing to a combination of qualities that will be developed in the course of the tale, he held under Mr. Jones the office of Major Domo. The name of this worthy was Benjamin Penguillan, according to his own pronunciation, but owing to a marvelous tale that he was in the habit of relating concerning the length of time he had to labor to keep his ship from sinking after Rodney's victory, he had universally acquired the nickname of Ben Pump. By the side of Benjamin, and pressing forward, as if a little jealous of her station, stood a middle-aged woman, dressed in calico, rather violently contrasted in color with a tall, meager, shapeless figure. Sharp features, and a somewhat acute expression of her physiognomy. Her teeth were mostly gone, and what did remain were of a tight yellow. The skin of her nose was drawn tightly over the member to hang in large wrinkles in her cheeks and about her mouth. She took snuff in such quantities as to create the impression that she owed the saffron of her lips and the adjacent parts to this circumstance. But it was the unvarying color of her whole face. She presided over the female part of the domestic arrangements, 
in the capacity of housekeeping, was a spinster, and bore the name of Remarkable Pettibone. To Elizabeth she was an entire stranger, having been introduced into the family since the death of her mother. In addition to these were three or four subordinate menials, mostly black, some appearing at the principal door, and some running from the end of the building where stood the entrance to the cellar kitchen. Beside these there was a general rush from Richard's kennel, accompanied with every canine tone from the howl of the wolf-dog to the perpetual bark of the terrier. The master received their boisterous salutations with a variety of imitations from his own throat. When the dogs, probably from shame of being outdone, ceased their outcry. One stately, powerful mastiff, who wore round his neck a brass collar with M.T. engraved in large letters on the rim, alone was silent. He walked majestically amid the confusion to the side of the judge, where, receiving a kind pat or two, he turned to Elizabeth, who even stooped to kiss him, as she called him kindly by the name of Old Brave. The animal seemed to know her as she ascended the steps, supported by Monsieur Lecoy and her father, in order to protect her from falling on the ice with which they were covered. He looked wistfully at her figure, and when the door was closed on the whole party, he laid himself in a kennel that was placed nigh by, as if conscious that the house contained something of additional value to guard. Elizabeth followed her father, who paused a moment to whisper a message to one of his domestics, into a large hall that was dimly lighted by two candles placed on high, old-fashioned brass candlesticks. The door closed, and the party were at once removed from an atmosphere that was nearly at zero to one of sixty degrees above. In the center of the hall stood an enormous stoves, the sides of which appeared to be quivering with heat, from which a large straight pipe leading through the ceiling above carried off the smoke. An iron basin containing water was placed on this furnace, for such it only could be called, in order to preserve a proper humidity in the apartment. The room was carpeted and furnished with convenient substantial furniture, some of which was brought from the city, the remainder having been manufactured by the mechanics of Templeton. There was a sideboard of mahogany, inlaid with ivory, and bearing enormous handles of glittering brass, and groaning under the piles of silver plate. Near it stood a set of prodigious tables, made of the wild cherry, to imitate the imported wood of the sideboard, but plain and without ornamentation of any kind. Opposite to these stood a smaller table, formed from a lighter-colored wood, through the grains of which the wavy lines of the curled maple of the mountains were beautifully undulating. Near to this, in a corner, stood a heavy, old-fashioned, brass-faced clock, encased in a high box of the dark hue of the black walnut from the seashore. An enormous settee or sofa, covered with light chintz, stretched along the walls, for nearly twenty feet on one side of the hall, and chairs of wood painted a light yellow with black lines that were drawn by no very steady hand were ranged opposite and in the intervals between the other pieces of furniture. A Fahrenheit's thermometer in a mahogany case and with a barometer annexed was hung against the wall at some distance from the stove which Benjamin consulted every half-hour with prodigious exactitude. Two small glass chandeliers were suspended at equal distances between the stove and the outer doors, one of which opened at each end of the hall, 
and gilt lusters were affixed to the framework of the numerous side doors that led from the apartment. Some little display in architecture had been made in constructing these frames and casings, which were surmounted with pediments that bore each a little pedestal in its center. On these pedestals were small busts in blackened plaster of Paris. The style of the pedestals, as well as the selection of the bust, were all done to the taste of Mr. Jones. Only one stood Homer. A most striking likeness, Richard affirmed, as any one might see, for it was blind. Another bore the image of a smooth-visaged gentleman with a pointed beard, whom he called Shakespeare. A third ornament was an urn, which, from its shape, Richard was accustomed to say, intended to represent itself as holding the ashes of Dido. A fourth was certainly old Franklin, in his cap and spectacles. A fifth as surely bore the dignified composure of the face of Washington. A sixth was a nondescript representing a man with a shirt collar open, to use the language of Richard with a laurel on his head. It was Julius Caesar or Dr. Faustus. There were good reasons for believing either. The walls were hung with a dark lead-colored English paper that represented Britannia weeping over the tomb of Wolf. The hero himself stood at a little distance from the mourning goddess, and at the edge of the paper. Each width contained the figure, with the slight exception of one arm of the general which ran over on the next piece, so that when Richard essayed with his own hands to put together this delicate outline, some difficulties occurred that prevented a nice conjunction, and Britannia had reason to lament, in addition to the loss of her favorite's life, numberless cruel amputations of his right arm. The luckless cause of these unnatural divisions now announced his presence in the hall by a loud crack of his whip. "'Why, Benjamin, you, Ben Pump, is this the manner in which you receive the heiress?' he cried. "'Excuse him, Cousin Elizabeth. The arrangements were too intricate to be trusted to everyone. But now I am here. Things will go on better. Come, light up, Mr. Penguilon. Light up, light up! and let us see one another's faces. Well, Duke, I have brought home your deer. What is to be done with that, huh? By the Lord Squire, commenced Benjamin in reply, first giving his mouth a wipe with the back of his hand. If this here thing had been ordered some at earlier in the day, I might have got up the seed to your liking. I had mustered all hands, and was exercising candles when you hove in sight. But when the women heard your bells, they started an end as if they were riding the boat Swain's colt. And if so be, there is that man in the house who can bring up a parcel of women when they have got headway on them, until they have run out of the end of the rope. His name is not Benjamin Pump. But Miss Betsy here must have altered more than a privateer in disguise, since she has got on her woman's duds. If she will take offense with an old fellow for the small matter of lighting a few candles? Elizabeth and her father continue silent, for both experienced the same sensation on entering the hall. The former had resided one year in the building before she left home for school, and the figure of its lamented mistress was missed by both husband and child. But candles had been placed in the chandeliers and lustres, and the attendants were so far recovered from surprise as to recollect their use. The oversight was immediately remedied, and in a minute the apartment was a blaze of light. The slight melancholy of our heroine and her father was banished by this brilliant interruption and the whole party began to lay aside the numberless garments they had worn in the air. During this operation, Richard kept a desultory dialogue with the different domestics 
occasionally throwing out a remark to the judge concerning the deer. But as his conversation at such moments was much like an accompaniment on a piano, a thing that is heard without being attended to, we will not undertake the task of recording his diffuse discourse. The instant that remarkable Pettibone had executed her portion of the labor of illuminating, she returned to a position near Elizabeth with the apparent motive of receiving the clothes that the other threw aside, but in reality to examine with an air of curiosity, not unmixed with jealousy, the appearance of the lady who was to supplant her in the administration of their domestic economy. The housekeeper felt a little appalled when, after cloaks, coats, shawls, and socks had been taken off in succession, the large black hood was removed, and dark ringlets, shining like the raven's wing, fell from her head and left the sweet but commanding features of the young lady exposed to view. Nothing could be fairer and more spotless than the forehead of Elizabeth, and preserve the appearance of life and health. Her nose would have been called Grecian, but for a softly rounded swell that gave in character to the feature what it lost in beauty. Her mouth, at first sight, seemed only made for love, but, the instant that its muscles moved, every expression that woman's dignity could utter played around it with the flexibility of female grace. It spoke not only to the ear, but to the eye. So much added to a form of exquisite proportions, rather full and rounded for her years, and of the tallest medium height she inherited from her mother. Even the color of her eye, the arched brows, and the long silken lashes came from the same source, but its expression was her father's. Inert, and composed. It was soft, benevolent, and attractive, but it could be roused, and that without much difficulty. At such moments it was still beautiful, though it was a little severe. As the last shawl fell aside, and she stood dressed in a rich blue riding habit that fitted her form with the nicest exactness, her cheeks burning with roses, that bloomed the richer for the heat of the hall, and her eyes lightly diffused with moisture that rendered their ordinary beauty more dazzling, and with every feature of her speaking countenance illuminated by the lights that flared around her, remarkable felt that her own power had ended. The business of unrobing had been simultaneous. Marmaduke appeared in a suit of plain neat black, Monsieur Lecoy in a coat of snuff color, covering a vest of embroidery with breeches and silk stockings, and buckles that were commonly thought to be of paste. Major Hartman wore a coat of sky blue, with large brass buttons, a club wig, and boots. And Mr. Richard Jones had set off his dapper little form, with a frock of bottle green, with bullet buttons, by one of which the sides were united over his well-rounded waist. Opening above so as to show a jacket of red cloth with an undervest of flannel faced with green velvet, and below so as to exhibit a pair of buckskin breeches with long, soiled, white top boots and spurs, one of the latter a little bent from its recent attacks on the stool. When the young lady had extricated herself from her garments, she was at liberty to gaze about her, and to examine not only the household over which she was to preside, but also the air and manner in which the domestic arrangements were conducted. Although there was much incongruity in the furniture and appearance of the hall, there was nothing mean. The floor was carpeted, even in its remotest corners. The brass candlesticks, the gilt lusters, and the glass chandeliers, whatever might be their keeping as to proprietary and taste, were admirably kept as to all the purposes of use and comfort. They were clean and glittering in the strong light of the apartment. Compared with the chill aspect of the December night without, the warmth and brilliancy of the apartment 
produced an effect that was not unlike enchantment. Her eye had not time to detect in detail the little errors which in truth existed, but was glancing around her in delight when an object arrested her view that was in strong contrast to the smiling faces and neatly attired personages who had thus assembled to do honor to the heiress of Templeton. In the corner of the hall, near the grand entrance, stood the young hunter, unnoticed, and for the moment apparently forgotten. But even the forgetfulness of the judge, which under the influence of strong emotion had banished the recollection of the wound of his stranger, seemed surpassed by the absence of mind in the youth himself. On entering the apartment, he had mechanically lifted his cap, and exposed a head covered with hair that rivaled in color and gloss the locks of Elizabeth. Nothing could have wrought a greater transformation than the single act of removing the rough fox-skin cap. If there was much that was prepossessing in the countenance of the young hunter, there was something even noble in the rounded outlines of his head and brow. The very air and manner with which the member haughtily maintained itself over the course and even wild attire in which the rest of his frame was clad, bespoke not only familiarity with a splendor that in these new settlements was thought to be unequaled, but something very like contempt also. The hand that held the cap rested lightly on the little ivory-mounted piano of Elizabeth, with neither rustic restraint nor obtrusive vulgarity. A little finger touched the instrument as if accustomed to dwell on such places. His other arm was extended to its utmost length, and the hand grasped the barrel of his long rifle with something like convulsive energy. The act and the attitude were both involuntary, and evidently proceeded from a feeling much deeper than that of vulgar surprise. His appearance, connected as it was with the rough exterior of his dress, rendered him entirely distinct from the busy group who were moving across the other end of the long hall, occupied in receiving the travelers and exchanging their welcomes. And Elizabeth continued to gaze at him in wonder. The contraction of the stranger's brows increased as his eyes moved slowly from one object to another. For moments the expression of his countenance was fierce, and then, again, it seemed to pass away in some painful emotion. The arm that was extended bent and brought the hand nigh to his face, when his head dropped upon it and concealed the wonderfully speaking lineaments. We forget, dear sir, the strange gentleman, for her life Elizabeth could not call him otherwise, whom we have brought here for assistance, and to whom we owe every attention. All eyes were instantly turned in the direction of those of the speaker, and the youth rather proudly elevated his head again while he answered, My wound is trifling, and I believe that Judge Temple sent for a physician the moment we arrived. Certainly, said Marmaduke. I have not forgotten the object of thy visit, young man, nor the nature of my debt. Oh, exclaimed Richard, with something of a waggish leer, thou owest the lad for the venison. I suppose that thou killed cousin Duke. Marmaduke, Marmaduke, that was a marvelous tale of thine about the buck. Here, young man, are two dollars for the deer, and Judge Temple can do no less than pay the doctor. I shall charge you nothing for my services, but you shall not fare the worst for that. Come, come, Duke, don't be downhearted about it. If you miss the buck, you contrive to shoot this po poor fellow through a pine tree. Now I own that you have beat me. I never did such a thing in all my life. And I hope never will, returned the judge, if you are to experience the uneasiness that I have suffered. but. Be of good cheer, my young friend. The injury must be small, as thou movest thy arm with apparent freedom. Don't make the matter worse, Duke, by pretending to talk about surgery. 
interrupted Mr. Jones with a contemptuous wave of the hand. It's a science that can only be learned by practice. You know that my grandfather was a doctor, but you haven't got a drop of medical blood in your veins. These kind of things run in families. All my family by my father's side had a knack at physic. There was only my uncle who was killed. There was my uncle that was killed in Brandywine. He died as easy as any other man of the regiment, just from knowing how to hold his breath naturally. Few men that know how to breathe naturally. I doubt not, Dickon, returned the judge, meeting the bright smile which in spite of itself stole over the stranger's features, that thy family thoroughly understand the art of letting life slip through their fingers. Richard heard him quite coolly, and putting a hand in either pocket of his surcoat, so as to press forward the skirts, began to whistle a tune. But the desire to reply overcame his philosophy, and with great heat he exclaimed, You may affect to smile, Judge Temple, at hereditary virtues, if you please, but there is not a man on your patent who don't know better. Here, even this young man who has never seen anything but bears and deer and woodchucks, knows better than to believe virtues are not transmitted in fa families, don't you, friend? I believe that vice is not, said the stranger abruptly, his eyes glancing from the father to the daughter. The squire is right, judge, observed Benjamin, with a knowing nod of his head toward Richard, that bespoke the cordiality between them. Now in the old country the king's majesty touches for the evil, and that is a disorder that the greatest doctor in the fleet, or for the matter of that admiral either, can't cure. Only the king's majesty, or a man that's been hanged. Yes, the squire's right, for if so be that he wasn't, how is it that the seventh son always is a doctor, whether he ships for the cockpit or not? Now when he fell in with the monsieurs, under de Grouse, do ye see, we hid abroad of us a doctor. Very well, Benjamin, interrupted Elizabeth, glancing her eyes from the hunter to Monsieur Le Coy, who was most politely attending to what fell from each individual in succession. You shall tell me of that, and all your entertaining adventures together. Just now a room must be prepared in which the arm of this gentleman can be dressed. I will attend to that myself, cousin Elizabeth, observed Richard, somewhat haughtily. That young man will not suffer because Marmaduke chooses to be a little obstinate. Follow me, my friend, and I will examine the hurt myself. It will be well to wait for the physician, said the hunter coldly. He cannot be distant. Richard paused and looked at the speaker, a little astonished at the language and a good deal appalled at the refusal. He construed the latter to, into an act of hostility, and placing his hands in the pockets again, he walked up to Mr. Gaunt, and putting his face close to the countenance of the divine, said in an undertone, Now mark my words. There will be a story among the settlers that all our necks would have been broken but for that fellow as if I did not know how to drive. Why, you might have turned the horses yourself, sir. Nothing was easier. It was only pulling hard to the nigh rein, and touching off the flank of the leader. I hope, my dear sir, you are not at all hurt by the upset the lad gave us. The reply was interrupted by the entrance of the village physician. End of chapter 5 this recording by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009. Chapter 6 of The Pioneers or the Sources of the Susquehanna by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 Quote, And about his shells a beggarly account of empty boxes, green earthen pots, bladders, and musty seeds, remnants of pack-thread, and old cakes of roses, were thinly scattered to make up a show. Unquote. Shakespeare Dr. Elanthon Todd, for such was the name of the man of physic, was commonly thought to be among the settlers a gentleman of great mental endowments, and he was assuredly of rare personal proportions. In height, he measured, without his shoes, exactly six feet and four inches. His hands, feet, and knees corresponded in every respect with his formidable stature, but every other part of his frame appeared to have been intended for a man several sizes smaller, if we accept the length of the limbs. His shoulders were square, in one sense at least, being at a right line from one side to the other, but they were so narrow that the long dangling arms they supported seemed to issue out of his back. His neck possessed, in an eminent degree, the property of length to which we have alluded, and it was topped by a small bullet head that exhibited on one side a bush of bristling brown hair, and on the other a short, twinkling visage, that appeared to maintain a constant struggle with itself in order to look wise. He was the youngest son of a farmer in the western part of Massachusetts, who, being in somewhat easy circumstances, had allowed this boy to shoot up to the height we have mentioned without the ordinary interruptions of field labor, wood chopping, and other such toils as were imposed on his brothers. El Nathan was indebted for this exemption from labor, in some measure, to his extraordinary growth, which, leaving him pale, inanimate, and listless, induced his tender mother to pronounce him a sickly boy, and one that was not equal to work, but who might earn a living comfortably enough by taking to pleading law, or turning minister, or doctoring, or some such like easy calling. Still, there was great uncertainty which of these vocations the youth was best endowed to fill, but having no other employment, the stripling was constantly lounging about the homestead, munching green apples and hunting for sorrel, when the same sagacious eye that had brought to light his latent talents seized upon this circumstance as a clue to his future path through the turmoils of the world. Elnathan was cut out for a doctor. She knew, for he was forever digging for herbs and tasting all kinds of things that growed about the lots. Then again, he had a natural love for doctor stuff, for when she had left the bilious pills out for her man, all nicely covered with maple sugar, just ready to take, Nathan had come in and swallowed them for all the world as if they were nothing, while Ichabod, her husband, could never get one down without making such desperate faces that it was awful to look on. This discovery decided the matter. Elnathan, then about fifteen, was much like a wild colt, caught and trimmed by clipping his bushy locks, dressed in a suit of homespun, dyed in the butternut bark, furnished with a New Testament and a Webster spelling book, and sent to school. As the boy was by nature quite shrewd enough, and had previously at odd times laid foundations of reading, writing, and arithmetic, he was soon conspicuous in the school for his learning. The delighted mother had the gratification of hearing from the lips of the master that her son was a prodigious boy, and far above all his class. 
he also thought that the youth had a natural love for doctoring, as he had known him frequently advise the smaller children against eating too much, and, once or twice, when the ignorant little things had persevered in opposition to Elnathan's advice, he had known her son empty the school baskets with his own mouth to prevent the consequences. Soon after this comfortable declaration from his schoolmaster, the lad was removed to the house of the village doctor, a gentleman whose early career had not been unlike that of our hero, where he was to be seen sometimes watering a horse, at others watering medicines, blue, yellow, and red. Then again he might be noticed lolling under an apple tree, with Rudiman's Latin grammar in his hand, and a corner of Denman's midwifery sticking out of a pocket, for his instructor held it absurd to teach his pupil how to dispatch a patient regularly from this world before he knew how to bring him into it. This kind of life continued for a twelve-month, when he suddenly appeared at a meeting in a long coat, and well did it deserve the name, of black homespun, with little booties, bound with an uncovered calfskin, for the want of red morocco. Soon after he was seen shaving with a dull razor, three or four months had scarce elapsed, before several elderly ladies were observed hastening toward the house of a poor woman in the village, while others were running to and fro in great apparent distress. One or two boys were mounted bareback on horses and sent off at speed in various directions. Several indirect questions were put concerning the place where the physician was last seen, but all would not do, and at length Elnathan was seen issuing from his door with a very grave air preceded by a little white-headed boy, out of breath, trotting before him. The following day the youth appeared in the street, as the highway was called, and the neighborhood was much edified by the additional gravity of his air. The same week he bought a new razor, and the succeeding Sunday he entered the meeting-house with a red silk handkerchief in his hand, and with an extremely demure countenance. In the evening he called upon a young woman of his own class in life, for there were no others to be found, and when he was left alone with the fair, he was called for the first time in his life Dr. Todd by her prudent mother. The ice once broken in this manner, Elnathan was greeted from every mouth with his official appellation. Another year passed under the superintendence of the same master, during which the young physician had the credit of riding with the old doctor, although they were generally observed to travel different roads. At the end of that period, Dr. Todd attained his legal majority. He then took a jaunt to Boston to purchase medicines, and, as some intimated, to walk the hospital. We know not how the latter might have been, but, if true, he soon walked through it, for he returned within a fortnight, bringing with him a suspicious-looking box that smelled powerfully of brimstone. The next Sunday he was married, and the following morning he entered a one-horse sleigh with his bride, having before him the box we have mentioned, with another filled with homemade household linen, a paper-covered trunk, with a red umbrella lashed to it, a pair of quite new saddle-bags, and a hand-box. The next intelligence that his friends received of the bride and bridegroom was that the latter was settled in the new countries, and well-to-do as a doctor in Templeton in New York State. If Templer would smile at the qualifications of Marmaduke to fill the judicial seat he occupied, we were certain that a graduate of Leyden or Edinburgh would be extremely amused with this true narration 
of the servitude of Elnathan, in the temple of Escalapius. But the same consolation was afforded to both the jurist and the leech, for Dr. Todd was quite as much on a level with his own peers of the profession in that country, as was Marmaduke with his brethren on the bench. Time and practice did wonders for the physician. He was naturally humane, but possessed no small share of moral courage, or in other words, he was chary of the lives of his patients, and never tried uncertain experiments on such members of society as were considered useful. But once or twice, when a luckless vagrant had come under his care, he was a little addicted to trying the effects of every file in his saddle-bag on the stranger's condition. Happily, their number was small, and in most cases their natures innocent. By these means, Elnathan had acquired a certain degree of knowledge in fevers and aches, and could talk with judgment concerning intermittents, remittents, tertians, quotidians, etc. In certain cutaneous disorders, very prevalent in the new settlements, he was considered to be infallible. And there was no woman on the patent, but would as soon think of becoming a mother without a husband as without the assistance of Dr. Todd. In short, he was rearing on this foundation of sand a superstructure cemented by practice, though composed of somewhat brittle materials. He, however, occasionally renewed his elementary studies, and with the observation of a shrewd mind, was comfortably applying his practice to his theory. In surgery, having the least experience, and it being a business that spoke directly to the senses, he was most apt to distrust his own powers. But he had applied oils to several burns, cut around the roots of sundry defective teeth, and sewed up the wounds of numberless woodchoppers, with considerable eclat. When an unfortunate jobber suffered a fracture of his leg by the tree that he had been falling, it was on this occasion that our hero encountered the greatest trial his nerves and moral feeling had ever sustained. In the hour of need, however, he was not found wanting. Most of the amputations in the new settlements, and they were quite frequent, were performed by some one practitioner who, possessing originally a reputation, was enabled by his circumstances to acquire an experience that rendered him deserving of it, and Elnathan had been present at one or two of these operations. But, on the present occasion, the man of practice was not to be obtained, and the duty fell, as a matter of course, to the share of Mr. Todd. He went to work with a kind of blind desperation, observing at the same time all the externals of decent gravity and great skill. The sufferer's name was Milligan, and it was to his event that Richard alluded when he spoke of assisting the doctor at an amputation by holding the leg. The limb was certainly cut off, and the patient survived the operation. It was, however, two years before Milligan ceased to complain that they had buried the leg in so narrow a box that it was straightened for room. He could feel the pain shooting up from the inhumed fragment into the living members. Marmaduke suggested that the fault might lie in the arteries and nerves, but Richard, considering the amputation as a part of his own handiwork, strongly repelled the insinuation at the same time declaring that he had often heard of men who would tell when it was about to rain by the toes of amputated limbs. After two or three years notwithstanding, Milligan's complaints gradually diminished, the leg was dug up and a larger box furnished, and from that hour 
no one had heard the sufferer utter another complaint on the subject. This gave the public great confidence in Dr. Todd, whose reputation was hourly increasing, and luckily for his patients, his information also. Notwithstanding Dr. Todd's practice and his success with the leg, he was not a little appalled on entering the hall of the mansion house. It was glaring with the light of day. It looked so imposing, compared with the hastily built and scantily furnished apartments which he frequented in his ordinary practice, and contained so many well-dressed persons and anxious faces, that his usually firm nerves were a good deal discomposed. He had heard from the messenger who summoned him that it was a gunshot wound, and had come from his own home wading through the snow, with his saddle-bags thrown over his arm, while separated arteries, penetrated lungs, and injured vitals were whirling through his brain, as if he were stalking over a field of battle, instead of Judge Temple's peaceable enclosure. The first object that met his eye as he moved into the room was Elizabeth in her riding habit richly laced with gold cord, her fine form bending toward him, and her face expressing deep anxiety in every one of its beautiful features. The enormous knees of the physician struck each other with a noise that was audible, for in the absent state of his mind he mistook her for a general officer, perforated with bullets hastening from the field of battle to implore assistance. The delusion, however, was but momentary, and his eye glanced rapidly from the daughter to the earnest dignity of the father's countenance, thence to the busy strut of Richard, who was cooling his impatience at the hunter's indifference to his assistance, by pacing the hall and cracking his whip. From him to the Frenchman, who had stood for several minutes unheeded with a chair for the lady, thence to Major Hartman, who was coolly lighting a pipe, three feet long, by a candle in one of the chandeliers, thence to Mr. Grant, who was turning over a manuscript with much earnestness at one of the lusters, thence to Remarkable, who stood with her arms demurely folded before her, surveying with a look of admiration and envy, the dress and beauty of the young lady, and from her to Benjamin, who with his feet standing wide apart and his arms akimbo, was balancing his square little body with the indifference of one who is accustomed to wounds and bloodshed. All of these seemed to be unhurt, and the operator began to breathe more frequently. But, before he had time to take a second look, the judge, advancing, shook him kindly by the hand and spoke. Thou art welcome, my good sir, quite welcome indeed. Here is a youth whom I have unfortunately wounded in shooting a deer this evening, and requires some of thy assistance. Shooting a deer, Duke, interrupted Richard, shooting at a deer. Who do you think can prescribe unless he knows the truth of the case? It is always so with some people. They think a doctor can be deceived with the same impunity as another man. Shooting at a deer, truly, returned the judge, smiling. Although it is by no means certain that I did not aid in destroying the buck. But the youth is injured by my hand be that as it may, and it is thy skill that must cure him, and my pocket shall amply reward thee for it. Tis very good things to depend on, observed Monsieur Lecoy, bowing politely with a sweep of his head to the judge and to the practitioner. I thank you, Monsieur, returned the judge, but we keep the young man in pain. Remarkable. Thou wilt please to provide linen for lint and bandages? 
This remark caused the cessation of the compliments, and induced the physician to turn an inquiring eye in the direction of his patient. During the dialogue, the young hunter had thrown aside his overcoat, and now stood clad in a plain suit of the common, light-colored homespun of the country, that was evidently, but recently made. His hand was on the lapels of his coat, in the attitude of removing the garment, when he suddenly suspended the movement, and looked toward the commiserating Elizabeth, who was standing in an unchanged posture, too much observed with her anxious feelings to heed his actions. A slight color appeared on the brow of the youth. Possibly the sight of blood may alarm the lady. I will retire to another room while the wound is dressing. By no means, said Dr. Todd, who, having discovered that his patient was far from being a man of importance, felt much emboldened to perform the duty. The strong light of these candles is favorable to the operation, and it is seldom that we hard students enjoy good eyesight. While speaking, Elizabeth placed a pair of large iron-rimmed spectacles on his face, where they drooped, as it were, by long practice, to the extremity of his slim pug nose, and, if they were of no service as assistance to his eyes, neither were they any impediment to his vision, for his little gray organs were twinkling above them like two stars emerging from the envious cover of a cloud. The action was unheeded by all, but remarkable, who observed to Benjamin, Dr. Todd is a comely man to look on, and this bit pretty. How well he seems in spectacles, I declare. They give a grand look to a body's face. I have quite a mind to try them myself. The speech of the stranger recalled the recollection of Miss Temple, who started as if from deep abstraction and coloring excessively. She motioned to a young woman who served in the capacity of maid and retired with an air of womanly reserve. The field was now left to the physician and his patient, while the different personages who remained gathered around the latter with faces expressing the various degrees of interest that each one felt in his condition. Major Hartman alone retained his seat, where he continued to throw out vast quantities of smoke, now rolling his eyes up to the ceiling as if musing on the uncertainty of life, and now bending them on the wounded man with an expression that bespoke some consciousness of his situation. In the meantime, L. Nathan, to whom the sight of a gunshot wound was a perfect novelty, commenced his preparations with a solemnity and care that were worthy of the occasion. An old shirt was procured by Benjamin and placed in the hand of the other, who tore diverse bandages from it, with an exactitude that marked both his own skill and the importance of the operation. When this preparatory measure was taken, Dr. Todd selected a piece of the shirt with great care, and handing to Mr. Jones, without moving a muscle, said, Here, Squire Jones, you are well acquainted with these things. Will you please to scrape the lint? It should be fine and soft, you know, my dear sir, and be cautious that no cotton gets in, or it may pison the wound. The shirt has been made with cotton thread, but you can easily pick it out. Richard assumed the office with a nod at his cousin, and said quite plainly, You see, this fellow can't get along without me, and began to scrape the linen on his knee with great diligence. A table was now spread with vials, boxes of salve, and diverse surgical instruments as the latter appeared in succession from a case of red morocco, their owner held up each implement to the strong light of the chandelier near to which he stood, and examined it with the nicest care. A red silk handkerchief was frequently applied to the glittering steel, 
as if to remove from the polished surfaces the last impediment which might exist to the most delicate operation. After the rather scantily furnished pocket case, which contained these instruments, was exhausted, the physician turned to his saddlebags, and produced various vials, filled with liquids of the most radiant colors. These were arranged in due order by the side of the murderer's saws, knives, and scissors. When Elnathan stretched his long body to its utmost elevation, placing his hand on the small of his back as if for support, and looked about him to discover what effect this display of professional skill was likely to produce on the spectators. "'Upon my word, doctor,' observed Major Hartman, with a roguish roll of his little black eyes, but with every other feature of his face, a state of perfect rest. "'Put you have a very pretty pocket-book of tools there, and your doctor stuff glitters, as if was prettier for to eyes as per to belly.' Elnathan gave him <laughs> one that one might have equally taken for that kind of noise which cowards are said to make in order to awaken their dormant courage, or for a natural effort to clear the throat. If for the latter it was successful, for turning his face to the veteran German, he said, Very true, Major Hartman, very true, sir. A prudent man will always strive to make his remedies agreeable to the eyes though they may not altogether suit the stomach. It is no small part of our art, sir. And he now spoke with the confidence of a man who understood his subject. To reconcile the patient to what is for his own good, though at the same time it may be unpalatable. Certain Dr. Todd is right, said Remarkable and has scripture for what he says. The Bible tells us how things may be sweet to the mouth and bitter to the innards. True, true, interrupted the judge, a little impatiently. But here is a youth who needs no deception to lure him to his own benefit. I see by his eye that he fears nothing more than delay. The stranger had, without assistance, bared his own shoulder, when the slight perforation produced by the passage of the buckshot was plainly visible. The intense cold of the evening had stopped the bleeding, and Dr. Todd, casting a furtive glance at the wound, thought it by no means so formidable a fare as he had anticipated. Thus encouraged, he approached his patient and made some indication of an intention to trace the route that had been taken by the lead. Remarkable often found occasions in after days to recount the minutia of that celebrated operation, and when she arrived at this point, she commonly proceeded as follows. And then the doctor took out of the pocketbook a long thing like a knitting needle, with a button fastened to the end of it, and then he pushed it into the wound, and then the young man looked awful. And then I thought I should have swained away. I felt in stitch a dispute taken. And then the doctor run it through his shoulder and shoved the bullet out on the other side. And so Dr. Todd cured the young man of a ball that the judge had shot into him. For all the world is easy as I could pick out a splinter with my darning needle. Such were the impressions of Remarkable on the subject, and such doubtless were the opinions of most of those who felt it necessary to entertain a species of religious veneration for the skill of Elnathan. But such was far from the truth. When the physician attempted to introduce the instrument described by Remarkable, he was repulsed by the stranger, with a good deal of decision and some little contempt in his manner. "'I believe, sir,' he said, "'that a probe is not necessary. The shot has missed the bone and has passed directly through the arm to the opposite side, where it remains but skin deep. 
and whence, I should think, it might be easily extracted. The gentleman knows best, said Dr. Todd, laying down the probe with the air of a man who had assumed it merely in compliance with forms, and turning to Richard, he fingered the lint with the appearance of great care and foresight. Admirably well scraped, Squire Jones. It is about the best lint I have ever seen. I want your assistance, my good sir, to hold the patient's arm while I make an incision for the ball. Now, I rather guess there is not another gentleman present who could scrape the lint so well as Squire Jones. Such things run in families, observed Richard, rising with alacrity to render the desired assistance. My father and my grandfather before him were both celebrated for their knowledge of surgery. They were not, like Marmaduke here, puffed up with an accidental thing such as the time he drew in the hip-joint of the man who was thrown from his horse. That was the fall before you came into the settlement, doctor. But they were men who were taught the thing regularly, spending half their lives in learning those little niceties, though. For the matter of that, my grandfather was a college-bred physician, and the rest of the colony, too, that is, in his neighborhood. So it is with the world, squire cried Benjamin. If so be that a man wants to walk the quarter-deck with credit, do you see, and with regular built swabs on his shoulder, he mustn't think to do it by getting in at the cabin windows. There are two ways to get into a top besides the lubber holes. The true way to walk aft is to begin forward, though if he only be a humble way like myself, do you see, which was from being only a handler of top-gallant sails and a stower of the flying jib to keeping the key of the captain's locker. Benjamin speaks quite to the purpose, continued Richard. I dare say he has often seen shot extracted in the different ships in which he has served. Suppose we get him to hold the basin. He must be used to the sight of blood. That he is, squire, that he is interrupted the civilant steward. Many's the good shot round double-headed and grape that I've seen the doctors at work on. For the matter of what, I was in a boat alongside the ship when they cut out the twelve-pound shot from the thigh of the captain of the footy wrong, one of Monsieur Le Croix's countrymen. Footnote. It is possible that the reader may start at this declaration of Benjamin. But those who have lived in the new settlements of America are too much accustomed to hear these European exploits to doubt it. And footnote. A twelve-pound ball from the thigh of a human being? Examined Mr. Grant with great simplicity, dropping the sermon he was again reading and raising his spectacles to the top of his forehead. A twelve-pounder, echoed Benjamin, stirring around him with much confidence. A twelve-pounder, I, a twenty-four-pound shot, can easily be taken from a man's body, if so be a doctor only knows how. There's Squire Jones now. Ask him, sir. He reads all the books. Ask him if he never fell in with a page that keeps the reckoning of such things. Certainly more important operations than that have been performed, observed Richard. The Encyclopedia mentions much more incredible circumstances than that, as I dare say you know, Dr. Todd. Certainly. There are incredible tales told in the Encyclopedias, returned Elnathan. Though I cannot say I have ever seen myself anything larger than a musket-ball extracted. During this discourse, an incision had been made through the skin of the young hunter-soldier, and the lead was laid bare. Elnathan took a pair of glittering forceps, and was in the act of applying them to the wound, when the sudden motion of the patient caused the shot to fall out of itself. The long arm and broad hand of the operator were now of singular service, for the latter expanded itself, and caught the lead, while at the same time 
an extremely ambiguous motion was made by its brother as to leave it doubtful to the spectators how great was its agency in releasing the shot richard however put the matter at rest by exclaiming very neatly done doctor i have never seen a shot more neatly extracted and i dare say benjamin will say the same why considering returned benjamin i must say that it was shipshape and brister fashion now all that the doctor has to do is to clap a couple of plugs in the holes and the lad will float in any gale that blows in these here hills i thank you sir for what you have done said the youth with a little distance but here is a man who will take me under his care and spare you all gentlemen any further trouble on my account the whole group turned their heads in surprise and beheld standing at one of the distant doors of the hall the person of indian john end of chapter six this recording by gary w sherwin of yukon pennsylvania in january of two thousand nine Chapter 7 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 Quote, from Susquehanna's utmost springs, where savage tribes pursue their game, his blanket tied with yellow strings, the shepherd of the forest came. Unquote. By Freneau. Before the Europeans, or to use a more significant term, the Christians, dispossessed the original owners of the soil, all that section of the country which contains the New England states, and those of the middle, which lie east of the mountains, was occupied by two great nations of Indians, from whom had descended numberless tribes. But as the original distinctions between these nations were marked by a difference in language, as well as by repeated and bloody wars, they were never known to amalgamate, until after the power in inroads of the whites had reduced some of the tribes to a state of dependence that rendered not only their political, but, considering the wants and habits of a savage, their animal existence also extremely precarious. These two great divisions consisted on the one side of the five, or, or as they were afterward called, the six nations, and their allies, and on the other, the Lenny Lenape, or Delawares, with the numerous and powerful tribes that owned that nation as their grandfather. The former was generally called by the Anglo-Americans Iroquois, or the six nations, or sometimes Mingos. Their appellation among their rivals seems generally have been the Mengue or Mogwa. They consisted of the tribes, or as their allies were fond of asserting, in order to raise their consequence of the several nations of the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas, who ranked in the confederation in the order in which they are named. The Tuscaroras were admitted to this union near a century after its foundation, and thus completed the number of six. Of the Lenny Lenape, or as they were called by the whites, from the circumstances of their holding their great council fire on the banks of that river, the Delaware Nation, the principal tribes, besides that which bore the generic name, were 
Mahicone, Mohicans, or Mohegans, and the Nanticokes, or Nentigos. Of these, the latter held the country along the waters of the Chesapeake and the seashore, while the Mohegans occupied the district between the Hudson and the ocean, including much of New England. Of course, these two tribes were the first who were dispossessed of their lands by the Europeans. The wars of a portion of the latter are celebrated among us as the wars of King Philip, but the peaceful policy of William Penn, or Mingwon, as he was termed by the natives, effected its object with less difficulty, though not with less certainty. As the natives gradually disappeared from the country of the Mohicans, some scattering families sought a refuge around the council fire of the mother tribe, or the Delawares. This people had been induced to suffer themselves to be called women by their old enemies, the Mingos or Iroquois. After the latter, having in vain tried the effects of hostility, had recourse in artifice in order to prevail over their rivals. According to this declaration, the Delawares were to cultivate the arts of peace and to entrust their defenses entirely to the men or warlike tribes of the Six Nations. This state of things continued until the War of the Revolution, when the Lenny Lenape formally asserted their independence and fearlessly declared that they were again men. But in a government so peculiarly republican as the Indian polity, it was not at all times an easy task to restrain its members within the rules of the nation. Several fierce and renowned warriors of the Mohicans, finding the conflict with the whites to be in vain, sought a refuge with their grandfather and brought with them the feelings and principles that had so long distinguished them in their own tribe. These chieftains kept alive, in some measure, the martial spirit of the Delawares, and would, at times, lead small parties against their ancient enemies, or such other foes as incurred their resentment. Among these warriors was one race particularly famous for their prowess and for those qualities that render an Indian hero celebrated. But war, time, disease, and want had conspired to thin their number, and the sole representative of this once renowned family now stood in the hall of Marmaduke Temple. He had for a long time been an associate of the white men, particularly in their wars, and having been at the season when his services were of importance much noticed and flattered, he turned Christian and was baptized by the name of John. He had suffered severely in his family during the recent war, having had every soul to whom he was allied cut off by an inroad of the enemy, and when the last lingering remnant of his nation extinguished their fires among the hills of the Delaware, he alone had remained, with a determination of laying his bones in that country where his fathers had so long lived and governed. It was only, however, within a few months that he had appeared among the mountains that surrounded Templeton. To the hut of the old hunter he seemed peculiarly welcome and, as the habits of the leather-stocking were so nearly assimilated to those of the savages, the conjunction of their interests excited no surprise. They resided in the same cabin, ate the, of the same food, and were chiefly occupied in the same pursuits. We have already mentioned the baptismal name of this ancient chief but in his conversation with Natty, held in the language of the Delawares, he was heard uniformly 
to call himself Chingachgook, which interpreted means the great snake. This name he had acquired in his youth by his skill and prowess in war. But when his brows began to wrinkle with time, and he stood alone, the last of his family and his particular tribe, the few Delawares who yet continued about the headwaters of their river gave him the mournful appellation of Mohegan. Perhaps there was something of deep feeling excited in the bosom of this inhabitant of the forest by the sound of a name that recalled the idea of his nation in ruins, for he seldom used it himself. Never indeed, excepting on the most solemn occasions. But the settlers had united, according to the Christian custom, his baptismal with his national name, and to him he was generally known as John Mohegan, or more familiarly as Indian John. From his long association with the white men, the habits of Mohegan were a mixture of the civilized and savage states, though there was certainly a strong preponderance in favor of the latter. In common with all his people who dwelt within the influence of the Anglo-Americans, he had acquired new wants, and his dress was a mixture of his native and European fashions. Notwithstanding the intense cold without, his head was uncovered, but a profusion of long black coarse hair concealed his forehead, his crown, and even hung about his cheeks, so as to convey the idea to one who knew his present amid former conditions that he encouraged its abundance as a willing veil to hide the shame of a noble soul, mourning for glory once known. His forehead, when it could be seen, appeared lofty, broad, and noble. His nose was high, and of the kind called Roman, with nostrils that expanded. In his seventieth year, with the freedom that had distinguished them in youth, his mouth was large but compressed, and possessing a great share of expression and character, and when opened, it discovered a perfect set of short, strong, and regular teeth. His chin was full, though not prominent, and his face bore the infallible mark of his people in its square, high cheekbones. The eyes were not large, but their black orbs glittered in the rays of the candles as he gazed intently down the hall like two balls of fire. The instant that Mohegan observed himself to be noticed by the group around the young stranger, he dropped the blanket which covered the upper part of his frame from his shoulders, suffering it to fall over his leggings of untanned deerskin, where it was retained by a belt of bark that confined it to his waist. As he walked slowly down the long hall, the dignified and deliberate tread of the Indian surprised the spectators. His shoulders and body to his waist were entirely bare, with the exception of a silver medallion of Washington that was suspended from his neck by a thong of buckskin and rested on his high chest amid many scars. His shoulders were rather broad and full, but the arms, though straight and graceful, wanted the muscular appearance that labor gives to a race of men. The medallion was the only ornament he wore, although enormous slits in the rim of either ear, which suffered the cartilages to fall two inches below the members, had evidently been used for the purpose of decoration in other days. In his hand he held a small basket of the ash wood slips, covered in diverse fantastical conceits, with red and black paints mingled with the white of the wood. As this child of the forest approached them, 
the whole party stood aside and allowed him to confront the object of his visit. He did not speak, however, but stood fixing his glowing eyes on the shoulder of the young hunter, and then turning them intently on the countenance of the judge. The latter was a good deal astonished at this unusual departure from the ordinarily subdued and quiet manner of the Indian, but he extended his hand and said, Thou art welcome, John. This youth entertains a high opinion of thy skill, it seems, for he prefers thee to dress his wound, even to our good friend, Dr. Todd. Mohican now spoke in tolerable English, but in a low, monotonous, guttural tone. The children of Mingon do not love the sight of blood, and yet young Eagle has been struck by the hand that should do no evil. Mohegan, old John, exclaimed the judge, thinkest thou that my hand was ever drawn human blood willingly? For shame, for shame, old John, thy religion should have taught thee better. The evil spirit sometimes lives in the best heart, returned John, but my brother speaks the truth. His hand has never taken life when awake. No, not even when the children of the great English father were making the waters red with the blood of his people. Surely, John, said Mr. Grant, with much earnestness, you remember the divine command of our Savior. Judge not, lest ye be judged. What motive would Judge Temple have for injuring a youth like this? one to whom he is unknown, and from whom he can receive neither injury nor favor. John listened respectfully to the divine, and, when he had concluded, he stretched out his arm and said with energy, He is innocent. My brother has not done this. Marmaduke received the offered hand of the other with a smile that showed However he might be astonished at his suspicion, he had ceased to resent it, while the wounded youth stood gazing from his red friend to his host, with interest powerfully delineated in his countenance. No sooner was this act of pacification exchanged than John proceeded to discharge the duty on which he had come. Dr. Todd was far from manifesting any displeasure at this invasion of his rights, but made way for the new leech with an air that expressed a willingness to gratify the humors of his patient, now that the all-important part of the business was so successfully performed, and nothing remained to be done but that what any child might effect. Indeed, he whispered as much to Monsieur Lacoy when he said, it, is unf it was fortunate that the ball was extracted before this Indian came in, but any old woman can dress the wound. The young man, I hear, lives with John and Natty Bumpo, and it's always best to humor a patient when it can be done discreetly. I say, discreetly, Monsieur. Certainment, returned the Frenchman. You seem very happy, Mr. Todd, in your practice. I think the other lady might very well finish what you so skillfully begin. But Richard had, at the bottom, a great deal of veneration for the knowledge of Mohican, especially in external wounds, and retaining all his desire for a participation in glory, he advanced nigh the Indian and said, Sago, Sago, Mohegan, Sago, my good fellow, I am glad you have come. Give me a regular physician like Dr. Todd to cut into flesh and a native to heal the wound. Do you remember, John? the time when I and you set the bone of Natty Bumpo's little finger, after he broke it by falling from the rock when he was trying to get the partridge that fell on the cliffs? 
I never could tell yet whether it was I or Natty who killed that bird. He fired first, and the bird stooped, and then it was rising again as I pulled trigger. I should have claimed it for a certainty, but Natty said the hole was too big for shot, and he fired a single ball from his rifle. But the piece I carried then didn't scatter, and I have known it to bore a hole through a board when I've been shooting at a mark very much like rifle bullets. Shall I help you, John? You know I have a knack at these things. Mohegan heard this disquisition quite patiently, and when Richard concluded, he held out the basket which contained his specifics, indicating by a gesture that he might hold it. Mr. Jones was quite satisfied with this commission, and ever after, in speaking of the event, was used to say that Dr. Todd and I cut out the bullet, and I and Indian John dressed the wound. The patient was much more deserving of that epithet while under the hands of Mohican than while suffering under the practice of the physician. Indeed, the Indian gave him but little opportunity for the exercise of a forbearing temper as he had come prepared for the occasion. His dressings were soon applied, and consisted only of some pounded bark, moistened with a fluid that he had expressed from some of the simples of the woods. Among the native tribes of the forest there are always two kinds of leeches to be met with. The one placed its whole dependence on the exercise of supernatural power, and was held in greater veneration than their practice could at all justify. But the other was really endowed with great skill in the ordinary complaints of the human body, and was more particularly, as Natty had intimated, curious in cuts and bruises. While John and Richard were placing the dressings on the wound, Elnathan was acutely eyeing the contents of Mohegan's basket, which Mr. Jones in his physical ardor had transferred to the doctor, in order to hold himself one end of the bandages. Here he was soon enabled to detect sundry fragments of wood and bark, of which he quite coolly took possession, very possibly without any intention of speaking at all upon the subject. But when he beheld the full blue eye of Marmaduke watching his movements, he whispered to the judge, It is not to be denied, Judge Temple, but what the savages are knowing in small matters of physic. They hand these things down in their traditions. Now, in cancers and hydrophobia, they are quite ingenious. I will just take this bark home and analyze it, for though it can't be worth sixpence to the young man's shoulder, it may be good for the toothache or rheumatism or some of them complaints. A man should never be above learning, even if it be from an Indian. It was fortunate for Dr. Todd that his principles were so liberal, as coupled with his practice, they were the means by which he acquired all his knowledge, and by which he was gradually qualifying himself for the duties of his profession. The process to which he subjected the specific differed, however, greatly from the ordinary rules of chemistry, for instead of separating, he afterward united the component parts of Mohegan's remedy and thus was able to discover the tree whence the Indian had taken it. Some ten years after this event, when civilization and its refinements had crept, or rather rushed, into the settlements among these wild hills, an affair of honor occurred, and Elnathan was seen to apply a salve to the wound received by one of the parties, which had the flavor that was peculiar to the tree or root that Mohegan had used. Ten years later still, 
when England and the United States were again engaged in war, and the hordes of the western parts of the state of New York were rushing to the field, Elnathan, presuming on the reputation gained by these two operations, followed in the rear of a brigade or militia as its surgeon. When Mohegan had applied the bark, he freely relinquished to Richard the needle and thread that were used in sewing the bandages, for these were implements of which the native but little understood the use, and stepping back with decent gravity, awaited the completion of the business by the other. "'Reach me the scissors,' said Mr. Jones, when he had finished, and finished for the second time, after tying the linen in every shape and form that it could be placed. "'Reach me the scissors, for here is a thread that must be cut off, or it might get under the dressing and inflame the wound. See, John, I have put the lint I scraped between the two layers of linen, for though the bark is certainly best for the flesh, yet the lint will serve to keep the cold air from the wound. If any lint will do it good, it is this lint. I scraped it myself, and I will not turn my back at scraping lint to any man on the patent. I ought to know how, if anybody ought, for my grandfather was a doctor, and my father was a natural turn that way. Here, squire, is the scissors, said Remarkable, producing from beneath her petticoat of green moreen a pair of dull-looking shears. Well, upon my say-so, you've sewn that rags as well as a woman. "'As well as a woman!' echoed Richard with indignation. "'What do women know of such matters? "'And you are proof of the truth of what I say. "'Who ever saw such a pair of shears used about a wound? "'Dr. Todd, I will thank you for the scissors from the case. "'Now, young man, I think you'll do. "'The shot has been neatly taken out, although perhaps—' seeing i had a hand in it i ought not to say so and the wound is admirably dressed you will soon be well again though the jerk you gave my leaders must have a tendency to inflame the shoulder yet you will do you will do you were rather flurried i s suppose and not used to horses but i forgive the accident for the motive no doubt you had the best of motives. Yes, now you will do. Then, gentlemen, said the wounded stranger, rising and resuming his clothes, it will be unnecessary for me to trespass longer on your time and patience. There remains but one thing more to be settled, and that is our respectful rights to the deer, Judge Temple. I acknowledge it to be thine, said Marmaduke, and much more deeply am I indebted to thee than for this piece of venison. But in the morning thou wilt call here, and we can adjust this as well as more important matters. Elizabeth, for the young lady being apprised that the wound was dressed had re-entered the hall, Thou wilt order a repast for this youth before we proceed to the church, and Aggie will have a sleigh prepared to convey him to his friend. But, sir, I cannot go without a part of the deer, returned the youth, seemingly struggling with his own feelings. I have already told you that I needed the venison for myself. "'Oh, we will not be particular,' exclaimed Richard. "'The judge will pay you in the morning for the whole deer, "'and, remarkable, give the lad all the animal excepting the saddle. "'So on the whole I think you may consider yourself as a very lucky young man. "'You have been shot without being disabled, "'have had the wound dressed in the best possible manner here in the woods.' as well as it would have been done in the Philadelphia Hospital, if not better. Have sold your deer at a high price, 
and yet can keep most of the carcass with the skin in the bargain. Marky, tell Tom to give him the skin, too, and in the morning bring the skin to me, and I will give you half a dollar for it, or at least three and sixpence. I want just the skin to cover the pillion that I am making for Cousin Bess. I thank you, sir, for your liberality, and I trust am also thankful for my escape, returned the stranger. But you reserve the very part of the animal that I wished for my own use. I must have the saddle myself. Must, echoed Richard. Must is harder to be swallowed than the horns of the buck. Yes, must, repeated the youth, when turning his head proudly around him, as if to see who would dare to controvert his rights, he met the astonished gaze of Elizabeth, and proceeded more mildly. That is, if a man is allowed the possession of that which his hand hath killed, and the law will protect him in the enjoyment of his own. The law will do so, said Judge Temple, with an air of mortification mingled with surprise. Benjamin! See that the whole deer is placed in the sleigh, and have this youth conveyed to the hut of Leatherstocking. But, young man, thou hast a name, and shall I see you again in order to compensate thee for the wrong I have done thee? I am called Edwards, returned the hunter. Oliver Edwards. I am easily to be seen, sir, for I live nigh by and am not afraid to show my face, having never injured any man. "'It is we who have injured you, sir,' said Elizabeth, "'and the knowledge that you decline our assistance would give my father great pain. He would gladly see you in the morning.' The young hunter gazed at the fair speaker until his earnest look brought blood to her temples. When, recollecting himself, he bent his head, dropping his eyes to the carpet, and replied, In the morning, then, will I return and see Judge Temple, and I will accept his offer of the sleigh in token of amity. Amity! repeated Marmaduke. There was no malice in the act that injured the young man. There should be none in the feelings which it may engender. Forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, observed Mr. Grant. It is the language used by our divine master himself, and it should be the golden rule with us, his humble followers. The stranger stood a moment, lost in thought, and then glancing his dark eyes rather wildly around the hall, he bowed low to the divine and moved from the apartment with an air that would not admit of detention. "'Tis strange that one so young should harbor such feeling of resentment," said Marmaduke, when the door closed behind the stranger. "'But while the pain is recent and the sense of the injury so fresh, he must feel more strongly than in cooler moments. I doubt not we shall see him in the morning more tractable. Elizabeth, to whom this speech was addressed, did not reply, but moved slowly up the hall by herself, fixing her eyes on the little figure of the English ingrain carpet that covered the floor, while on the other hand Richard gave a loud crack with his whip as the stranger disappeared and cried, Well, Duke, you are your own master, but I would have tried law for the saddle before I would have given it to the fellow. Do you not own the mountains as well as the valleys? Are not the woods your own? What right has this chap, or the leather stocking, to shoot in your woods without your permission? Now, I have known a farmer in Pennsylvania order a sportsman off his farm with as little ceremony as I would 
order Benjamin to put a log in the stove by the by. Benjamin, see how the thermometer stands? Now, if a man has a right to do this on a farm of a hundred acres, what power must a landlord have who owns sixty thousand, I? For the matter of that, including the late purchases, a hundred thousand. There is Mohican, to be sure. He may have some right, being a native, but it's little the poor fellow can do now with his rifle. How is this managed in France, Monsieur Lacoy? Do you let everybody run over your land in that country, Helter Skelter, as they do here, shooting the game so that a gentleman has but little or no chance with his gun? Bah, diable, no, Mr. Dick, replied the Frenchman. We give in France no liberty except to the laddie. Yes, yes, to the woman, I know, said Richard. That is your Salic law. I read, sir, all kinds of books of France, as well as England, of Greece, as well as Rome. But if I were in Duke's place, I would stick up advertisements tomorrow morning forbidding all persons to shoot or trespass in any manner on my woods. I could write such an advertisement myself in an hour, as would put a stop to the thing at once. Rickert, said Major Hartman, very coolly knocking the ashes from his pipe into the spitting box by his side. Now listen, I have lived seventy-five years on to Merhawk and interwoods. You had better meddle as meet der devil, as meet der hunters. They leave meet their gun, and a rifle is better. As to law. Ain't Marmaduke a judge? said Richard indignantly. Where is the use of being a judge or having a judge if there is no law? Damn the fellow! I have a great mind to sue him in the morning myself before Squire Doolittle for meddling with my leaders. I am not afraid of his rifle. I can shoot too. I have hit a dollar many a time at fifty rods. Thou hast missed more dollars than ever thou hast hit, Dickon, exclaimed the cheerful voice of the judge. But we will now take our evening's repast, which I perceive by remarkable physiognomy is ready. Monsieur Lacoy, Miss Temple, has a hand at your service. Will you lead the way, my child? Ah, ma chère mademoiselle, comme de soi enchanté, said the Frenchman. Il ne manque que les dames de fer un paldi de Templeton. Mr. Grant and Mohegan continued in the hall, while the remainder of the party withdrew to an eating parlor, if we exempt Benjamin, who civilly remained to close the rear after the clergyman and to open the front door for the exit of the Indian. John, said the divine, when the figure of Judge Temple disappeared, the last of the group, tomorrow is the festival of the nativity of our blessed Redeemer, when the church has appointed prayers and thanksgiving to be offered by her children, and when all are invited to partake of the mystical elements. As you have taken up the cross, and become a follower of good, and an escure of evil, I trust I shall see you before the altar, with a contrite heart, and a meek spirit. John will come, said the Indian, betraying no surprise, though he did not understand all the terms used by the other. Yes, continued Mr. Grant, laying his hand gently on the tawny shoulder of the aged chief. But it is not enough to be there in the body. You must come in the spirit and in truth. The Redeemer died for all, for the poor Indian as well as for the white man. Heaven knows no difference in color, nor must earth witness a separation of the church. 
it is good and profitable, John, to freshen the understanding and support the wavering by the observance of our holy festivals. But all form is but stench in the nostrils of the Holy One, unless it be accompanied by a devout and humble spirit. The Indian stepped back a little, and raising his body to its utmost powers of erection, he stretched his right arm on high and dropped his forefinger downward as if pointing from the heavens. Then, striking his other hand on his naked breast, he said with energy, The eye of the great spirit can see from the clouds. The bosom of Mohican is bare. It is well, John, and I hope you will receive profit and consolation from the performance of this duty. The great spirit overlooks none of his children, and the man of the woods is as much an object of his care as he who dwells in a palace. I wish you a good night, and pray God bless you. The Indian bent his head, and they separated, the one to seek his hut, and the other to join his party at the supper-table. While Benjamin was opening the door for the passage of the chief, he cried, in a tone that was meant to be encouraging, The parson says the word that is true, John. If he be that that they took of the color of the skin in heaven, why they might refuse to matter of their books a Christian born like myself, just for the matter of a little tan, from cruising in warm latitudes. Though for the matter of that, this damn nor'wester is enough to whiten the skin of a blackamoor. Let the reef out of your blanket, man, or your red hide will hardly weather the night without a touch from the frost. End of chapter 7 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in January of 2009Chapter 8 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 Quote, for here the exile met from every clime, and spoke in friendship every distant tongue. Unquote. Campbell. We have made our readers acquainted with some variety in character and nations in introducing the most important personages of this legend to their notice. But, in order to establish the fidelity of our narrative, we shall briefly attempt to explain the reason why we have been obliged to present so motley a dramatis personae. Europe, at the period of our tale, was in the commencement of that commotion which afterward shook her political institutions to the center. Louis the Sixteenth had been beheaded, and a nation once esteemed the most refined among the civilized people of the world was changing its character, and substituting cruelty for mercy, and subtlety and ferocity for magnanimity and courage. Thousands of Frenchmen were compelled to seek protection in distant lands, among the crowds who fled from France and her islands to the United States of America, was the gentleman whom we have already mentioned as Monsieur Le Coy. He had been recommended to the favor of Judge Temple by the head of an eminent mercantile house in New York, with whom Marmaduke was in habits of intimacy, and accustomed to exchange good offices. At his first interview with the Frenchman, our judge had discovered him 
to be a man of breeding, and one who had seen much more prosperous days in his own country. From certain hints that had escaped him, Monsieur Le Coy was suspected of having been a West India planter, great numbers of whom had fled from St. Domingo and the other islands, and were now living in the Union, in a state of comparative poverty, and some in absolute want. The latter was not, however, the lot of Monsieur Le Coy. He had but little, he acknowledged, but that little was enough to furnish, in the language of the country, an assortment for a store. The knowledge of Marmaduke was eminently practical, and there was no part of a settler's life with which he was not familiar. Under his direction, Monsieur Le Coy made some purchases, consisting of a few cloths, some groceries, with a good deal of gunpowder and tobacco, a quantity of ironware, among which was a large portion of Barlow's jack-knives, potash kettles, and spiders, a very formidable collection of crockery of the coarsest quality and most uncouth forms, together with every other common article that the art of man has devised for his wants, not forgetting the luxuries of looking-glasses and jews harps. With this collection of valuables, Monsieur Le Coy had stepped behind a counter, with a wonderful pliability of temperament, and dropped into his assumed character as gracefully as he had ever moved in any other. The gentleness and suavity of his manners rendered him extremely popular. Besides this, women soon discover that he had taste. His calicoes were the finest, or in other words, the most showy, of any that were brought into the country and it was impossible to look at the prices asked for his goods by so pretty a spoken man. Through these conjoint means, the affairs of Monsieur Le Coy were again in a prosperous condition, and he was looked up to by the settlers as the second best man on the patent. Footnote. The term patent, which we have already used, and for which we may have further occasion, meant the district of country that had been originally granted to old Major Effingham by the King's Letters Patent, and which had now become by purchase under the Act of Confiscation, the property of Marmaduke Temple. It was a term in common use throughout the new parts of the state, and was usually annexed to the landlord's name as, quote, Temple's or Effingham's Patent, unquote. And, Footnote. Major Hartman was a descendant of a man who, in company with a number of his countrymen, had immigrated with their families from the banks of the Rhine to those of the Mohawk. This migration had occurred as far back as the reign of Queen Anne, and their descendants were now living in great peace and plenty on the fertile borders of that beautiful stream. The Germans, or High Dutchers as they were called, to distinguish them from the original or Low Dutch colonists, were a very peculiar people. They possessed all the gravity of the latter, without any of their phlegm, and like them, the High Dutchers, were industrious, honest, and economical. Fritz, or Frederick Hartman, was an epitome of all the vices and virtues, foibles and excellences of his race. He was passionate, though silent, obstinate, and a good deal suspicious of strangers, of immovable courage, inflexible honesty, and undeviating in his friendships. Indeed, there was no change about him unless it were from grave to gay. He was serious by months, and jolly by weeks. He had, early in their acquaintance, formed an attachment for Marmaduke Temple, who was the only man that could not speak High Dutch, that ever gained his entire confidence. Four times in each year, at periods equidistant, he left his low stone dwelling 
on the banks of the Mohawk, and traveled thirty miles through the hills, to the door of the mansion house in Templeton. Here he generally stayed a week, and was reputed to spend much of that time in riotous living, greatly countenanced by Mr. Richard Jones. But everyone loved him, even to remarkable Pettibone, to whom he occasioned some additional trouble. He was so frank, so sincere, and at times so mirthful. He was now on his regular Christmas visit, and had not been in the village an hour when Richard summoned him to fill a seat in the sleigh to meet the landlord and his daughter. Before explaining the character and situation of Mr. Grant, it will be necessary to recur to times far back in the brief history of the settlement. There seems to be a tendency in human nature to endeavor to provide for the wants of this world before our attention is turned to the business of the other. Religion has a quality but little cultivated amid the stumps of Temple's patent for the first few years of its settlement. But, as most of its inhabitants were from the moral states of Connecticut and Massachusetts, when the wants of nature were satisfied, they began seriously to turn their attention to the introduction of those customs and observances which had been the principal care of their forefathers. There was certainly a great variety of opinions on the subject of grace and free will among the tenantry of Marmaduke, and, when we take into consideration the variety of the religious instruction which they received, it can easily be seen that it could not well be otherwise. Soon after the village had been formally laid out into the streets and blocks that resembled a city, a meeting of its inhabitants had been convened, to take into consideration the propriety of establishing an academy. The measure originated with Richard, who in truth was much disposed to have the institution designated a university or at least a college. Meeting after meeting was held for this purpose, year after year. The resolutions of these symbiages appeared in the most conspicuous columns of a little blue-looking newspaper that was already issued weekly from the garret of a dwelling-house in the village, and which the traveler might as often see stuck into the fissure of a stake, erected at the point where the footpath from a log cabin of some settler entered the highway, as a post-office for an individual. Sometimes the stake supported a small box, and a whole neighborhood received a weekly supply of their literary wants at this point, where the man who rides post regularly deposited a bundle of the precious commodity. To these flourishing resolutions, which briefly recounted the general utility of education, the political and geographical rights of the village of Templeton to a participation in the favors of the regents of the university, the salubrity of the air, and the wholesomeness of the water, together with the cheapness of food and the superior state of morals in the neighborhood, were uniformly annexed in large Roman capitals. The names of Marmaduke Temple as chairman, and Richard Jones as secretary. Happily, for the success of this undertaking, the regents were not accustomed to resist these appeals to their generosity, whenever there was the smallest prospect of a donation to second the request. Eventually, Judge Temple concluded to bestow the necessary land, and to erect the required edifice at his own expense. The skill of Mr., or as he was now called, from the circumstance of having received the commission of a justice of the peace, Squire Doolittle, was again put in requisition, and the science of Mr. Jones was once more resorted to. We shall not recount the different devices of the architects on the occasion nor would it be decorous to do so, seeing that there was a convocation of the society of the ancient and honorable fraternity of the free and accepted Masons, at the head of whom was Richard, in the capacity of master, doubtless to approve or reject 
such of the plans as, in their wisdom, they deemed to he for the best. The naughty point was, however, soon decided, and on the appointed day the Brotherhood marched in great state, displaying sundry banners and mysterious symbols, each man with a little mimic apron before him, from a most cunningly contrived apartment in the garret of the bold dragoon, an inn kept by one Captain Hollister, to the site of the intended edifice. Here Richard laid the cornerstone with suitable gravity amidst an assemblage of more than half of the men and all the women within ten miles of Templeton. In the course of the succeeding week there was another meeting of the people, not omitting swarms of the gentler sex, when the abilities of Hiram at the square rule were put to the test of experiment. The frame fitted well, and the skeleton of the fabric was reared without a single accident, if we except a few falls from horses while the laborers were returning home in the evening. From this time the work advanced with great rapidity, and in the course of the season the labor was completed, the edifice manding in its heatity and proportions the boast of the village, the study of young aspirants of for architectural fame, and the admiration of every settler on the patent. It was a long, narrow house of wood, painted white, and more than half windows, and when the observer stood at the western side of the building, the edifice offered but a small obstacle to a full view of the rising sun. It was, in truth, a very comfortless, open place, through which the daylight shone with natural facility. On its front were diverse ornaments in wood designed by Richard and executed by Hiram, but a window in the center of the second story immediately over the door, or grand entrance, and the steeple were the pride of the building. The former was, we believe, of the composite order, for it included in its composition a multitude of ornaments and a great variety of proportions. It consisted of an arched compartment in the centers with a square and small division on either side, the whole encased in heavy frames, deeply and laboriously molded in pine wood, and lighted with a vast number of blurred and green-looking glass of those dimensions which are commonly called eight by ten. Blinds that were intended to be painted green kept the window in a state of preservation, and probably might have contributed to the effect of the whole had not the failure in the public funds, which seems always to be incidental to any undertaking of this kind, left them in the somber coat of lead color with which they had been originally clothed. The steeple was a little copula, reared on the very center of the roof, on four tall pillars of pine that were fluted with a gouge and loaded with moldings. On the tops of the columns was reared a dome, or copula, resembling in shape an inverted teacup without its bottom, from the center of which projected a spire or shaft of wood, transfixed with two iron rods that bore on their ends the letters N, S, E, and W, in the same metal. The whole was surmounted by an imitation of one of the finny tribe, carved in wood by the hands of Richard, and painted what he called a scale color. This animal, Mr. Jones affirmed, to be an admirable resemblance of a great favorite of the epicures of that country, which bore the title of Lakefish. And doubtless the assertion was true, for, although intended to answer the purposes of a weathercock, the fish was observed invariably to look with a longing eye in the direction of the beautiful sheet of water that lay embedded in the mountains of Templeton. For a short time after the charter of the regents was received, the trustees of this institution employed a graduate of one of the eastern colleges, 
to instruct such youth as aspired to knowledge within the walls of the edifice which we have described. The upper part of the building was in one apartment, and was intended for gala days and exhibitions, and the lower contained two rooms that were intended for the great divisions of education, viz., the Latin, and the English scholars. The former were never very numerous, though the sounds of nominative, penia, genitive, penny, were soon heard to issue from the windows of the room, to the great delight and manifest edification of the passenger. Only one laborer in this temple of Minerva, however, was known to get so far as to attempt the translation of Virgil. He indeed appeared at the annual exhibition to the prodigious exultation of all his relatives, a farmer's family in the vicinity, and repeated the whole of the first eclogue from memory, observing the intonations of the dialogue with much judgment and effect. The sounds as they proceeded from his mouth of Tiddy re to Patty Lee re Cuban subjitimifi fagi, Silvestrim tinunumusram meditaris avene, were the last that had been heard in that building, as probably they were the first that had ever been heard in the same language, there or anywhere else. By this time the trustees discovered that they had anticipated the age, and the instructor or principal was superseded by a master, who went on to teach the more humble lesson of the more haste, the worse speed, in good, plain English. From this time until the date of our incidents, the academy was a common country school, and the great room of the building was sometimes used as a courtroom at extraordinary trials, sometimes for conferences of the religious and morally disposed in the evening, at others for a ball in the afternoon, given under the auspices of Richard, and on Sundays, invariably, as a place of public worship. When an itinerant priest of the persuasion of the Methodist, Baptist, Universalist, or of the more numerous sect of the Presbyterians, was accidentally in the neighborhood, he was ordinarily invicted to officiate, and was commonly rewarded for his services by a collection in a hat, before the congregation separated. When no such regular minister offered, a kind of colloquial prayer or two was made by some of the more gifted members, and a sermon was usually read from Stern by Mr. Richard Jones. The consequence of this desultory kind of priesthood was, as we have already intimated, a great diversity of opinion on the more abstruse points of faith. Each sect had its adherents, though neither was regularly organized and disciplined. Of the religious education of Marmaduke we have already written, nor was the doubtful character of his faith completely removed by his marriage. The mother of Elizabeth was an Episcopalian, as indeed was the mother of the judge himself and the good taste of Marmaduke revolted at the familiar colloquies which the leaders of the conferences held with the deity in their nightly meetings. In form he was certainly an Episcopalian, though not a sectary of that denomination. On the other hand, Richard was as rigid in the observance of the canons of his church as he was inflexible in his opinions. Indeed, he had once or twice essayed to introduce the Episcopal form of service on the Sundays that the pupil was vacant, but Richard was a good deal addicted to carrying things to an excess, and then there was something so papal in his air that the greater part of his hearers deserted him on the second Sabbath. On the third, his only auditor was Ben Pump, who had all the obstinate, enlightened orthodoxy of a high churchman. Before the War of the Revolution, the English church was supported in the colonies by much interest by some of its inheritance in the mother country, and a few of the congregations were very amply endowed. 
but for the season after the independence of the states was established, this sect of Christians languished for the want of the highest order of its priesthood. Pious and suitable divines were at length selected and sent to the mother country to receive that authority, which, it is understood, can only be transmitted directly from one to the other, and thus obtain in order to reserve that unity in their churches, which properly belong to a people of the same nation. But unexpected difficulties presented themselves in the oaths with which the policy of England had fettered their establishment, and much time was spent before a conscientious sense of duty would permit the prelates of Britain to delegate the authority so earnestly sought. Time, patience, and zeal, however, removed every impediment, and the venerable man who had been set apart by the American churches, at length, returned to their expecting diocese, endowed with the most elevated functions of their earthly church. Priests and deacons were ordained, and missionaries provided, to keep alive the expiring flame of devotion in such members as were deprived of the ordinary administrations by dwelling in new and unorganized districts. Of this number was Mr. Grant. He had been sent into the county of which Templeton was the capital, and had been kindly invited by Marmaduke, and officiously pressed by Richard, to take up his abode in the village. A small and humble dwelling was prepared for his family, and the divine had made his appearance in the place but a few days previously to the time of his introduction to the reader. As his forms were entirely new to most of the inhabitants, and a clergyman of another denomination had previously occupied the field by engaging the academy, the first Sunday after his arrival was allowed to pass in silence. But now that his rival had passed on, like a meteor filling the air with the light of his wisdom, Richard was empowered to give notice that public worship, after the forms of the Protestant Episcopal Church, would be held on the night before Christmas, in the long room of the Academy in Templeton, by the Reverend Mr. Grant. This Annunciation excited great commotion among the different sectaries. Some wondered as to the nature of the exhibition. Others sneered. But a far greater part, recollecting the essays of Richard in that way, and mindful of the liberality or rather laxity of Marmaduke's notions on the subject of sectarianism, thought it most prudent to be silent. The expected evening was, however, the wonder of the hour nor was the curiosity at all diminished when Richard and Benjamin, on the morning of the eventful day, were seen to issue from the woods in the neighborhood of the village, each bearing on his shoulders a large bunch of evergreens. This worthy pair was observed to enter the academy, and carefully to fasten the door after which their proceedings remained a profound secret to the rest of the village. Mr. Jones, before he commenced his mysterious business, having informed the schoolmaster, to the great delight of the white-headed flock he governed, that there would be no school that day. Marmaduke apprised of all these preparations by letter, and it was especially arranged that he and Elizabeth which should arrive in season to participate in the solemnities of the evening. After this digression, we shall return to our narrative. End of chapter 8 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania In January of 2009Chapter 9 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9 Quote, now all admire in each high-flavored dish the capabilities of flesh, fowl, fish. In order due, each guest assumes his station, throbs high his breast with fond anticipation, and prelibates the joys of mastication. Unquote. Helio Gabaliad. The apartment to which Monsieur Lacoy handed Elizabeth communicated with the hall through the door that led under the urn which was supposed to contain the ashes of Dido. The room was spacious and of very just proportions, but in its ornaments and furniture the same delivery of taste and imperfection of execution were to be observed as existed in the hall. Of furniture there were a dozen green wooden armchairs, with cushions of marine, taken from the same piece as the petticoat of Remarkable. The tables were spread, and their materials and workmanship could not be seen. But they were heavy and of great size. An enormous mirror in a gilt frame hung against the wall, and a cheerful fire of the hard or sugar maple was burning on the hearth. The latter was the first object that struck the attention of the judge, who, on beholding it, exclaimed rather angrily to Richard, How often I have forbidden the use of sugar maple in my dwelling! The sight of that sap as it exudes with the heat is painful to me, Richard. Really, it behooves the owner of wood so extensive as mine to be cautious what example he sets his people who are already felling the forest as if no end could be found to their treasures, nor any limits to their extent. If we go on in this way, twenty years hence we shall want fuel. Fuel in these hills, cousin Duke? exclaimed Richard in derision. Fuel? Why, you might as well predict that the fish will die for the want of water in the lake, because I intend, when the frost gets out of the ground, to lead one or two of the spring through logs into the village. But you are always a little wild on such subject, Marmaduke. It's a wilderness, returned Judge earnestly, to condemn a practice which devotes these jewels of the forest, these precious gifts of nature, these mines of corn, I fort and wealth, to the common uses of a fireplace, but I must and will, the instant the snow is off the earth, send out a party into the mountains to explore for coal. Coal, echoed Richard. Who the devil do you think would dig for coal? When hunting for a bushel, he would have to rip up more of trees than would keep him in fuel for a twelve-month. Puh, ha, huh. Marmaduke, you should leave the management of these things to me, who have a natural turn that way. It was I that ordered this fire, and a noble one it is, to warm the blood of my pretty cousin Bess. The motive, then, must be your apology, Dick Vaughan, said the judge. But, gentlemen, we are waiting. Elizabeth, my child, take the head of the table. Richard, I see, means to spare me the trouble of carving by sitting opposite to you. To be sure I do, cried Richard. Here is a turkey to carve, and I flatter myself that I understand carving a turkey, or for that matter, a goose as well as any man alive. Mr. Grant! Where is Mr. Grant? Will you please say grace, sir? Everything in getting cold. Take a thing from the fire this cold weather, and it will freeze in five minutes. Mr. Grant, we want you to say grace. For what? We are about to receive. The Lord make us thankful. Come, sit down, sit down. Do you eat wing or breast, Cousin Bess? But Elizabeth had not taken her seat, nor was she in readiness to receive either the wing or breast. Her laughing eyes were glancing at the arrangements of the table and the quality and selection of the food. The eyes of the father soon met the wondering looks of his daughter, and he said with a smile, You perceive, my child, 
how much we are indebted to Remarkable for her skill in housewifery. She has indeed provided a noble repast, such as well might stop the cravings of hunger. La, said Remarkable, I am glad if the judge is pleased, but I'm notional that you'll find the sauce overdone. I thought as Elizabeth was coming home that a body could do no less than make things agreeable. My daughter has now grown to woman's estate, and is from this moment mistress of my house, said the judge. It is proper that all who live with me address her as Miss Temple. Do tell, exclaimed Remarkable, a little aghast. Well, who ever heard of a young woman's being called Miss? If the judge had a wife now, I should not think of calling her anything but Miss Temple, but... Having nothing but a daughter, you will observe that style to her, if you please, in the future, interrupted Marmaduke. As the judge looked seriously displeased, and, at such moments, carried a particularly commanding air with him, the wary housekeeper made no reply, and Mr. Grant, entering the room, the whole party were seated at the table, as the arrangements of this repast were much in the prevailing taste of that period and country. We shall endeavor to give a short description of the appearance of the banquet. The table linen was of the most beautiful damask, and the plates and dishes of real china, an article of great luxury in this early period of American commerce. The knives and forks were of exquisitely polished steel, and were set in unclouded ivory. So much, being furnished by the wealth of Marmaduke, was not only comfortable, but even elegant. The contents of the several dishes and their positions, however, were the result of the sole judgment of Remarkable. Before Elizabeth was placed an enormous roasted turkey, and before Richard one boiled, in the center of the table stood a pair of heavy silver casters, surrounded by four dishes, one a fricassee that consisted of gray squirrels, another a fish fried, a third a fish boiled, the last was a venison steak. Between these dishes and the turkey stood, on the one side, a prodigious chine of roasted bear's meat, and on the other, a boiled leg of delicious mutton. Interspersed among this load of meats was every species of vegetable that the season and country afforded. The four corners were garnished with plates of cake. On one was piled certain curiously twisted and complicated figures called nut cakes. On another were heaps of a black-looking substance, which, receiving its hue from molasses, was properly termed sweet cake, a wonderful favorite in the coterie of Remarkable. A third was filled, to use the language of the housekeeper, with cards of gingerbread, and the last held a plum cake, so called for the number of large raisins that were showing their black heads in a substance of suspiciously similar color. At each corner of the table stood saucers, filled with a thick fluid of somewhat equivocal color and consistence, variegated with small dark lumps of a substance that resembled nothing but itself, which Remarkable termed her sweetmeats. At the side of each plate, which was placed bottom upward, with its knife and fork, most accurately crossed over it, stood another of smaller size, containing a motley-looking pie, composed of triangular slices of apple, mince, pumpkin, cranberry, and custard, so arranged as to form an entire whole. Decanters of brandy, rum, gin, and wine, with sundry pitchers of cider, beer, and one hissing vessel of flip, were put wherever an opening would admit their introduction. Notwithstanding the size of the table, there was scarcely a spot where the rich damask could be seen. So crowded were the dishes with their associated bottles, plates, and saucers, 
The object seemed to be profusion, and it was obtained entirely at the expense of order and elegance. All the guests, as well as the judge himself, seemed perfectly familiar with this description of fare, for each one commenced eating with an appetite that promised to do great honor to remarkable taste and skill. What rendered this attention to the repast a little surprising was the fact that both the German and Richard had been summoned from another table to meet the judge. But Major Hartman both ate and drank without any rule when on his excursions, and Mr. Jones invariably made it a point to participate in the business in hand, let it be what it would. The host seemed to think some apology necessary for the warmth he had betrayed on the subject of the firewood, and when the party were comfortably seated and engaged with their knives, he observed, The wastefulness of the settlers with the noble trees of this country is shocking, Monsieur Le Coy, as doubtless you have noticed. I have seen a man fell a pine when he has been in want of fencing stuff, and roll his first cuts into the gap, where he left it rot, though its top would have made rails enough to answer his purpose, and its butt would have been sold at Philadelphia market for twenty dollars. And how the devil, I beg your pardon, Mr. Grant, interrupted Richard, but how is the poor devil to get his logs to the Philadelphia market, pray? Put them in his pocket? Ha! As you would have a handful of chestnuts or a bunch of chickerberries? I should like to see you walking up High Street with a pine log in each pocket. Ha! Ha! Cousin Duke, there are trees enough for us all and some to spare. Why, I can hardly tell which way the wind blows when I'm out in the clearings. They are so thick and so tall. I couldn't hit all if it wasn't for the clouds, and I happen to know all the points of the compass, as it were by heart. Aye, aye, squire, cried Benjamin, who had now entered and taken his place behind the judge's chair. A little aside with all, in order to be ready for any observation like the present. Look aloft, sir, look aloft. The old seamen say that the devil wouldn't make a sailor unless he looked aloft. As for the compass, why, there is no such thing as steering without one. I'm sure I never lose sight of the main top, as I call the squire's lookout on the roof. But I set my compass, do you see, and take the bearings and distance of things in order to work out my course. If so be that it should cloud up, or the tops of the trees should shut down out of the light of heaven. The steeple of St. Paul's, now that we knave got it on end, is a great help to the navigation of the woods, for by the Lord Harry, as was... It is well, Benjamin, interrupted Marmaduke, observing that his daughter manifested displeasure at the major domo's familiarity. But you forget there is a lady in company, and the women love to do most of the talking themselves. The judge says his true word cried Benjamin, with one of his discordant laughs. Now here is Mistress Remarkable Patty Bones. Just take the stopper off her tongue, and you'll hear a gabbling worse like then if you should happen to fall to leeward in crossing a French privateer or some such thing, mayhap as a dozen monkeys stowed in one bag. It were impossible to say how perfect an illustration of the truth of Benjamin's assertion the housekeeper would have furnished if she had dared. But the judge looked sternly at her, and, unwilling to incur his resentment, yet unable to contain her anger, she threw herself out of the room with a toss of the body that nearly separated her frail form in the center. Richard, said Marmaduke, observing that his displeasure had produced the desired effect, can you inform me of anything concerning the youth who I so unfortunately wounded? I found him on the mountain, hunting in company with the leather stocking, as if they were of the same family. But there's a manifest difference in their manners. The youth delivers himself in chosen language, such as seldom heard in these hills, and such as occasions great surprise to me. How's one so meanly clad, and following so lowly a pursuit could attain. Mohegan also knew him. Doubtless he is a tenant of Nanny's hut. 
Did you remark the language of the lad, Monsieur Le Coy? Certainment, Monsieur Tempo, returned the Frenchman. He did converse in the excellent Anglais. The boy's no miracle, exclaimed Richard. I've known children that were sent to school early talk much better before they were twelve years old. There was Zared Coe, old Nehemiah's son, who first settled in the Beaver Dam Meadow. He could write almost as good a hand as myself, and he was fourteen, though it's true I helped to teach him a little in the evenings. But this shooting gentleman ought to be put in the stocks if he ever takes a rein in his hand again. He is the most awkward fellow about a horse I ever met with. I dare say he never drove anything but oxen in his life. There, I think, Dickon, you do the lad injustice, said the judge. He uses much discretion in critical moments. Dost thou not think so, Bess? There was nothing in this question particularly to excite blushes, but Elizabeth started from the reverie into which she had fallen, and colored to her forehead, as she answered, To me, dear sir, he appeared extremely skillful, and prompt, and courageous. But perhaps Cousin Richard will say I am as ignorant as the gentleman himself. Gentlemen, echoed Richard, do you call such chaps gentlemen at school, Elizabeth? Every man is a gentleman that knows how to treat a woman with respect and consideration, returned the young lady promptly, and a little smartly. So much for hesitating to appear before the heiress in his shirt-sleeves, cried Richard, winking at Monsieur Le Coy, who returned the wink with one eye while he rolled the other with an expression of sympathy toward the young lady. Well, well, to me he seemed anything but a gentleman. I must say, however, for the lad, that he draws a good trigger, and has a true aim. He's good at shooting at a buck, ha, huh, Marmaduke? Richard, said Major Hartman, turning his great countenance toward the gentleman he addressed with much earnestness. Ter boy is good. He saveth your life, and my life, and ter life of Egomini Grant, and ter life of ter Frenchman and Richard. He shall never want a pet to sleep in, but old Fritz Hartmann has a shingle to cover his pet meat. Well, well, as you please, old gentleman, returned Mr. Jones, endeavoring to look indifferent. Put him into your own stone house, if you will, Major. I dare say the lad never slept in anything better than a bark shanty in his life, unless it was some such hut as the cabin of leather stocking. I prophesy you will soon spoil him. Any one could see how proud he grew in a short time, just because he stood by my horse's heads, while I turned them into the highway. No, no, my old friend, cried Marmaduke. It shall be my task to provide in some manner for the youth. I owe him a debt of my own, besides the service he has done me through my friends. And yet I anticipate some little trouble in inducing him to accept my services. He showed a marked dislike, I thought, Bess, to my offer of a residence within these walls for life. Really, dear sir, said Elizabeth, projecting her beautiful underlip, I have not studied the gentleman so closely as to read his feelings in his countenance. I thought he might very naturally feel pain from his wound, and therefore pitied him. But, as she spoke, she glanced her eye, with suppressed curiosity, toward the major-domo. I dare say that Benjamin can tell you something about him. He cannot have been the, in the village, and that Benjamin not have seen him often. I, I seen the boy before, said Benjamin, who wanted little encouragement to speak. He has been backing and feeling in the wake of Nanty Bumpo, through the mountains after deer, like a Dutch longboat in tow of an Albany sloop. He carries a good rifle, too, the leather stocking said in my hearing, before Betty Hollister's barroom fire. 
though later than the Tuesday night that the younger was certain death to the wild beast. If be he can kill the wildcat that has been heard moaning in the lakeside since the hard frost and deep snows have driven the deer to herd, he will be doing the thing that is good. Your wildcat is a bad shipmate and should be made to cruise out of the track of Christian men. Lives he in the hut of Bumpo? asked Marmaduke with some interest. Cheek by chow, the Wednesday will be three weeks since he first hove in sight in company with Leatherstocking. They had captured a wolf between them and brought in his scalp for the bounty. That Mr. Bumpo has a handy turn with him in taking off a scalp, and there's them in this village who say he ironed the trade by working on Christian men. If so be that there is truth in the saying, and I am commanded along shore here as your honor does, why, do you see, I bring him into the gangway for it yet. There's a very pretty post rigged outside of the stalks, and for the matter of a cat I can fit one in my own hands. Ay, and use it too, for the one of a better. You are not to credit the idle tales you hear of Natty. He has a kind of natural right to gain a livelihood in these mountains, and if the idlers of the village take it into their heads to annoy him, as they sometimes do, reputed rogues, they shall find him protected by the strong arm of the law. Delightful is better than to law, said the Major sententiously. That for his rifle, exclaimed Richard, snapping his fingers. Ben is right, and I... He was stopped by the sound of a common ship bell that had been elevated to the belfry of the academy, which now announced by its incessant ringing that the hour for the appointed service had arrived. For this and every other instance of this goodness, I beg pardon, Mr. Grant. Will you please, sir, to return thanks, sir? It is time we should be moving, as we are the only Episcopalians in the neighborhood, that is, I and Benjamin and Elizabeth, for I count half-breeds like Marmadukes as bad as heretics. The divine arose and performed the office meekly and fervently, and the whole party, instantly prepared themselves for the church, or rather, academy. End of chapter 9 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania In January of 2009
the very houses seemed changed. This had been altered by an addition. That had been painted. Another had been erected on the site of an old acquaintance, which had been banished from the earth almost as soon as it made its appearance on it. All were, however, pouring forth their inmates, who uniformly held their way toward the point where the expected exhibition of the conjoint taste of Richard and Benjamin was to be made. After viewing the buildings, which really appeared to some advantage under the bright but mellow light of the moon, our heroine turned her eyes to a scrutiny of the different figures they passed, in search of any form that she knew, but all seemed alike, as muffled in cloaks, hoods, coats, or tippets, they glided along the narrow passes in the snow, which led under the houses, half hid by the bank that had been thrown up by excavating the deep path in which they trod. Once or twice she thought there was a statuary gate that she recollected, but the person who owned it instantly disappeared behind one of those enormous piles of wood that lay before most of the doors. It was only as they turned from the main street into another that intersected it at right angles, and which led directly to the place of meeting, that she recognized a face and a building that she knew. The house stood at one with the principal corners in the village, and by its well-trailed doorway, as well as the sign that was swinging with a kind of doleful sound in the blast that occasionally swept down the lake, was clearly one of the most frequented inns in the place. The building was only of one story, but the dormer windows in the roof, the paint, the window shutters, and the cheerful fire that shone through the open door gave it an air of comfort that was not possessed by many of its neighbors. The sign was suspended from a common alehouse post, and represented the figure of a horseman armed with saber and pistols, and surmounted by a bearskin cap with a fiery animal that he bestrode rampant. All these particulars were easily to be seen by the aid of the moon, together with a row of somewhat ineligible writing in black paint, but in which Elizabeth, to whom the whole was familiar, read with facility. The Bold Dragoon A man and a woman were issuing from the door of this habitation as the sleigh was passing. The former moved with a stiff military step that was a good deal heightened by a limp in one leg, but the woman advanced with a measure and an air that seemed not particularly regardful of what she might encounter. The light of the moon fell directly upon her full, broad, and red visage, exhibiting her masculine countenance under the mockery of a ruffled cap that was intended to soften the lineaments of features that were by no means squeamish. A small bonnet of black silk and of a slightly formal cut was placed on the back of her head, but so as not to shade her visage in the least. The face, as it encountered the rays of the moon from the east, seemed not unlike sun rising in the west. She advanced with masculine strides to intercept the sleigh, and the judge, directing the namesake of the Grecian king who held the lines to check his horse, the parties were soon near to each other. "'Good luck to ye, and welcome home, Toge cried the female with a strong Irish accent. And I'm sure it's not to me that you're always welcome. Sure, and there's Miss Lucy, and a fine young woman she is grown. What a heartache would she be giving the young men now if there was such a thing as a regiment in the town. Och, but it's idle to talk in such vanities, since the bell is calling us to meeting, just as we shall be called away unexpectedly some day when we are the less calculating. Good evening, Major. Will I make the ball of gin toddy the night, or is likely ye shall stay in the big house the Christmas Eve, and the very night you're getting here? I am glad to see you, Miss Hollister, returned Elizabeth. I have been trying to find a face that I knew since I left the door of the mansion house. But none have I seen except your own. Your house 
too, is unaltered, while all the others are so changed that, but for the places where they stand, they would be utter strangers. I observe you also. Keep the dear sign that I saw Cousin Richard paint, and even the name at the bottom, which you may remember you had the disagreement. It is the Berdragunyi man, and that name he would have, who never was known by any other, as my husband here, the captain, can testify. He was a pleasure to wait upon, and he was ever the foremost in need. Oh, but he had a sudden end, and it's to be hoped that he was justified by the cause. And it's not Parson Grant there who gainsay that name. Yes, yes, the scar would paint, and so I thought that we might have his face up there, and who had so often shared good and evil with us. The eyes is not so large nor so fiery as the captain's own, but the whiskers and the cap is as to pass. Well, well, I'll not keep you in the crowd talking, but we'll droop in tomorrow after service and ask ye how ye do. It's our bounden duty to make the most of this present and to go to the house which is open to all. So God bless ye and keep ye from evil. Will I make the geet din twitch the night or no, Major? To this question the German replied very sententiously in the affirmative and after a few words had passed between the husband of the fiery-faced hostess and the judge, the sleigh moved on. It soon reached the door of the academy where the party alighted and entered the building. In the meantime, Mr. Joan and his two companions, having a much shorter distance to journey, had arrived before the appointed place some minutes sooner than the party in the sleigh. Instead of hastening into the room in order to enjoy the astonishment of the settlers, Richard placed a hand in either pocket of his surcoat and affected to walk about in front of the academy like one to whom the ceremonies were familiar. The villagers proceeded uniformly into the building with a decorum and gravity that nothing could move on such occasions, but with a haste that was probably a little heightened by curiosity. Those who came in from the adjacent country spent some little time in placing certain blue and white blankets over their horses before they proceeded to indulge their desire to view the interior of the house. Most of these men Richard approached and inquired after the health and condition of their families. The readiness with which he mentioned the names of even the children showed how very familiarly acquainted he was with their circumstances, and the nature of the answers he received proved that he was a general favorite. At length, one of the pedestrians from the village stopped also and fixed an earnest gaze at a new brick edifice that was throwing a long shadow across the fields of snow as it rose with a beautiful gradation of light and shade under the rays of a full moon. In front of the academy was a vacant piece of ground that was intended for a public square. On the side opposite to Mr. Jones, the new and as yet unfinished church of St. Paul's was erected. This edifice had been reared during the preceding summer by the aid of what was called a subscription, though all or nearly all of the money came from the pockets of the landlord. It had been built under a strong conviction of the necessity of a more seemly place of worship than the long room of the academy and under an implied agreement that, after its completion, the question should be fairly put to the people that they might decide what denomination it should belong. Of course, this expectation kept alive a strong excitement in some few of the sectaries who were interested in its decision, though but little was said openly on the subject. Had Judge Temple espoused the cause of any particular sect, the question would have been immediately put at rest, for his influence was too powerful to be opposed. But he declined interference in the matter, positively refusing to lend even the weight of his name on the side of Richard, who had secretly given an assurance to his diocesan that both the building and the congregation would cheerfully come within the pale of the Protestant Episcopal Church. But, 
When the neutrality of the judge was clearly ascertained, Mr. Jones discovered that he had to contend with a stiff-necked people. His first measure was to go among them and commence a course of reasoning, in order to bring them round to his own way of thinking. They all heard him patiently, and not a man uttered a word in reply in the way of argument, and Richard thought, by the time he had gone through the settlement, the point was conclusively decided in his favor. Willing to strike while the iron was hot, he called a meeting through the newspaper with a view to decide the question by a vote at once. Not a soul attended, and one of the most anxious afternoons that he had ever known was spent by Richard in a vain discussion with Mrs. Hollister, who strongly contended that the Methodist, her own church, was the best entitled to and most deserving of the possession of the new tabernacle. Richard now perceived that he had been too sanguine, and had followed into the error of all those who ignorantly deal with that wary and sagacious people. He assumed a disguise himself, that is, as well as he knew how, and proceeded step by step to advance his purpose. The task of erecting the building had been unanimously transferred to Mr. Jones and Hiram Doolittle. Together they had built the mansion house, the academy, and the jail, and they alone knew how to plan and rear such a structure as was now required. Early in the days, these architects had made an equitable division of their duties. To the former was assigned the duty of making all the plans, and to the latter the labor of superintending the execution. Availing himself of this advantage, Richard silently determined that the windows should have the Roman arch, the first positive step in effecting his wishes. As the building was made of bricks, he was enabled to conceal his design until the moment arrived for placing the frames. Then, indeed, it became necessary to act. He communicated his wishes to Hiram with great caution, and without the least adverting to the spiritual part of his project, he pressed the point a little warmly on the score of architectural beauty. Hiram heard him patiently and without contradiction, but still, Richard was unable to discover the views of his coadjutor on this interesting subject. As the right to plan was duly delegated to Mr. Jones, no direct objection was made in words, but numberless unexpected difficulties arose in the execution. At first, there was a scarcity of the right kind of material necessary to form the frames, but this objection was instantly silenced by Richard, running his pencil through two feet their length at one stroke. Then the expense was mentioned, but Richard reminded Hiram that his cousin paid, and that he was treasurer. The last intimation had great weight, and after a silent and protracted but fruitless opposition, the work was suffered to proceed on the original plan. The next difficulty occurred in the steeple, which Richard had modeled after one of the smaller of those spires that adorn the great London cathedral. The imitation was somewhat lame, it is true, the proportions being but indifferently observed. But after much difficulty, Mr. Jones had the satisfaction of seeing an object reared that bore in its outlines a striking resemblance to a vinegar cruet. There was less opposition to this model than to the windows, for the settlers were fond of novelty, and their steeple was without a precedent. Here the labor ceased for the season, and the difficult question of the interior remained for further deliberation. Richard well knew that when he came to propose a reading desk and a chapel, he must unmask, for these are arrangements known to no church in the country but his own. Presuming, however, on the advantages he had already obtained, he boldly styled the building St. Paul's, and Hiram prudently acquiesced in this appellation, making, however, the slight addition to calling it New St. Paul's, feeling less aversion to a name taken from the English cathedral than from the saint. The pedestrian 
whom we have already mentioned as pausing to contemplate this edifice, was no other than the gentleman so frequently named as Mr. or Squire Doolittle. He was of a tall, gaunt formation, with rather sharp features, and a face that expressed formal propriety mingled with low cunning. Richard approached him, followed by Monsieur Lecoy and the Major Domo. "'Good evening, Squire,' said Richard, bobbing his head, but without moving his hands from his pockets. "'Good evening, Squire,' echoed Hiram, turning his body in order to turn his head also. "'A cold night, Mr. Doolittle, a cold night, sir. Coolish, a tedious spell, aunt. What, looking at our church? Ha! It looks well by moonlight. How the tin of the copula disc glistens. I warn you the dome of the other St. Paul's never shines so in the smoke of London. It's a pretty meeting-house to look on, returned Hiram, and I believe that Monsieur Le Croix and Mr. Penguillam will allow it. Certainly, exclaimed the complacent Frenchman. It is very fine. I thought the monsieur would say so. The last molasses that we had was excellent good. It isn't likely that you have any more of it on hand. Oh, he, sir, returned Monsieur Lecoy with a slight shrug of his shoulder and trifling grimace. There is more. I feel very habit that you love it. I hope the meat dosid is in good health. Why, so as it be stirring, said Hiram. The squire hasn't finished the plans for the inside of this meeting-house yet? No, 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 returned Richard, speaking quickly, but making a significant pause between each negative. It requires reflection. There is a great deal of room to fill up, and I am afraid we shall not know how to dispose of it to advantage. There will be a large vacant spot around the pulpit, which I do not mean to place against the wall, like a sentry box stuck up on the side of a fort. It's rollable to put the deacon's box under the pulpit, said Hiram, and then, as if he had ventured too much, he added, but there's different fashions in different countries. That there is, cried Benjamin. Now in running down the coast of Spain and Portugal, you may see a nunnery stuck out on every headland with more steeples and outriggers, but as dog vanes and weathercocks, then you'll find aboard a three-masted schooners, if so be that a well-bit church is wanting. Old England, after all, is the country to go to after your models and fashion pieces. As to Paul's, though I've never seen it, being that it's a long way uptown from Radcliffe Highway and the docks, yet everybody knows that it's the grandest place in the world. Now, I have no opinion, but this here church over there is like one end of its a grampus is to a whaler, and that's a small difference in bulk. Monsieur Lourcois here has been in foreign parts, and though is not the same as having been at home, he must have seen churches in France too, and can form a small idea of what a church should be. Now I ask the monsieur, to his face, if it is not a clever little thing, taking it by and large. It is very a propos of circumstance, said the Frenchman, for judgment, but it is the Catholic country that they build up, what you call a, 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 grand cathedral, the big church. St. Paul, London is very fine, very belle, very grand, what you Call big, but Monsieur Ben Noir ma is no what more much as Notre Dame. Ha, ah, Monsieur, what is that you say? cried Benjamin. Saint Paul's Church is not worth so much as a dam. Mayhap you may be thinking too that the Royal Billy isn't a good ship as the Billy de Paris, but she would have licked two of her any day, and in all weathers. As Benjamin had assumed a very threatening kind of attitude, flourishing an arm with a bunch at the end that was half as big as Monsieur Lecoy's head, Richard thought it time to interpose his authority. 
Hush, Benjamin, hush, he said. You both misunderstand, Monsieur Le Coy, and forget yourself. But here comes Mr. Grant, and the service will commence. Let us go in. The Frenchman, who received Benjamin's reply with a well-bred good humor that would not admit any feeling but pity for the other's ignorance, bowed in acquiescence and followed his companion. Hiram and the major domo brought up the rear, the latter grumbling as he entered the building. If so be that the king of France had so much as a house to live in that would lay alongside of Paul's, one might put up with their jaw. It's more than flesh and blood can bear to hear a Frenchman run down an English church in this matter. Why, well, squire, dear little, I've been at the whipping of two men in one day, clean-built snug frigates with standing royals and them new-fashioned cannonades on their quarters such as, if they had only Englishmen aboard them, would have fought the devil. With this ominous word in his mouth, Benjamin entered the church. End of chapter 10 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009. Chapter 11 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11 Quote, and fools who came to scoff remain to pray. Unquote. Goldsmith. Notwithstanding the united labors of Richard and Benjamin, the long room was but an extremely inartificial temple. Benches, made in the coarsest manner, and entirely with a view to usefulness, were arranged in rows for the reception of the congregation while a rough unpainted box was placed against the wall in the center of the length of the apartment as an apology for a pulpit. Something like a reading desk was in front of this rostrum, and a small mahogany table from the mansion house, covered with a spotless damask cloth, stood a little on one side by the way of an altar. Branches of pines and hemlocks were stuck in each of the fissures that offered in the unseasoned and hastily completed woodwork of both the building and its furniture, while festoons and hieroglyphics met the eye in vast profusion along the brown sides of the scratch-coated walls. As the room was only lighted by some ten or fifteen miserable candles, and the windows were without shutters, it would have been but a dreary cheerless place for the solemnities of a Christmas Eve, had not the large fire that was crackling at each end of the apartment given an air of cheerfulness to the scene by throwing an occasional glare of light through the vistas of bushes and faces the two sexes were separated by an area in the centre of the room immediately before the pulpit amid a few benches lined this space that were occupied by the principal personages of the village and its vicinity. This distinction was rather a gratuitous concession made by the poor and less polished part of the population than a right claimed by the favorite few. One bench was occupied by the party of Judge Temple, including his daughter, and, with the exception of Dr. Todd, no one else appeared willing to incur the imputation of pride by taking a seat in what was literally the high place of the tabernacle. Richard filled the chair that was placed behind another table in the capacity of clerk, while Benjamin, after heaping sundry logs on the fire, posted himself nigh by, in reserve for any movement that might require cooperation. It would greatly exceed our limits to attempt a description of the congregation 
for the dresses were as various as the individuals, some one article of more than usual finery, and perhaps the relic of other days, was to be seen about most of the females, in connection with the coarse attire of the woods. This wore a faded silk that had gone through at least three generations, over coarse wool and black stockings, that a shawl, whose dyes were as numerous as those of the rainbow, over an awkwardly fitting gown of rough brown woman's wear. In short, each one exhibited some favorite article, and all appeared in their best, both men and women, while the groundworks in dress in either sex were the coarse fabrics manufactured within their own dwellings. One man appeared in the dress of a volunteer company of artillery, of which he had been a member in the down countries, precisely for no other reason than because it was the best suit he had. Several, particularly of the younger men, displayed pantaloons of blue, edged with red cloth down the seams, part of the equipments of the Templeton Light Infantry, from a little vanity to be seen in boughten clothes. There was also one man in a rifle frock, with its fringes and folds of spotless white, striking a chill to the heart with the idea of its coolness, although the thick coat of brown homemade that was concealed beneath preserved a proper degree of warmth. There was a marked uniformity of expression in countenance, especially in that half of the congregation who did not enjoy the advantages of the polish of the village. A sallow skin that indicated nothing but exposure was common to all, as was an air of great decency and attention mingled generally with an expression of shrewdness and, in the present instance, of active curiosity. Now and then, a face and dress were to be seen among the congregation that differed entirely from this description. If pockmarked and floored with gartered legs and a coat that snugly fitted the person of the wearer, it was surely an English immigrant who had bent his steps to this retired quarter of the globe. If hard-featured and without color, with high cheekbones, it was a native of Scotland, in similar circumstances. The short, black-eyed man, with a cast of the swarthy Spaniard in his face, who rose repeatedly to make room for the bells of the village as they entered, was a son of Aaron, who had lately left off his pack and become a stationary trader in Templeton. In short, half the nations in the north of Europe had their representatives in this assembly, though all had closely assimilated themselves to the Americans in dress and appearance, except the Englishmen. He, indeed, not only adhered to his native customs in attire and living, but usually drove his plough among the stumps in the same manner as he had before done on the plains in Norfolk, until dear-bought experience taught him the useful lesson that a sagacious people knew what was suited to their circumstances better than a casual observer or a sojourner who was perhaps too much prejudiced to compare and peradventure too conceited to learn. Elizabeth soon discovered that she divided the attention of the congregation with Mr. Grant. Timidity, therefore, confined her observation of the appearances which we have described to stolen glances, but, as the stamping feet was now becoming less frequent, and even the coughing and other little preliminaries of a congregation settling themselves down into a reverential attention were ceasing, she felt emboldened to look around her. Gradually all noises diminished, until the suppressed cough denoted that it was necessary to avoid singularity, and the most profound stillness pervaded the apartment. The snapping of the fires as they threw a powerful heat into the room was alone heard, and each face and every eye were turned on the divine. At this moment a heavy stamping of feet was heard in the passage below as if a newcomer was releasing his limbs from the snow that was necessarily clinging to the legs of a pedestrian. It was succeeded by no audible tread, but, directly, Mohegan, followed by the leather stocking, and the young hunter, made his appearance. Their footsteps would not have been heard as they trod the apartment in their moccasins, 
but for the silence which prevailed. The Indian moved with great gravity across the floor, and observing a vacant seat next to the judge, he took it in a manner that manifested his sense of his own dignity. Here, drawing his blanket closely around him, so as to partly conceal his countenance, he remained during the service immovable, but deeply attentive. Natty passed the place that was so frequently taken by his companion, and seated himself on one end of a log that was lying near the fire, where he continued with his rifle standing between his legs, absorbed in reflection, seemingly of no very pleasing nature. The youth found a seat among the congregation, and another silence prevailed. Mr. Grant now arose and commenced his service with the sublime declaration of the human prophet, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. The example of Mr. Jones was unnecessary to teach the congregation to rise. The solemnity of the divine effected this as by magic. After a short pause, Mr. Grant proceeded with the solemn and winning exhortation of his service. Nothing was heard but the deep though affectionate tones of the reader, as he went slowly through this exordium, until, something unfortunately striking the mind of Richard as incomplete, he left his place and walked on tiptoe from the room. When the clergyman bent his knees in prayer and confession, the congregation so far imitated his example as to resume their seats, whence no succeeding effort of the divine during the evening was able to remove them in a body. Some rose at times, but by far the larger part continued, unbending, observant, it is true, but it was the kind of observation that regarded the ceremony as a spectacle rather than a worship in which they were to participate. Thus deserted by his clerk, Mr. Grant continued to read, but no response was audible. The short and solemn pause that succeeded each petition was made. Still, no voice repeated the eloquent language of the prayer. The lips of Elizabeth moved, but they moved in vain, and, accustomed as she was to the service of the churches of the metropolis, she was beginning to feel the awkwardness of the circumstance most painfully when a soft, low female voice repeated after the priest, We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. Startled at finding one of her own sex in that place who could rise superior to natural timidity, Miss Temple turned her eyes in the direction of the penitent. She observed a young female on her knees, but a short distance from her, with her meek face humbly bent over her book. The appearance of this stranger, for such she was entirely to Elizabeth, was light and fragile. Her dress was neat and becoming, and her countenance, though pale and slightly agitated, excited deep interest by its sweet and melancholy expression. A second and a third response was made by this juvenile assistant, when the manly sounds of a male voice proceeded from the opposite part of the room. Miss Temple knew the tones of the young hunter instantly, and struggling to overcome her own diffidence, she added her low voice to the number. All this time Benjamin stood thumbing the leaves of a prayer book with great industry, but some unexpected difficulties prevented his finding the place before the divine reached the close of the confession. However, Richard reappeared at the door, and, as he moved lightly across the room, he took up the response in a voice that betrayed no other concern than that of not being heard. In his hand he carried a small open box, with the figures, eight by ten, written in black paint on one of its sides, which having placed in the pulpit apparently as a footstool for the divine, he returned to his station in time to say sonorously, Amen. The eyes of the congregation very naturally were turned to the windows, as Mr. Jones entered with his singular load, and then, as if accustomed to his general agency, were again bent on the priest in close and curious attention. The long experience of Mr. Grant 
admirably qualified him to perform his present duty. He well understood the character of his listeners, who were mostly a primitive people in their habits, and who, being a good deal addicted to subtleties and nice distinctions in their religious opinions, viewed the introduction of any such temporal assistance as form into their spiritual worship not only with jealousy, but frequently with disgust. He had acquired much of his knowledge from studying the great book of human nature as it lay open in the world, and knowing how danger it was to contend with ignorance, uniformly endeavored to avoid dictating where his better reason taught him it was the most prudent to attempt to lead. His orthodoxy had no dependence on his cassock, he could pray with fervor and with faith, if circumstances required it, without the assistance of his clerk, and he had even been known to preach a most evangelical sermon in the winning manner of native eloquence, without the aid of a cambric handkerchief. In the present instance he yielded, in many places, to the prejudices of his congregation, and when he had ended there was not one of his new hearers who did not think the ceremonies less papal and offensive, and more conformant to his or her own notions of devout worship, than they had been led to expect from the, a service of forms. Richard found in the divine during the evening a most powerful co-operator in his religious schemes. In preaching, Mr. Grant endeavored to steer a middle course between the mystical doctrines of those sublimated creeds which daily involved their professors in the most absurd contradictions, and those fluent roles of moral government which would reduce the Savior to the level of the teacher of a school of ethics. Doctrine it was necessary to preach, for nothing less would have satisfied the disputatious people who were his listeners, and who would have interpreted silence on his part into a tacit acknowledgment of the superficial nature of his creed. We have already said that among the endless variety of religious instructors, the settlers were accustomed to hear every denomination urge its own distinctive precepts, and to have found one different to this interesting subject would have been destructive to his influence. But Mr. Grant so happily blended the universally received opinions of the Christian faith with the dogmas of his own church, that although none were entirely exempt from the influence of his reasons, very few took any alarm at the innovation. When we consider the great diversity of the human character, influenced as it is by education, by opportunity, and by the physical and moral conditions of the creature, my dear hearers, he earnestly concluded, it can excite no surprise that creeds so very different in their tendencies should grow out of a religion revealed, it is true, but whose revelations are obscured by the lapse of ages, and whose doctrines were, at the fashion of the countries in which they were first promulgated, frequently delivered in parables, and in a language abounding in metaphors, and loaded with figures. On points where the learned have in purity of heart been compelled to differ, the unlettered will necessarily be at variance. But happily for us, my brethren, the fountain of divine love flows from a source too pure to admit of pollution in its course. It extends to those who drink of its vivifying waters, the peace of the righteous, and life everlasting. It endures through all time and it pervades creation. If there be mystery in its workings, it is the mystery of a divinity. With a clear knowledge of the nature, the might, and the majesty of God, there might be conviction, but there could be no faith. If we are required to believe in doctrines that seem not in conformity with the deductions of human wisdom, let us never forget that such is the mandate of, of wisdom that is infinite. It is sufficient for us that enough is developed to point our path aright, and direct our wandering steps to that portal which shall open on the light of an eternal day. Then, indeed, it may be humbly hoped 
that the film which has been spread by the subtleties of earthly arguments will be dissipated by the spiritual light of heaven, and that our hour of probation by the aid of divine grace being once passed in triumph will be followed by an eternity of intelligence and endless ages of fruition. All that is now obscure shall become plain to our expanded faculties, and what our present senses may seem irreconcilable to our limited notions of mercy, of justice, and of love, shall stand irradiated by the light of truth. Confessedly, the suggestions of omniscience and the acts of an all-powerful benevolence. What a lesson of humility, my brethren, might not each of us obtain from a review of his infant hours and the recollection of his juvenile passions? How differently do the same acts of parental rigor appear in the eyes of the suffering child and of the chastened man? when the sophist would supplant with the wild theories of his worldly wisdom the positive mandates of inspiration, let him remember the expansion of his own feeble intellects, and pause. Let him feel the wisdom of God in what is partially concealed, as well as that which is revealed. In short, let him substitute humility for pride of reason. Let him have faith and live. The consideration of this subject is full of consolation, my hearers, and does not fail to bring with it lessons of humility and of profit that, duly improved, would both chasten the heart and strengthen the feeble-minded man in his course. It is a blessed consolation to be able to lay the misdoubtings of our arrogant nature at the threshold of the dwelling place of the deity, from whence they shall be swept away, at the great opening of the portal, like the mist of the morning before the rising sun. It teaches us a lesson of humility, by impressing us with the imperfection of human powers, and by warning us of the many weak points where we are open to the attack of the great enemy of our race. It proves to us that we are in danger of being weak, when our vanity would fain soothe us into the belief that we are most strong. It forcibly points out to us the vainglory of intellect, and shows us the vast difference between a saving faith and the corollaries of a philosophical theology. And it teaches us to reduce our self-examination to the test of good works. But good works must be understood the fruits of repentance, the chiefest of which is charity. Not the charity only which causes us to help the needy and comfort the suffering, but that feeling of universal philanthropy which by teaching us to love causes to judge with lenity all men, striking at the root of self-righteousness and warning us to be sparing of our condemnations of others while our own salvation is not yet secure. The lesson of expediency, my brethren, which I would gather from the consideration of this subject is most strongly inculcated by humility. On the heading and essential points of our faith, there is but little difference among those classes of Christians who acknowledge the attributes of the Savior and depend on his mediation. But heresies have polluted every church, and schisms are the fruit of disputation. In order to arrest these dangers and to ensure the union of his followers, it would seem that Christ had established his visible church and delegated the ministry. Wise and holy men, the fathers of our religion, have expended their labors in clearing what was revealed from the obscurities of language, and the results of their experience and researches have been embodied in the form of evangelical discipline. That this discipline must be statutory is evident from the view of the weakness of human nature that we have already taken and that it may be profitable to us and all who listen to its precepts and its liturgy 
may God, in his infinite wisdom, grant, and now too, etc. With this ingenious reference to his own forms and ministry, Mr. Grant concluded his discourse. The most profound attention had been paid to the sermon during the whole of its delivery, although the prayers had not been received with so perfect demonstration of respect. This was by no means an intended slight of that liturgy to which the divine alluded, but was the habit of the people who owed their very existence as a distinct nation to the doctrinal character of their ancestors. Sundry looks of private dissatisfaction were exchanged between Hiram and one or two of the leading members of the conference, but the feeling went no further at that time, and the congregation, after receiving the blessing of Mr. Grant, dispersed in silence and with great decorum. End of chapter 11 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009. Chapter 12 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12. Quote, Your creeds and dogmas of a learned church may build a fabric fair with moral beauty, but it would seem that the strong hand of God can only raise the devil from the heart. Unquote. Duo. While the congregation was separating, Mr. Grant approached the place where Elizabeth and her father were seated leading the youthful female, whom we have mentioned in the preceding chapter, and presented her as his daughter. Her reception was cordial and frank as the manners of the country, and the value of good society could render it, the two young women feeling instantly that they were necessary to the comfort of each other. The judge, to whom the clergyman's daughter was also a stranger, was pleased to find one who, from habits, sex, and years, could probably contribute largely to the pleasures of his own child during her first privations on her removal from the associations of a city to the solitude of Templeton. While Elizabeth, who had been forcibly struck with the sweetness and devotion of the youthful suppliant, removed the slight embarrassment of the timid stranger by the ease of her own manners. They were at once acquainted, and during the ten minutes that the academy was clearing, engagements were made between the young people, not only for the succeeding day, but they would probably have embraced in their arrangements half of the winter, had not the divine interrupted them by saying, Gently, gently, my dear Miss Temple, or you will make my girl too dissipated. You forgot she is my housekeeper, and that my domestic affairs must not remain unattended to. Should Louisa accept of half the kind offers you are so good to make of her? And why should they not be neglected entirely, sir? Interrupted Elizabeth. There are but two of you, and certain I am that my father's house will not only contain you both, but will open its doors spontaneously to receive such guests. Society is a good not to be rejected on account of cold forms in this wilderness, sir, and I have often heard my father say that hospitality is not a virtue in a new country, the favor being conferred by the guest. The manner in which Judge Temple exercises its rights would confirm this opinion, but we must not trespass too freely. 
Doubt not that you will see us often, my child, particularly during the frequent visits that I shall be compelled to make to the distant parts of the country. But to obtain an influence with such a people, he continued, glancing his eyes toward the few who were still lingering, curious observers of the interview, a clergyman must not awaken envy or distrust by dwelling under so splendid a roof as that of Judge Temple. "'You like the roof, then, Mr. Grant,' cried Richard, who had been directing the extinguishment of the fires and other little necessary duties, and who approached in time to hear the close of the divine speech. "'I am glad to find one man of taste at last. Here is Duke, though. Duke is a tolerable judge. He is a very poor carpenter, let me tell him. Well, sir, well, I think we may say, without boasting, that the service was as well performed this evening as you often see. I think quite as well as I ever knew it to be told in old Trinity, that is, if we accept the organ. But there is the schoolmaster leads the psalm with a very good air. I used to lead myself, but lately I have sung nothing but bass. There is a good deal of science to be shown in the bass, and it affords a fine opportunity to show off a full, deep voice. Benjamin, too, sings a good bass, though he is off out in the words. Did you ever hear Benjamin sing the Bay of Biscayo? I believe he gave us part of it this evening, said Marmaduke, laughing. There was now and then a fearful quaver in his voice, and it seems that Mr. Pengolon is like most others who do one thing particularly well. He knows nothing else. He has certainly a wonderful partiality to one tune, and he has a prodigious self-confidence in that one. For he delivers himself like a nor'wester sweeping across the lake. But come, gentlemen, our way is clear, and the sleigh waits. Good evening, Mr. Grant. Good night, young lady. Remember, you dine beneath the Corinthian roof tomorrow with Elizabeth. The party separated. Richard, holding a close dissertation with Mr. Lacoy, as they descended the stairs, on the subject of psalmody, which he closed by a violent eulogium on the air of the Bay of Biscayo, as particularly connected with his friend Benjamin's execution. During the preceding dialogue, Mohegan returned to his seat with his head shrouded in his blanket, as seemingly inattentive to surrounding objects as the departing congregation was itself to the presence of the aged chief. Natty also continued on the log where he had first placed himself, with his head resting on one of his hands, while the other held the rifle, which was thrown carelessly across his lap. His countenance expressed uneasiness, and the occasional unquiet glances that he had thrown around him during the service plainly indicated some unusual causes for unhappiness. His continued seating was, however, out of respect to the Indian chief, to whom he paid the utmost deference on all occasions, although it was mingled with the rough manner of a hunter. The young companion of these two ancient inhabitants of the forest remained also standing before the extinguished brands, probably from an unwillingness to depart without his comrades. The room was now deserted by all but this group, the divine and his daughter. As the party from the mansion house disappeared, John arose, and dropping the blanket from his head, he shook back the mass of black hair from his face, and, approaching Mr. Grant, he extended his hand and said solemnly, Father, I thank you. The words that have been said since the rising moon have gone forward, and the great spirit is glad. What you have told your children, they will remember and be good. He paused a moment, and then elevating himself with the grandeur of an Indian chief, he added, If Chingachgook lives to travel toward the setting sun after his tribe, and the great spirit carries him over the lakes and mountains with the breath of his body, 
he will tell his people the good talk he has heard, and they will believe him. For who can say that Mohican has ever lied? Let him place his dependence on the goodness of divine mercy, said Mr. Grant, to whom the proud consciousness of the Indian sounded a little heterodox. And it will never desert him. When the heart is filled with love to God, there is no room for sin. But, young man, to you I owe not only an obligation, in common with those you saved this evening on the mountain, but my thanks for your respectable and pious manner in insisting in the service at a most embarrassing moment. I should be happy to see you sometimes at my dwelling, when perhaps my conservation may strengthen you in the path which you appear to have chosen. It is so unusual to find one of your age and appearance in these woods at all acquainted with our holy liturgy, that it lessens at once the distance between us, and I feel that we are no longer strangers. You seem quite at home in the service. I did not perceive that you had even a book, although good Mr. Jones had laid several in different parts of the room. It would be strange if I were ignorant of the service of our church, sir, returned the youth modestly, for I was baptized in its communion, and I have never yet attended public worship elsewhere. For me to use the forms of any other denomination would be as singular as our own have proved to the people here this evening. You give me great pleasure, my dear sir, cried the divine, seizing the other by the hand and shaking it cordially. You will go home with me now, indeed you must. My child has yet to thank you for saving my life. I will listen to no apologies. This worthy Indian and your friend there will accompany us. Bless me to think that. He has arrived at manhood in this country without entering a dissenting meeting-house. Footnote The divines of the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States commonly call other denominations dissenters, though there never was an established church in their own country. No, no, interrupted Leatherstocking. I must away to the wigwam. There's work there that mustn't be forgotten for all your churchings and merrymakings. Let the lad go with you and welcome. He is used to keeping company with ministers and talking of such matters. So is old John, who was Christianized by the Moravians about the time of the old war. But I am a plain, unlearned man that has served both the king and his country in this day again, the French and savages but never so much as looked into a book or learnt a letter of scholarship in my born days. I've never seen the use of much indoor work, though I have lived to be partly bald, and in my time have killed two hundred beaver in a season, and that without counting the other game. If you mistrust what I am telling you, you can ask Chinchgotchcook there, for I did it in the heart of the Delaware country and the old man is knowing to the truth of every word I say. I doubt not, my friend, that you have been both a valiant soldier and skillful hunter in your day, said the divine, but more is wanting to prepare you for that end which approaches. You may have heard the maxim that young men may die, but old men must. I am sure I never was so great a fool as to expect to live forever, said Natty, giving one of his silent laughs. No man need do that who trails the savages through the woods as I have done and lives for the hot months on the lake streams. I've a strong constitution. I must say that for myself, as it is plain to be seen, for I've drunk the Onondaga water a hundred times while I've been watching the deer licks. When the fever and aggie seeds was to be seen in it as plenty as you can see the rattlesnakes on old Crumhorn. 
but then I never expected to hold out forever, though there's them living who have seen the German flats a wilderness. I am them that's learned and acquainted with religion, too, though you might look a week now and not find even the stump of a pine on them, and that's a wood that lasts in the ground the better part of a hundred years after the tree is dead. This is but time, my good friend, returned Mr. Grant, who began to take an interest in the welfare of his new acquaintance. But I would have you prepare for eternity. It is incumbent on you to attend places of worship, as I am pleased to see that you have done this evening. Would it not be heedless in you to start on a day's toil of hard hunting, and leave your ramrod at flint behind? It must be a young hand in the woods, interrupted Natty, with another laugh, that didn't know how to dress a rod out of an ash sapling, or find a firestone in the mountains. No, no, I never expected to live forever, but I see times be altering in these mountains from what they was thirty years ago, or for that matter ten years. But might makes right, and the law is stronger than an old man, whether he is one that has much laming, or only like me, that is better now at standing at the passes than following the hounds, as I once used to could. Hey-ho! I never knowed preaching come into a settlement, but it made game scarce, and raised the price of gunpowder. And that's a thing not as easily made as a ramrod or an Indian flint. The divine, perceiving that he had given his opponent an argument by his own unfortunate selection of a comparison, very prudently relinquished the controversy, although he was fully determined to resume it at a more happy moment. Repeating his request to the young hunter with great earnestness, the youth and Indian consented to accompany him and his daughter to the dwelling that the care of Mr. Jones had provided for their temporary residence. Leatherstocking persevered in his intention of returning to the hut, and at the door of the building they separated. After following the course of one of the streets of the village a short distance, Mr. Grant, who led the way, turned into a field through a pair of open bars and entered a footpath of but sufficient width to admit one person to walk in at a time. The moon had gained a height that enabled her to throw her rays perpendicularly on the valley, and the distinct shadows of the party flitted along on the banks of the silver snow like the presence of aerial figures gliding to their appointed place of meeting. The night still continued intensely cold, although not a breath of wind was felt. The path was beaten so hard that the gentle female who made one of the party moved with ease along its windings, though the frost emitted a low creaking at the impression of even her light footsteps. The clergyman, in his dark dress of broadcloth, with his mild, benevolent countenance, occasionally turned toward his companions, expressing that look of subdued care, which was its characteristic, presented the first object in this singular group. Next to him moved the Indian, his hair falling about his face, his head uncovered, and the rest of his form concealed beneath his blanket. As his swarthy visage, with its muscles fixed in rigid composure, was seen under the light of the moon, which struck his face obliquely, he seemed a picture of resigned old age, on whom the storms of winter had beaten in vain for the greater part of a century. But when, in turning his head, the race fell directly on his dark, fiery eyes, they told a tale of passions unrestrained, and of thoughts free as air. The slight person of Miss Grant, which followed next, and which was but too thinly clad for the severity of this season, formed a marked contrast to the wild attire and uneasy glances of the Delaware chief, and more than once during the walk, the young hunter, himself no insignificant figure in the group, 
was led to consider the difference in the human form as the face of Mohegan and the gentle countenance of Miss Grant, with eyes that rivaled the soft hue of the sky, met his view at the instant that each turned to throw a glance at the splendid orb which lighted their path. Their way, which led through the fields that lay at some distance in the rear of the houses, was cheered by a conversation that flagged or became animated with the subject. The first to speak was the divine. Really, he said, it is so singular a circumstance to meet with one of your age that has not been induced by idle curiosity to visit any other church than the one in which he has been educated, that I feel strong curiosity to know the history of a life so fortunately regulated. Your education must have been excellent, as indeed is evident from your manners and language. Of which of the states are you a native, Mr. Edwards? For such, I believe, was the name that you gave Judge Temple? Of this. Of this? I was at a loss to conjecture from your dialect, which does not partake particularly of the peculiarities of any country with which I am acquainted. You have, then, resided much in the cities, for no other part of this country is so fortunate as to possess the constant enjoyment of our excellent liturgy. The young hunter smiled as he listened to the divine, while he so clearly betrayed from what part of the country he had come himself. But for reasons probably connected with his present situation, he made no answer. I am delighted to meet with you, my young friend, for I think an ingenious mind, such as I doubt not yours must be, will exhibit all the advantages of a settled doctrine and devout liturgy. You perceive how I was compelled to bend to the humors of my hearers this evening. Good Mr. Jones wished me to read the communion, and, in fact, all the morning service. But happily, the canons do not require this of an evening. I would have wearied a new congregation, but to-morrow I propose administering the sacrament. Do you commune, my young friend? I believe not, sir returned the youth with a little embarrassment that was not at all diminished by miss grant's pausing involuntarily and turning her eyes on him in surprise i fear that i am not qualified i have never yet approached the altar neither would i wish to do it while i find so much of the world clinging to my heart each must judge for himself said mr grant though i should think that a youth who had never been blown about by the wind of false doctrines, and who has enjoyed the advantages of our liturgy for so many years, in its purity, may safely come. Yes, sir, it is a solemn festival, which none should celebrate until there is reason to hope it is not a mockery. I observed this evening, in your manner to Judge Temple, a resentment that bordered on one of the worst of human passions. We will cross this brook on the ice. It must bear us all, I think, and safely. Be careful not to slip, my child. While speaking, he descended a little bank by the path, and crossed one of the small streams that poured their waters into the lake, and turning to see his daughter pass, observed that the youth had advanced and was kindly directing her footsteps. When all were safely over, he moved up the opposite bank, and continued his discourse. I was wrong, my dear sir, very wrong to suffer such feelings to rise under any circumstances, and especially in the presence where the evil was not intended. There is good in the talk of my father, said Mohican, stopping short and causing those who were behind to pause also. It is the talk of Minquam. The white man may do as his fathers have told him, but the young eagle has the blood of a Delaware chief in his veins. It is red, and the stain it makes can only be washed out with the blood of a mingo. Mr. Grant was surprised by the interruption of the Indian, and stopping, faced the speaker. His mild features were confronted to the face and determined looks of the chief, 
and expressed the horror he had felt at hearing such sentiments from one who professed the religion of his Savior. Raising his hands to a level with his head, he exclaimed, John! John! Is this the religion that you have learned from the Moravians? But no, I will not be so uncharitable as to suppose it. They are a pious, a gentle and a mild people, and could never tolerate these passions. Listen to the language of the Redeemer. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. This is the command of God, John, and without striving to cultivate such feelings, no man can see him. The Indian heard the divine with attention. The unusual fire of his eye gradually softened, and his muscles relaxed into their ordinary composure. But, slightly shaking his head, he motioned with dignity for Mr. Grant to resume his walk, and followed himself in silence. The agitation of the divine caused him to move with unusual rapidity along the deep path, and the Indian, without any apparent exertion, kept an equal pace, but the young hunter observed the female to linger in her steps, until a trifling distance intervened between the two former and the latter. Struck by the circumstance, and not perceiving any new impediment to retard her footstep, the youth made a tender of his assistance. "'You are fatigued, Miss Grant,' he said. "'The snow yields to the foot, and you are unequal to the strides of us men.' Step on the crust, I entreat you, and take the help of my arm. Yonder light is, I believe, the house of your father, but it seems yet at some distance. I am quite equal to the walk, returned a low tremulous voice, but I am startled by the manner of the Indian. Oh, his eye was horrid, as he turned to the moon in speaking to my father. But I forgot, sir. He is your friend, and by his language may be your relative, and yet of you I do not feel afraid. The young man stepped on the bank of snow, which firmly sustained his weight, and by a gentle effort induced his companion to follow. Drawing her arm through his own, he lifted his cap from his head, allowing the dark locks to flow in rich curls over his open brow and walked by her side with an air of conscious pride, as if in inviting an examination of his utmost thoughts. Louisa took but a furtive glance at his person, and moved quietly along at a rate that was greatly quickened by the aid of his arm. "'You are but little acquainted with this peculiar people, Miss Grant,' he said, "'or you would know that revenge is a virtue with an Indian.' They are taught from infancy upward to believe it a duty never to allow an injury to pass unrevenged. And nothing but the stronger claims of hospitality can guard one against their resentments where they have power. Surely, sir, said Miss Grant, involuntarily withdrawing her arm from his, you have not been educated in such unholy sentiments. It might be... A sufficient answer to your excellent father to say that I was educated in the church, he returned. But to you, I will add that I have been taught deep and practical lessons of forgiveness. I believe that on this subject I have but little cause to reproach myself. It shall be my endeavor that there yet be less. While speaking, he stopped and stood with his arm again proffered to her assistance. As he ended, she quietly accepted his offer, and they resumed their walk. Mr. Grant and Mohegan had reached the door of the former's residence, and stood waiting near its threshold for the arrival of their young companions. The former was earnestly occupied in endeavoring to correct, by his precepts, the evil propensities that he had discovered in the Indian during their conversation to which the latter listened in profound but respectful attention. 
On the arrival of the young hunter and the lady, they entered the building. The house stood at some distance from the village, in the center of a field, surrounded by stumps that were peering above the snow, bearing caps of pure white nearly two feet in thickness. Not a tree nor a shrub was nigh it, but the house externally exhibited that cheerless, unfurnished aspect which is so common to the hastily erected dwellings of a new country. The uninviting character of the outside was, however, happily relieved by the exquisite neatness and comfortable warmth within. They entered an apartment that was fitted as a parlor, though the large fireplace, with its culinary arrangements, betrayed the domestic uses to which it was occasionally applied. The bright blaze from the hearth rendered the light that proceeded from the candle Louisa produced unnecessary, for the scanty furniture of the room was easily seen and examined by the former. The floor was covered in the center by a carpet made of rags, a species of manufacture that was then, and yet continues to be, much in use in the interior, while its edges that were exposed to view were of unspotted cleanliness. There was a trifling air of better life in a tea-table and work-stand, as well as an old-fashioned mahogany bookcase, but the chairs, the dining-table, and the rest of the furniture were of the plainest and cheapest construction. Against the walls were hung a few specimens of needlework and drawing, the former executed with great neatness, though of somewhat equivocal merit in their designs, while the latter were strikingly deficient in both. One of the former represented a tomb with a youthful female weeping over it, exhibiting a church with arched windows in the background. On the tomb were the names with the dates of the births and deaths of several individuals, all of whom bore the name of Grant. An extremely cursory glance at this record was sufficient to discover to the young hunter the domestic state of the divine. He there read that he was a widower, and that the innocent and timid maiden, who had been his companion, was the only survivor of six children. The knowledge of the dependence which each of these meek Christians had on the other for happiness threw an additional charm around the gentle but kind attentions which the daughter paid to the father. These observations occurred while the party were seating themselves before the cheerful fire, during which time there was a suspension of discourse. But when each was comfortably arranged, and Louisa, after laying aside a thin coat of faded silk and a gypsy hat that was more becoming to her modest, ingenuous countenance than appropriate to the season, had taken a chair between her father and the youth. The former resumed the conversation. I trust, my young friend, he said, that the education you have received has eradicated most of those revengeful principles which you may have inherited by descent, for I understand from the expressions of John that you have some of the same blood of the Delaware tribe. Do not mistake me, I beg, for it is not color nor lineage, that constitutes merit, and I know not that he who claims affinity to the proper owners of this soil has not the best right to tread these hills with the lightest conscience. Mohican turned solemnly to the speaker, and with the peculiarly significant gestures of an Indian he spoke, Father, you are not yet past the summer of life. Your limbs are young. Go to the highest hill and look around you. All that you see, from the rising to the setting sun, from the headwaters of the great spring to where the crooked river is hid by the hills, is his. He has Delaware blood, and his right is strong. Footnote. The Susquehanna means crooked river. Hannah or Hannock meant river in many of the native dialects. Thus we find Rappahannock as far south as Virginia. And footnote. But the brother of Mingon is just. He will cut the country into parts as the river cuts the lowlands, and will say to the young eagle, Child of the Delawares, take it, keep it, and be a chief in the land of your fathers. Never! exclaimed the young hunter, 
with a vehemence that destroyed the rapt attention with which the divine and his daughter were listening to the Indian. The wolf of the forest is not more rapacious for his prey than that man is greedy of gold, and yet his glidings into wealth are subtle as the movements of a serpent. Forbear, forbear, my son, forbear, interrupted Mr. Grant. These angry passions must be subdued. The accidental injury you have received from Judge Temple has heightened the sense of your hereditary wrongs. But remember that the one was unintentional, and that the other is the effect of political changes, which have in their course greatly lowered the pride of kings, and swept mighty nations from the face of the earth. Where now are the Philistines? who so often held the children of Israel bondage, or that city Babylon, which rioted in luxury and vice, and who styled herself the queen of nations, in the drunkenness of her pride. Remember the prayer of our holy litany, where we implore the divine power that it may please thee to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and turn their hearts. The sin of the wrongs which have been done to the natives is shared by Judge Temple only in common with a whole people, and your arm will speedily be restored to its strength. This arm, repeated the youth, pacing the floor in violent agitation, think you, sir, that I believe the man a murderer? Oh, no! He is too wily, too cowardly for such a crime, but let him and his daughter riot in the wealth. A day of retribution will come. No, 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 he continued as he trod the floor more calmly. It is for Mohican to suspect him of an ancient right to injure me. But the trifle is not worth a second thought. He seated himself and hid his face between his hands as they rested on his knees. It is the hereditary violence of a native's passion, my child, said Mr. Grant, in a low tone to his affrighted daughter, who was clinging in terror to his arm. He is mixed with the blood of the Indians, you have heard, and neither the refinements of education nor the advantages of our excellent liturgy have been able entirely to eradicate the evil. But care and time will do much for him yet. Although the divine spoke in a low tone, yet what he uttered was heard by the youth, who raised his head with a smile of indefinite expression, and spoke more calmly. Be not alarmed, Miss Grant, at either the wildness of my manner or that of my dress. I have been carried away by passions that I should struggle to repress. I must attribute it with your father to be the blood in my veins although I would not impeach my lineage willingly, for it is all that is left me to boast of. Yes, I am proud of my descent from a Delaware chief, who was a warrior that ennobled human nature. O Mohegan was his friend, and will vouch for his virtues. Mr. Grant here took up the discourse, and finding the young man more calm, and the aged chief attentive, he entered into a full and theological discussion of the duty of forgiveness. The conversation lasted more than an hour when the visitors arose, and after exchanging good wishes with their entertainers, they departed. At the door they separated, Mohican taking the direct route to the village, while the youth moved toward the lake. The divine stood at the entrance of his dwelling, regarding the figure of the aged chief as it glided at an astonishing gait for his years along the deep path, his black straight hair just visible over the bundle formed by his blanket, which was sometimes blended with the snow under the silvery light of the moon. From the rear of the house was a window that overlooked the lake, and here Louisa was found by her father when he entered gazing intently on the same object in the direction of the eastern mountain. He approached the spot and saw the figure of the young hunter, at the distance of half a mile, walking with prodigious steps across the wide fields of frozen snow that covered the ice, 
toward the point where he knew the hut inhabited by the leather stocking was situated on the margin of the lake under a rock that was crowned by pines and hemlocks at the next instant the wild-looking form entered the shadow cast from the overhanging trees and was lost to view it is marvelous how long the propensities of the savage continue in that remarkable race said the good divine but if he perseveres as he has commenced his triumph shall yet be complete put me in mind louisa to lend him the homily against peril of idolatry at his next visit surety father you do not think him in danger of relapsing into the worship of his ancestors no my child returned the clergyman laying his hand affectionately on her flaxen locks and smiling his white blood would prevent it but there is such thing as the idolatry of our passions end of chapter twelve this reading by gary w sherwin of yukon pennsylvania in january of two thousand nine Chapter 13 of the Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 13 Quote, and I'll drink out of the quart pot. Here's a heath to the barley mow. Unquote. It's a drinking song. On one of the corners where the two principal streets of Templeton intersected each other, stood, as we have already mentioned, the inn called the Bold Dragoon. In the original plan, it was ordained that the village should stretch along the little stream that rushed down the valley, and the street which led from the lake to the academy was intended to be its western boundary. But convenience frequently frustrates the best regulated plans. The house of Mr., or as in consequence of commanding the militia of that vicinity, he was called Captain Hollister, had at an early day been erected directly facing the main street, and ostensibly interposed a barrier to its further progress. Horsemen, and subsequently teamsters, however, availed themselves of an opening at the end of the building to shorten their passage westward, until in time the regular highway was laid out along this course and houses were gradually built on either side, so as effectually to prevent any subsequent correction of the evil. Two material consequences followed this change in the regular plans of Marmaduke. The main street, after running about half its length, was suddenly reduced for precisely that difference in its width, and Bold Dragoon became, next to the mansion house, by far the most conspicuous edifice in the place. This conspicuousness, aided by the characters of the host and hostess, gave the tavern an advantage over all its future competitors that no circumstances could conquer. An effort was, however, made to do so, and at the corner diagonally opposite stood a new building that was intended by its occupants to look down all opposition. It was a house of wood, ornamented in the prevailing style of architecture, and about the roof and balustrades was one of the three imitators of the mansion house. The rough windows were filled with rough boards secured by nails to keep out the cold air, 
for the edifice was far from finished. Although glass was to be seen in the lower apartments, and the light of the powerful fires within denoted that it was already inhabited, the exterior was painted white on the front and on the end which was exposed to the street, but in the rear and on the side which was intended to join the neighboring house, it was coarsely smeared with Spanish brown. Before the door stood two lofty posts, connected at the top by a beam, from which was suspended an enormous sign, ornamented around its edges with certain curious carvings in pine boards, and on its faces loaded with Masonic emblems. Over these mysterious figures was written in large letters, The Templeton Coffee House, and Traveler's Hotel, and beneath them, by Habakkuk Foot and Joshua Knapp. This was a fearful rival to the bold dragoon, as our readers will more readily perceive when we add that the same sonorous names were to be seen over a newly erected store in the village, a hatter's shop, and the gates of a tanyard. But either because too much was attempted to be executed well, or that the bold dragoon had established a reputation which could not be easily shaken. Not only Judge Temple and his friends, but most of the villages also, who were not in debt to the powerful firm we have named, frequented the inn of Captain Hollister on all occasions where such a house was necessary. On the present evening, the limping veteran and his consort were hardly housed after their return from the academy, when the sounds of stamping feet at their threshold announced the approach of visitors, who were probably assembling with a view to compare opinions on the subject of the ceremonies they had witnessed. The public, or, as it was called, the bar-room of the Bold Dragoon, was a spacious apartment, lined on three sides with benches, and on the fourth by fireplaces. On the latter, there were two of such size as to occupy with their enormous jams, the whole of that side of the apartment where they were placed, excepting room enough for a door or two, and a little apartment in one corner, which was protected by miniature palisades and profusely garnished with bottles and glasses. In the entrance to this sanctuary, Mrs. Hollister was seated, with great gravity in her air while her husband occupied himself with stirring the fires, moving the logs with a large stake burnt to a point at one end. "'There, Sergeant, dear,' said the landlady, after she thought the veteran had got the logs arranged in the most judicious manner. "'Give over poking, for it's no good ye be doing, now that they burn so conveniently. There's the glasses on the table there, and a mug that the doctor was taking his cider and ginger in before the fire here. Just put them in the barn, will ye? For we'll be having the judge and the major and Mr. Jones down the night, without reckoning Benjamin Poop and the lawyers. And he'll be fixing the room tidy, put both flips irons on the coats, and tell Jude, the lazy black best, that if she's no be cleaning up the kitchen, I'll turn her out of the house, and she may live with the gentlemen that cape the coffee house. Good luck to him. Ouch, Sergeant, sure it's a great privilege to go a mateying where a body can sit easy without jumping up and down so often, as this Mr. Grant is doing that same. It's a privilege at all times, Mrs. Hollister. Whether we stand or be seated, or as good Mr. Whitefield used to do, after he had made a wearisome day's march, get on our knees and pray like Moses of old, with a flanker to the right and left to lift his hands to heaven, returned her husband, who composedly performed what she had directed to be done. It was a very pretty fight, Betty, that the Israelites had on that day with the Amalekites. It seems that they fought on a plain, where Moses is mentioned as having gone on the heights to overlook the battle and wrestle in prayer. And if I should judge with my little learning, the Israelites depended mainly on their horse. 
for it is written that Joshua cut up the enemy with the edge of the sword, from which I infer not only that they were horse, but well-disciplined troops. Indeed, it says as much as that they were chosen men, quite likely volunteers, for raw dragoons seldom strike with the edge of their swords, particularly if the weapon be any way crooked. Sha, why do ye bother yourself, wild text man, about so small a matter? interrupted the landlady. Sure it was the Lord who was with them, for he always sided with the Jews before they fell away, and it's but little matter what kind of men Joshua commanded, so that he was doing the right bidding. Of and them cursed Melishli, the Lord forgive me for swearing, that was the death of him with their cowardice. Would have carried the day in old times, there's no ransom to be thinking that the soldiers were used to the drill. I must say, Mrs. Hollister, that I have not often seen raw troops fight better than the left flank of the militia at the time you mentioned. They rallied handsomely, and that without beat of drum, which is no easy thing to do under fire, and were very steady till he fell. But the scriptures contain no unnecessary words, and I will maintain that horse, who know how to strike with the edge of the sword, must be well disciplined. Many a good sermon has been preached about smaller matters than that one word. If the text was not meant to be particular, why wasn't it written with the sword and not with the edge? Now a backhanded stroke on the edge takes long practice. Goodness, what an argument would Mr. Whitefield make of that word edge. As to the captain, if he had only called up the guard of the dragoons when he rallied the foot, they would have shown the enemy what the edge of a sword was. For although there was no commission officer with them, yet I think I must say, the veteran continued, stiffening his cravat about his throat and raising himself up with tile air of a drill sergeant, they were led by a man who knowed how to bring them on, in spite of the ravine. It's a love on ye wood, cried the landlady, when ye know yourself, Mr. Hollister, that the bust he rode was but little able to jump from one rock to another, and the animal was as spry as a squirrel. Ouch! But it's useful talk, for he's gone this many a year. I would that he had lived to see the true light, but there's mercy for a brave soul that died in the saddle fighting for the liberty. It is a poor tombstone they have given him, anyway, and many a good one that died like himself. But the sign is very like, and I will be keeping it up, while the blacksmith can make a hook for it to swing on, for all the coffee houses— between this and Albany. There is no saying where this desultory conversation would have led the worthy couple had not the men who were stamping the snow off their feet on the little platform before the door suddenly ceased their occupation and entered the bar room. For ten or fifteen minutes the different individuals who intended either to bestow or receive edification before the fires of the bold dragoon on that evening, were collecting, until the benches were nearly filled with men of different occupations. Dr. Todd and a slovenly-looking, shabby, genteel young man, who took tobacco profusely, wore a coat of imported cloth cut with something like a fashionable air, frequently exhibited a large French silver watch with a chain of woven hair and a silver key, and who altogether seemed as much above the artisans around him as he was himself inferior to the real gentleman, occupied a high back wooden settee in the most comfortable corner in the apartment. Sundry brown mugs containing cider or beer were placed between the heavy andirons, and little groups were found among the guests as subjects arose or the liquor was passed from one to the other. No man was seen to drink by himself, 
nor in any instance was more than one vessel considered necessary for the same beverage. But the glass or the mug was passed from hand to hand, until a chasm in the line, or a regard to the rights of ownership, would regularly restore the dregs of the potation to him who defrayed the cost. Toasts were uniformly drunk, and occasionally someone who conceived himself peculiarly endowed by nature to shine in the way of wit would attempt such sentiment as, hoping that he who treated might make better man than his father, or live till all his friends wished him dead while the more humble pot companion contented himself by saying, with a most composing gravity in his air, Come, here's luck! or by expressing some other equally comprehensive desire. In every instance the veteran landlord was requested to imitate the custom of the cupbearers to kings, and taste the liquor he presented by the invitation of, After you is manners! with which he ordinarily complied by wetting his lips, first expressing the wish of, Here's hoping! Leaving it to the imagination of its hearers to fill the vacuum by whatever good each thought most desirable. During these movements, the landlady was busily occupied with mixing the various compounds required by her customers with her own hands, and occasionally exchanging greetings and inquiries concerning the conditions of their respective families, with such of the villagers as approached the bar. At length, the common thirst being in some measure assuaged, conversation of a more general nature became the order of the hour. The physician and his companion, who is one of the two lawyers of the village, being considered the best qualified to maintain a public discourse with credit, were the principal speakers, though a remark was hazarded now and then by Dr. Doolittle, who was thought to be their inferior only in the enviable point of education. A general silence was produced on all but the two speakers by the following observation from the practitioner of the law. So, Dr. Todd, I understand that you have been performing an important operation this evening by cutting a charge of buckshot from the shoulder of the son of leather stocking? Yes, sir, returned the other, elevating his little head with an air of importance. I had a small job up the judge in that way. It was, however, but a trifle to what it might have been, had it gone through the body. The shoulder is not a very vital part, and I think the young man will soon be well. But I did not know that the patient was a son of leather-stocking. It is news to me to hear that Natty had a wife. It is by no means a necessary consequence, returned the other, winking, with a shrewd look around the bar-room. There is such a thing, I suppose you know, in law as Phileas Nellius. Speak out, man, exclaimed the landlady. Speak it out in King's English. What for you be talking Indian in a room full of Christian folks? Though it's about a poor hunter who is but little better in his ways than the wild savages themselves. Oh, it's to be... Hope that the missionaries will, in his own time, make a conversion of the poor devils. And then it will matter little of what color is the skin, or whether there be wool or hair on the head. Oh, it is Latin, not Indian, Miss Hollister, returned the lawyer, repeating his winks and shrewd looks. And Dr. Todd understands Latin. Or how would he read the labels on his galley pots and drawers? No, no, Miss Hollister, the doctor understands me. Don't you, doctor? Hm. <laughs> Why, I guess I'm not far out of the way, returned Ellenthon, endeavoring to imitate the expression of the other's countenance by looking jocular. Latin is a queer language, gentlemen. Now, I rather guess there is no one in the room except Squire Lippet who can believe that far av means oatmeal in English. The lawyer, in his turn, was a good deal embarrassed by his display of learning, for, although he actually had taken his first degree at one of the eastern universities, he was somewhat puzzled with the terms used by his companion, 
It was dangerous, however, to appear to be outdone in learning in a public bar-room, and before so many of his clients. He therefore put the best face on the matter, and laughed knowingly, as if there were a good joke concealed under it that was understood only by the physician and himself. All this was attentively observed by the listeners, who exchanged looks of approbation, and the expressions of tonguey matty and I guess Squire Lippet knows if anybody does, were heard in different parts of the room as vouchers for the admiration of his auditors. Thus encouraged, the lawyer rose from his chair, and turning his back to the fire and facing the company, he continued, The son of Nanny, or the son of nobody. I hope the young man is not going to let the matter drop. This is a country of law, and I should like to see it fairly tried, whether a man who owns or says he owns a hundred thousand acres of land has any more right to shoot a body than another. What do you think of it, Dr. Todd? Oh, sir, I am of opinion that the gentleman will soon be well. As I said before, the wound is not in a vital part, and the ball was extracted so soon that the shoulder was what I call well attended to. I do not think there is much danger, as there might have been. I say, Squire Doolittle, continued the attorney, raising his voice, you are a magistrate, and know what is law and what is not law. I ask you, sir, as shooting a man is a thing that is to be settled so very easily. Suppose, sir, that the young man had a wife and family, and suppose that he was a mechanic like yourself, sir, and suppose that his family depended on him for bread, and suppose that the ball, instead of merely going through the flesh, had broken the shoulder blade and crippled him forever. I ask you all, gentlemen, supposing this to be the case, whether a jury wouldn't give what I call handsome damages? As the close of the suppositious case was addressed to the company generally, Hiram did not at first consider himself called on for a reply, but finding the eyes of the listeners bent on him in expectation, he remembered his character for judicial discrimination and spoke, observing a due degree of deliberation and dignity. Why, if a man should shoot another, he said, and if he should do it on purpose, and if the law took notice on it, and if a jury should find him guilty, it would be likely to turn out a state prison matter. It would do, sir, returned the attorney. The law, gentlemen, is no respecter of persons in a free country. It is one of the great blessings that has been handed down to us from our ancestors, that all men are equal in the eye of the laws, as they are by nature. Though some may get property, no one knows how, yet they are not privileged to transgress the laws any more than the poorest citizen in the state. This is my notion, gentlemen, and I think that if a man had a mind to bring this matter up, something might be made out of it that would help pay for the salve. Huh, doctor? Why, sir, returned the physician, who appeared a little bit uneasy at the turn the conversation was taking, I have the promise of Judge Temple before men, not but what I would take his word as soon as his note of hand, but it was before men. Let me see. There was Monsieur de Quaux, and Squire Jones, and Major Hartman, and Miss Pettibone, and one or two of the blacks by when he said that his pocket would amply reward me for what I did. Was the promise made before or after the service was performed? asked the attorney. It might have been both, returned the discreet physician, though I am certain he said it before I undertook the dressing. But it seems that he said his pocket should reward you, doctor, observed Hiram. Now, I don't know that the law will hold a man to such a promise. He might give you his pocket with sixpence in it and tell you to take your pay out it. 
that would not be a reward in the eye of the law, interrupted the attorney. Not what is called a quid pro quo, nor is the pocket to be considered as an agent, but as part of a man's own person, that is, in this particular. I am of opinion that an action would lie on that promise, and I will undertake to bear him out free of cost if he don't recover. To this proposition the physician made no reply, but he was observed to cast his eyes around him, as if to enumerate the witnesses, in order to substantiate this promise also at a future day, should it prove necessary. A subject so momentous that of suing Judge Temple was not very palatable to the present company in so public a place, and a short silence ensued that was only interrupted by the opening of the door and the entrance of Natty himself. The old hunter carried in his hand his never-failing companion, the rifle, and although all of the company were uncovered excepting the lawyer, who wore his hat on one side, with a certain dammy air, Natty moved to the front of one of the fires without the least altering any part of his dress or appearance. Several questions were addressed to him on the subject of the game he had killed, which he answered readily, and with some little interest, and the landlord between whom and Natty there existed so much cordiality on account of their both having been soldiers in youth, offered him a glass of a liquid which, if we might be judge of its reception, was no unwelcome guest. When the forester had gotten his potation also, he quietly took his seat on the end of one of the logs that lay nigh the fires, and the slight interruption produced by his entrance seemed to be forgotten. "'The testimony of the blacks should not be taken, sir,' continued the lawyer, "'for they are all the property of Mr. Jones, who owns their time. But there is a way by which Judge Temple or any other man might be made to pay for shooting another, and for the cure in the bargain. There is a way, I say, and that without going into the court of errors, too.' "'And a mighty big year ye would make of it, Mr. Todd,' cried the landlady. "'Should ye be putting that matter into the lot all with Judge Temple, "'who has a purse as long as one of them pines on the hill, "'and who is an easy man to deal with? "'If ye put mine to humor him, he's a good man, he's Judge Temple, and a kind one and one who will be no likelier to do the pratty thing because he would wish to terrify him with the law? I know what but one objection to the same, which is an over-carelessness of his soul. It's neither a Methody, nor a Papish, nor a Presbyterian that he is, but just nothing at all, and it's hard to think that he... Who will not fight the good fight under the banners of regular church in this world will be mustered among the chosen of heaven, as my husband, the captain there, as ye call him, says, though there is but one captain that I know who deserves the name. I hopes, Leatherstocking, you'll be no foolish in putting the boy up to try the law in the matter, for twill be an evil day for ye both when ye first turn the skin or so peaceable an animal as a sheep into a bone of contention. The lad is welcome to his drink for nothing until his shoulder will bear the rifle again. Well, that's generous, was heard from several mouths at once, for this was a company in which a liberal offer was not thrown away, while the hunter, instead of expressing any of that indignation which he might be supposed to feel at hearing the hurt of his young companion alluded to, opened his mouth with the silent laugh for which he was so remarkable, and after he had indulged his humor, made this reply. I know the judge would do nothing with his smooth bore when he got out of his sleigh. I never saw but one smooth bore that would carry it all, and that was a French ducking piece upon the big lakes. It had a barrel half as long again as my rifle, 
and would throw fine shot into a goose at one hundred yards. But it made dreadful work with the game, and you wanted a boat to carry it about in. When I went with Sir William, again the French, at Fort Niagara, all the rangers used the rifle, and a dreadful weapon it is in the hands of one who knows how to charge it and keep a steady aim. The captain knows, for he says he was a soldier in Charlie's, and though they were nothing but bayonet men, he must know how we cut up the French and the Iroquois in the scrimmages in that war. Change Gotchkook, which means Big Serpent in English, old John Mahegan, who lives up at the hut with me, was a great warrior then, and was out with us. He can tell all about it. Though he was overhand for the tomahawk, never firing more than once or twice, he was running in for the scalps. Ah, oh, times is dreadfully altered since then. Why, doctor, there was nothing but a footpath, or at the most a track for pack horses, along the Mohawk, from the German flats up to the forts. Now they say they talk of running one of them wide roads with gates on it along the river, first making a road and then fencing it up. I hunted one season back of the Catskills, nigh hand to the settlements, and the dogs often lost the scent when they came to them highways. There was so much travel on them, though I can't say that the brutes was a very good breed. Old Hector will win the deer in the fall of the year across the broadest place in Ostego, and that is a mile and a half, for I paced it myself on the ice when the track was first surveyed under the Indian Grant. It seems to me, Natty, but a sorry compliment to call your comrade after the evil one, said the landlady. And it's no much like a snake that old John is looking now. Nimrod would be a more becoming name for the lad, and a more Christian, too, seeing that it conies from the Bible. The sergeant read me the chapter about him the night before my christening, and I mightly have said it was to listen to anything from the book. Old John and Chingachgook were very different men to look on, returned the hunter, shaking his head with his melancholy recollections. In the 58th War, he was in the middle of manhood, and taller than now by three inches. If you had seen him as I did the morning we beat Descal from behind our log walls, you would have called him as comely a redskin as ye ever set eyes on. He was naked all to his breechcloth and leggings, and you never seed a creature so handsomely painted. One side of his face was red and the other black. His head was shaven clean, all to a few hairs on the crown where he wore a tuft of eagle feathers as bright as if they had come from a peacock's tail. He had colored his sides so they looked like anatomy, ribs and all for Gingotchcook had great taste in such things, so that what with his bold, fiery countenance, his knife, and his tomahawk, I have never seen a fiercer warrior on the ground. He played his part, too, like a man, for I saw him the next day with thirteen scalps on his pole. And I will say this for the big snake, that he always dealt fair, and never scalped any that he didn't kill with his own hands. Well, well, cried the landlady, fighting is fighting. Anyway, there is different fashions in the thing, though I can't say that I regularly mangling the body after the breath is out of it. Neither do I think it can be upheld by doctrine. I hope, Sergeant, ye never was helping in such evil work. It was my duty to keep my ranks, and to stand or fall by the bayonet or lead, returned the veteran. It was then in the fort, and seldom leaving my place, saw but little of the savages, who kept on the flanks or in front scrimmaging. I remember, howsomever, to have heard mention made of the great snake, as he was called, for he was a chief of renown. But little did I ever expect to see him enlisted in the cause of Christianity, and civilized like old John. Oh, 
He was Christianized by the Moravians, who were always over intimate with the Delawares, said Leather Stocking. It's my opinion that had they been left to themselves, there would be no such doings about the headwaters of the two rivers, and that these hills might have been kept as good hunting ground by their right owner, who is not too old to carry a rifle, and whose sight is as true as a fish-hawk hovering. He was interrupted by more stamping at the door, and presently the party from the mansion-house entered, followed by the Indian himself. End of chapter 13 This recording by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in January of 2009Chapter 14 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Chapter 14 Quote, There's a quart pot, pint pot, mitt pint, gill pot, half gill nipper kid, and the brown bowl. Here's a health to the barley mow, my brave boys. Here's a health to the barley mow. Unquote. A drinking song. Some little commotion was produced by the appearance of the new guest, during which the lawyer slunk from the room. Most of the men approached Marmaduke and shook his offered hand, hoping that the judge was well, while Major Hartman, having laid aside his hat and wig and substituted for the later a warm, peak woolen nightcap, took his seat very quietly on one end of the settee, which was relinquished by its former occupant. His tobacco box was next produced, and a clean pipe was handed him by the landlord. When he had succeeded in raising a smoke, the major gave a long whiff, and turning his head toward the bar, he said, Pretty, bring in ter toddy. In the meantime, the judge had exchanged his salutations with most of the company, and taken a place by the side of the major, and Richard had bustled himself into the most comfortable seat in the room. Mr. Lacoy was the last seated, nor did he venture to place his chair, finally, until by frequent removals he had ascertained that he could not possibly intercept a ray of heat from any individual present. Mohegan found a place on one end of one of the benches and somewhat approximated to the bar. When these movements had subsided, the judge remarked pleasantly, Well, Betty, I find you retain your popularity through all weathers, against all rivals, and among all religions. How like you the sermon? Is it the sermon? exclaimed the landlady. I can't say but that it was reasonable, but the prayers is mighty uneasy. It's no small a matter for a body in your fifty-ninth year to be moving so much in church. Mr. Grant seems a godly man anyway, and his girl a humble on, and a devout. Here John is a mug of cider, laced with whiskey. An Indian will drink cider, though he never be a thirst. I must say, observed Hiram with due deliberation that it was a tonguey thing, and I'd rather guess that it gave considerable satisfaction. There was one part, though, which might have been left out, or something else put in. But then I suppose that, as it was a written discourse, it is not so easily altered as where a minister preaches without notes. Oi, there's the rub, Judge. 
cried the landlady. How can a man stand up and be preaching his word when all that he is saying is written down? And he is as much tied to it as ever a thaving dragon was to the pickets. Well, well, cried Marmaduke, waving his hand for silence. There is enough said. As Mr. Grant told us, there are different sentiments on such subjects, and in my opinion, he spoke most sensibly. So, Jonathan, I am told you have sold your betterments to a new settler, and have moved into the village and opened a school. Was it Cash or Dicker? The man who was thus addressed occupied a seat immediately behind Marmaduke, and one who was ignorant of the extent of the judge's observation might have thought that he would have escaped noticed. He was of a thin, shapeless figure, with a discontented expression of countenance, and with something extremely shiftless in his whole air. Thus spoken to, after turning and twisting a little, by way of preparation, he made a reply. Why, part cash and part decker. I sold out to a pumphite man, who was so thin beforehanded, he was to give me ten dollar for acre for the clearing, and one dollar an acre over the first cost of the woodland, and we agreed to leave the buildings to men. So I tuck us a Montague, and he tuck us a Lombimit, and they tuck old Square Naphtali Green. And so they had a meeting, and made out a verdict of eighty dollars for the buildings. There was twelve acres of clearing, and ten dollars and eighty-eight at one. And the whole came to two hundred and eighty-six dollars and a half after paying the men. Who oh, said Marmaduke. What did you give for the place? Why, besides what's coming to the judge, I gin my brother Tim a hundred dollars for his bargain. But then there's a new house on it that cost me sixty more. And I paid Moses a hundred dollars for chopping and logging and so on, so that the whole stood me in about two hundred and sixty dollars. But then I had a great crop off on it, and as I got twenty-six dollars and a half more than it cost, I conclude I made a pretty good trade on it. Yes, but you forgot that the crop was yours without the trade, and you have turned yourself out of doors for twenty-six dollars. Oh, the judge is clean out, said the man with a look of sagacious calculation. He turned out a span of horses that is worth a hundred and fifty dollars on any man's money, and a brand new wagon, fifty dollars in cash, and a good note for eighty more, and a side saddle that was valued at seven and a half. So there was just twelve shillings betwixt us. I wanted him to turn out a set of harness and take the cow and sap troughs. He wouldn't. But I saw through it. He thought I should have to buy the tackling afore I could use the wagon and horses. But I knowed a thing or two myself. I should like to know of what use is the tackling to him. I offered him to trade again for one hundred and fifty-five. But my woman said she wanted to churn. So I took a churn for the change. And what do you mean to do with your time this winter. You must remember that time is money. Why, as Master has gone down country to see his brother, who they say is going to make a die on it, I agreed to take the school in hand till he comes back. If time doesn't get worse in the spring, I've some notion of going into trade, or maybe I may move off to the Genesee. They say they are carrying on a great stroke of business that a way. If the worst comes to worst, I can but work at my trade, for I was brought up in a shoe manufactory. It would seem that Marmaduke did not think his society of sufficient value to attempt inducing him to remain where he was, 
for he addressed no further discourse to the man, but turned his attention to other subjects. After a short pause, Hiram ventured a question. What news does the judge bring us from the legislature? It's not likely that Congress has done much this session, or maybe the French haven't fit any more battles lately. The French, since they have beheaded their king, have done nothing but fight, returned the judge. The character of the nation seems changed. I knew many French gentlemen during our war, and they all appear to me to be men of great humanity and goodness of heart. But these Jacobins are as bloodthirsty as bulldogs. There was one Rochambeau with us down at Yorktown, cried the landlady. A mighty pretty man he was, too. And their horse was the very same. It was there that the sergeant got hurt in the leg from the English batteries. Bad luck to him. Oh, mon pauvre roi, muttered Monsieur Lacoy. The legislature have been passing laws, continued Marmaduke, that the country much required. Among others is an act prohibiting the drawing of seines at any other than proper seasons in certain of our streams and small lakes, and another to prohibit the killing of deer in the teeming months. These are laws that were loudly called for by judicious men. Nor do I despair of getting an act to make the unlawful felling of timber a criminal offense. The hunter listened to this detail with breathless attention, and when the judge had ended, he laughed in open derision. You may make your laws, judge, he cried, but who will you find to watch the mountains through the long summer days, or the lakes at night? Game is game, and he who finds may kill. That has been the law in these mountains for forty years, to my certain knowledge, and I think one old law is worth two new ones. None but a green would wish to kill a doe with a fawn by its side, unless his moccasins were getting old or his leggings ragged, for the flesh is lean and coarse. But a rifle rings among the rocks along the lake shore, sometimes as if fifty pieces were fired at once. It would be hard to tell where the man stood who pulled the trigger. Armed with the dignity of the law, Mr. Bumpo, returned the judge gravely, a vigilant magistrate can prevent much of the evil that has hitherto prevailed, and which is already rendering game scarce. I hope to live to see the day when a man's rights in his game shall be as much respected as title to his farm. Your titles and your farms are all new together, cried Natty. But laws should be equal, and not more for one than another. I shot a deer last Wednesday, was a fortnight, and it floundered through the snow banks till it got over a brush fence. I catched the lock of my rifle in the twigs in falling and was kept back until finally the creature got off. Now I want to know who is to pay me for that deer. And a fine buck it was. If it hadn't been a fence, I should have gotten another shot onto it, and I never drawed upon anything that hadn't wings three times running in my born days. No, no, judge. It's the farmers that makes the game scarce, and not the hunters. Dear dear is not so plainly as t old were, Pumpo, said the major, who had been an attentive listener amid clouds of smoke. Put de lot is not might as for to tear to live but for Christians. Why, major, I believe you're a friend to justice and to the right though you go so often to the grand house. But it's a hard case to a man to have his honest calling for a livelihood stopped by laws, and that, too, when, if right was done, he might hunt or fish on any day in the week 
or on the best flat in the patent, if he was so minded. I understand you, letter stockant, returned the major, fixing his black eyes with a peculiar look of meaning on the hunter. But you didn't used to be so prudent as to look at me so much care. Maybe there wasn't so much occasion, said the hunter, a little sulkily, when he sank into silence from which he was not roused for some time. The judge was saying something about the French, Hiram observed when the pause in the conversation had continued a decent time. Yes, sir, returned Marmaduke. The Jacobins of France seem rushing from one act of licentiousness to another. They continue those murders which are dignified by the name of executions. You have heard that they have added the death of their queen to the long list of their crimes. Les monsters, again murmured Monsieur Lacroix, turning himself suddenly in his chairs with a convulsive start. The province of La Vendine is laid waste by the troops of the Republic, and hundreds of its inhabitants, who are royalist in their sentiments, are shot at a time. Le Vendine is a district of the southwest of France that continues yet much attached to the family of the Bourbons. Doubtless Monsieur Le Coy is acquainted with it and can describe it more faithfully. No, 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 mon cher ami, returned the Frenchman in a suppressed voice, but speaking rapidly and gesticulating with his right hand as if for mercy, while with his left he concealed his eyes. There have been many battles fought lately, continued Marmaduke, and the infuriated Republicans are too often victorious. I cannot say, however, that I am sorry that they have captured Toulon from the English, for it is a place to which they have a just right. Aha! exclaimed Monsieur Le Coy, springing on his feet, and flourishing both arms with great animation. Sais Anglais! The Frenchman continued to move about the room with great alacrity for a few minutes, repeating his exclamations to himself when overcome by the contrary nature of his emotions. He suddenly burst out of the house and was seen wading through the snow toward his little shop, waving his arms on high as if to pluck down honor from the moon. His departure excited but little surprise, for the villagers were used to his manner, but Major Hartman laughed outright for the first during his visit as he lifted the mug and observed, Ter Frenchman is mutt, but he is good as for nothing to drink his trunk mit joy. The Frenchmen are good soldiers, said Captain Hollister. They stood by us in hand a good turn at Yorktown. Nor do I think, although I am an ignorant man, about the great movements of the army, that His Excellency would have been able to march against Cornwallis without their reinforcements. Ye speak the truth, Sergeant, interrupted his wife, and I would ever have ye doing the same. It's very pretty men is the French. And just when I stopped the cart, the time when ye was pushing on in front of work to keep the ringlers in, a regiment of the gentlemen marched by, and so I dealt them out to their liking. Was it pay I got? Sure did I, and in good solid crowns. A devil bit of continental could they muster among them all for love nor money. Och, the Lord forgive me for swearing and spaking, of such vanities. But this I will say for the French, that they paid in good silver, and one glass would not go a great way with them, for again Raleigh handed it back with a drop in the cup. And that's a brisk trade, George, where the pay is good, and the men not over particular. A thriving trade, Miss Hollister, said Marmaduke. But what has become of Richard? He jumped up as soon as seated, 
and has been absent so long, I am really fearful he has frozen. No fear of that, cousin Duke, cried the gentleman himself. Business will sometimes keep a man warm the coldest night that ever snapped in the mountains. Betty, your husband told me as we came out of church that your hogs were getting mangy, and so I've out and took a look at him and found it true. I stepped across, doctor, and got your boy to weigh me out a pound of salts, and have been mixing it with their swill. I'll bet a saddle of venison against a gray squirrel that they are better in a week. And now, Miss Hollister, I'm ready for a hissing mug of flip. "'Sure, I know ye'd be wanting the same,' said the landlady. "'It's a fixed and ready to the boiling. "'Sergeant, dear, be handing up ye eye, will ye? "'No, the one on the fire-fire. "'It's black, ye will see. "'Ah, you've the thing now. "'Look, if it's not as red as a cherry.' "'The beverage was heated, and Richard took that kind of draught which men are apt to indulge in who think that they have just executed a clever thing, especially when they like the liquor. "'Oh, you have a hand, Betty! That was formed to mix flip!' cried Richard, when he paused for breath. "'The very iron has a flavor in it. Here, John, drink, man, drink. I and you and Dr. Todd have done a good thing with the shoulder of that lad this very night. Duke, I made a song while you were gone one day, when I had nothing to do, so I'll sing a verse or two, though I haven't really determined the tune yet. What is life but a scene of care, where each one must toil in his way? Then let us be jolly, and prove that we are a set of good fellows who seem very rare, and can laugh and sing all the day. Then let us be jolly. And cast away folly, for grief turns a black head to gray. There, Duke, what do you think of that? There is another verse of it all, but the last line. I haven't got a rhyme for the last line yet. Well, John, what do you think of the music? As good as one of your war songs, huh? Good, said Mohegan who had been sharing deeply in the potations of the landlady. Besides paying the proper respect to the passing mugs of the Major and Marmaduke. Bravo! Bravo, Ricard! cried the Major, whose black eyes were beginning to swim in moisture. Pravissimo is a good song, but Nettie Pompo is better. Let her stock in. Wilt sing? Say, oh boy, wilt sing her song as about to woos? No, no, Major, returned the hunter, with a melancholy shake of the head. I have lived to see what I thought eyes could never behold in these hills, and I have no heart left for singing. If he that has a right to be master and ruler here is forced to squinch his thirst when a dry with snow water, it ill becomes them that have lived by his bounty to be making merry, as if there was nothing in the world but sunshine in summer. When he had spoken, Leather Stocking again dropped his head on his knees, and concealed his hard and wrinkled features with his hands. The change from the excessive cold without the heat of the barroom, coupled with the depth and frequency of Richard's drafts, had already leveled whatever inequality there might have existed between him and the other guest on the score of spirits, and he now held out a pair of swimming mugs of foaming flip toward the hunter as he cried, Merry a Merry Christmas to you, old boy! Sunshine in summer? No, you are blind, leather stocking. Tis moonshine and winter. Take these spectacles and open your eyes. So let us be jolly, and cast away folly, for grief turns a black head to gray. Here, old John turns his quavers. What damned dull music an Indian song is, after all, Major. I wonder if they ever sing by note. While Richard was singing and talking, Mohegan was uttering dull, monotonous tones, keeping time by a gentle motion of his head and body. He made use 
of but few words, and such as he did utter were in his native language, and consequently only understood by himself and Natty. Without heeding Richard, he continued to sing a kind of wild, melancholy air that rose at times in sudden and quite elevated notes, and then fell again in the low, quavering sounds that seemed to compose the character of his music. The attention of the company was now much divided, the men in the rear having formed themselves into little groups, where they were discussing various matters, among the principal of which were the treatment of mangy hogs and Parson Grant's preaching. While Dr. Todd was endeavoring to explain to Marmaduke the nature of the hurt received by the young hunter, Mohegan continued to sing, while his countenance was becoming vacant, though, coupled with his thick bushy hair, it was assuming an expression very much like brutal ferocity. His notes were gradually growing louder, and soon rose to a height that caused a general cessation in the discourse. The hunter now raised his head again, and addressed the old warrior warmly in the Delaware language, which, for the benefit of our readers, we shall render freely into English. Why do you sing of your battles, Chingachgook, and to the warriors you have slain, when the worst enemy of all is near you, and keeps the young eagle from his rights? I have fought in as many battles as any warrior in your tribe, but cannot boast of my deeds at such a time as this. Hawkeye, said the Indian, tottering with a doubtful step from his place. I am the great snake of the Delawares. I can track the Mingos like an adder that is stealing on the whippoorwill's eggs, and strike them like the rattlesnake dead at a blow. The white man made the tomahawk of Chingachgook bright as the waters of a stego when the last sun is shining but it is red with the blood of the Maquas. And why have you slain the Mingo warriors? Was it not to keep these hunting grounds and lakes to your father's children? And were they not given in solemn counsel to the fire-eater? And does not the blood of a warrior run in the veins of a young chief who should speak aloud where his voice is now too low to be heard? The appeal of the hunter seemed in some measure to recall the confused faculties of the Indian, who turned his face toward the listeners and gazed intently on the judge. He shook his head, throwing his hair back from his countenance, and exposed eyes that were glaring with an expression of wild resentment. But the man was not himself. His hand seemed to make a fruitless effort to release his tomahawk, which was confined by its handle to his belt, while his eyes gradually became vacant. Richard, at that instant, thrusting a mug before him, his features changed to the grin of idiocy, and seizing the vessel with both hands, he sank backward on the bench, and drank until satiated. When he made an effort to lay aside the mug with the helplessness of total inebriety. Shed not blood, exclaimed the hunter as he watched the countenance of the Indian in its moment of ferocity, but he is drunk and can do no harm. This is the way with all the savages. Give them liquor, and they make dogs of themselves. Well, well, the day will come when right will be done, and we must have patience. Natty still spoke in the Delaware language, and, of course, was not understood. He had hardly concluded before Richard cried, Well, old John is soon sewed up. Give him a berth, Captain, in the barn, and I'll pay for it. I am rich tonight, ten times richer than Duke, with all his hands amid military lots and funded debts and bonds and mortgages. Come, come, let us be jolly. And cast away folly for grief. Drink, King Hiram, drink. 
Mr. Do-Nothing, drink, sir, I say. This is a Christmas Eve which comes, you know, but once a year. He, 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 the squire's quite musical tonight, said Hiram, whose visage began to give marvelous signs of relaxation. I rather guess we shall make a church on yet, squire. A church, Mr. Doolittle? We will make a cathedral of it. Bishops, priests, deacons, wardens, vestry, and choir, organ, organist, the mid-bellows. By the Lord Harry, as Benjamin says, we will clap a steeple on the other end of it and make two churches of it. What say you, Duke? Will you pay, huh? My cousin judge will pay. Thou make us such a noise, deacon, returned Marmaduke. It is impossible that I can hear what Dr. Todd is saying. I think thou observest is probable the wound will fester so as to occasion danger to the limb in this cold weather. Out of nature, sir, quite out of nature, said Elanthin, attempting to expectorate, but succeeding only in throwing a light frothy substance like a flake of snow into the fire. Quite out of nature, and a wound so well dressed, and with the ball in my pocket should fester? I suppose, as the judge talks of taking the young man into his house, it would be most convenient if I but one charge on't. I should think one would do, returned Marmaduke, with that arch smile that so often beamed on his face, leaving the beholder in doubt whether he most enjoyed the character of his companion or his own covert humor. The landlord had succeeded in placing the Indian on some straw in one of his outbuildings, where, covered with his own blanket, John continued for the remainder of the night. In the meantime, Major Hartman began to grow noisy and jocular. Glass succeeded glass, and mug after mug was introduced, until the carousal had run deep into the night, or rather morning. When the veteran German expressed an inclination to return to the mansion house, most of the party had already retired, but Marmaduke knew the habits of his friend too well to suggest an earlier adjournment. So soon, however, as the proposal was made, the judge eagerly availed himself of it, and the trio prepared to depart. Mrs. Hollister attended them to the door in person, cautioning her guest as to the safest manner of leaving her premises. "'Lean on Mr. Jones, Major,' she said. "'He's young and will be a support to ye. "'Well, it's a charming sight to see you anyway at the Bull Dragoon. "'And sure, it's no harm in be caping a Christmas Eve with a light heart, "'for it's no telling when we may have sorrow come upon us. "'So good night, George, and Merry Christmas to ye all tomorrow morning.' The gentlemen made their adieus as well as they could, and taking the middle of the road, which was a fine, wide, and well-beaten path, they did tolerably well until they reached the gate of the mansion-house. But on entering the judge's domains, they encountered some slight difficulties. We shall not stop to relate them, but will just mention that in the morning sundry diverging paths were to be seen in the snow and that once during their progress to the door, Marmaduke, missing his companions, was enabled to trace them by one of these paths to a spot where he discovered them with nothing visible but their heads, Richard singing in a most vivacious strain, Come let us be jolly, and cast away folly, for grief turns a black head to gray. End of chapter 14. This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in August of 2009. Chapter 15 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Org. Chapter 15 Quote, as he lay on that day, in the day of this gay-o. Oh. Previously to the occurrences of the scene at the Bold Dragoon, Elizabeth had been safely reconducted to the mansion house, where she was left as its mistress, either to amuse or employ herself during the evening, as best suited her own inclinations. Most of the lights were extinguished, but as Benjamin adjusted with great care and regularity four large candles in as many massive candlesticks of brass in a row on the sideboard, the hall possessed a peculiar air of comfort and warmth, contrasted with the cheerless aspect of the room she had left in the academy. Remarkable had been one of the listeners to Mr. Grant, and returned with her resentment, which had been not a little excited by the language of the judge, somewhat softened by reflection and the worship. She recollected the youth of Elizabeth, and thought it no difficult task, under present appearances, to exercise that power indirectly, which hitherto she had enjoyed undisputed. The idea of being governed or being compelled to pay the deference of servitude, was absolutely intolerable, and she had already determined within herself, some half-dozen times, to make an effort that should at once bring to an issue the delicate point of her domestic condition. But as often as she met the dark, proud eye of Elizabeth, who was walking up and down the apartment, musing on the scenes of her youth and the change in her condition, and perhaps the events of the day, the housekeeper experienced an awe that she would not own to herself could be excited by anything mortal. It, however, checked her advances, and for some time held her tongue-tied. At length she determined to commence the discourse by entering on a subject that was apt to level all human distinctions and in which she might display her own abilities. It was quite a wordy sermon that Parson Grant gave us tonight, said Remarkable. The church ministers be commonly smart sermonizers, but they write down their ideas, which is a great privilege. I don't think that by nature they are as tonguey speakers for an offhand discourse as the standing order ministers. And what denomination do you distinguish as being the standing order? inquired Miss Temple with some surprise. Why, the Presbyterians and Congregationals and Baptists too, for till now, and all stitch as don't go on their knees to prayer. By that rule, then, you would call those who belong to the persuasion of my father the sitting order, observed Elizabeth. I'm not sure I ever heard him spoke of by any other name than Quaker so-called, returned Remarkable, betraying a slight uneasiness. I should be the last to call them otherwise, for I never in my life used a disparaging term of the judge or any of his family. I've always set store by the Quakers. They're so pretty-spoken, clever people. And it's a wonderment to me how your father come to marry into a church family, for they are as contrary in religion as can be. One sits still, and for the most part says nothing, while the church foals practice all kinds of ways, so that I sometimes think it quite musical to see them, for I went to a church meeting once before down country. You have found... An excellent in the church liturgy that was here to escape me. I will thank you to inquire whether the fire in my room burns. I feel fatigued from my journey, and will retire. Remarkable felt a wonderful inclination to tell the young mistress of the mansion that by opening a door she might see for herself. But prudence got the better of resentment, and after pausing, some little time as a salve to her dignity. 
she did as desired. The report was favorable, and the young lady, wishing Benjamin, who was filling the stove with wood, and the housekeeper, each a good night, withdrew. The instant the door closed on Miss Temple, Remarkable commenced a sort of mysterious, ambiguous discourse that was neither abusive nor commendatory of the qualities of the absent personage, but which seemed to be drawing nigh, by regular degrees, to a most dissatisfied description. The major-domo made no reply, but continued his occupation with great industry, which, being happily completed, he took a look at the thermometer, and then opening a drawer on the sideboard, he produced a supply of stimulants that would have served to keep the warmth in his system without the aid of the enormous fire he had been building. A small stand was drawn up near the stove, and the bottles and glasses necessary for convenience were quietly arranged. Two chairs were placed by the side of this comfortable situation, when Benjamin, for the first time, appeared to observe his companion. Come. Come, he cried. Come, Miss Bess Remarkable, bring yourself to a anchor on this chair. It's a peeler without, I can tell you, good woman. But what cares I? Blow high or blow low, do you see? It's all the same to Ben. The niggers are snug stowed below before a fire that would roast an ox hole. That thermometer stands at fifty-five. But if there's any virtue in good maple wood, I'll weather upon it before one glass as much as ten points more, so that the squire, when he comes home from Betty Hollister's warm room, will feel as hot as a hand that has been given the rigging a lick with bad tar. Come, mistress, bring up in this here chair, and tell me how you like our new heiress. Why, to my motion, Mr. Pengolin. Bump, bump, interrupted Benjamin. It is Christmas Eve, Mistress Remarkable, and so, d'ye see, you had better call me Pump. It's a shorter name, and I mean to pump this here decanter till it sucks. Why, you may as well call me Pump. Do you ever, cried Remarkable, with a laugh that seemed to unhinge every joint in her body. You're a musical creature, Benjamin, when the notion takes you. But as I was saying, I rather guess that times will be altered now in this house. Altered? exclaimed the major-domo, eyeing the bottle that was assuming the clear aspect of cut glass with astonishing rapidity. It don't matter much, Mistress Remarkable, so long as I keep the keys of the lockers in my pocket. I can't say, continued the housekeeper, but there's... Good eatables, and drinkables enough in the house for a body's content. A little more sugar, Benjamin, in the glass. For Squire Jones is an excellent provider. But new lords, new laws, and shouldn't I wonder if you and I had an uncertain time on't in footer. Life is uncertain as the wind blows, said Benjamin, with a moralizing air. And nothing is more variable than the wind, Mistress Remarkable. Unless you happen to fall in with the trades, do you see? And when you may run for the matter of a month at a time, with studding sails on both sides, a low and a loft, and with the cabin boy at the wheel. I know that life's a bit uncertain, said Remarkable, compressing her features to the humor of her companion. But I expect there will be great changes made in the house to rights, and that you will find a young man put over your head, as there is one that wants to be over mine. And after being settled as long as you have, Benjamin, I should judge that would be hard. Promotion should go according to late the service, and the major domo, and if so be, they had chipped a hand for my birth, a place a new steward aft, I shall throw up my commission in less time than you can put a pilot boat in stays. Top, Squire Dickon, this was a common misnomer with Benjamin, is a nice gentleman, and as good a man to sail as heart could wish. Yet I shall tell the squire, do you see, in plain English, as that's my native tongue, 
that if so be is thinking of putting any Johnny Raw over my head. Why, I shall resign. I began forward, Mistress Pettibones, and worked my way aft like a man. I was six months aboard a Garnsey lugger, hauling in the slack of the lee sheet and coiling up rigging. From that I went a few trips in a fore and after in the same trade, which, after all, was but a blind kind of sailing in the dark, where a man learns but little, excepting how to steer by the stars. Well, then, do you see? I learned how a topmast should be slushed, and how a topgallant sail was to be becketed. And when I did small jobs in the cabin, such as mixing the skipper's grog, twas there I got my case, which you must have often seen, is excellent. Well, here's better acquaintance to us. Remarkable nodded a return to the compliment, and took a sip of the beverage before her, for, provided it was well sweetened, she had no objection to a small potation now and then. After this observance of courtesy between the worthy couple, the dialogue proceeded. You have great experiences in life, Benjamin, for as the scripture says, they that go down in the sea in ships see the works of the Lord. Ay, for that matter, they in brigs and schooners too, and at Mott say, the works of the devil. The sea, Miss this Remarkable, is a great advantage to a man in the way of knowledge, for he sees the fashions of nations and the shape of a country. Now I suppose for myself here, who is but an unlearned man to some of the fellows of the seas, I suppose that, taking the coast from Cape Lerhog as low down as Cape Finish there, there isn't so much as a headline, or an island that I don't know either the name of it or something more or less about it. Take enough woman to color the water. Here's sugar. It's a sweet tooth, that fellow that you hold on upon yet, Miss Pettibones. But as I was saying, take the whole coast along. I know it as well as the way from here to the Pearl Dragoon, and a devil of acquaintance is the Bay of Biscay. Whew! I wish I could but hear the wind blow there. It's sometimes takes two to hold one man's hair on his head. Scuttling through the bay is pretty much the same as traveling the roads of this country up one side of a mountain and down the other. Do tell, exclaimed Remarkable. And does the sea run as high as the mountains, Benjamin? Well, I will tell, but first let's taste the grog. Mm, it's the right kind of stuff, I must say, that you keep in this country. But then... You're so close abroad, the West Indies. You make but small run of it. By the Lord Harry, woman, if Garnsey only lay somewhere between Cape Hatteras and the Bight of Logan, but you'd see rum cheap. And to the seas, they run more in uppers in the Bay of Biscay, unless it may be a sou'wester, when they tumble about quite handsomely. Though it's not in the narrow sea that you are to look for a swell. Just go off the western islands in a westerly blow, keeping the land on your larboard hand, with the ship's head to the southward, and bring to under a close reef topsail, or mayhap a reef topsail with a fore topmast staysail, and mizzen staysail to keep her up to the sea, if she will bear it, and I there for the matter of two watches if you want to see mountains. Why, good woman, I've been off there in the broadishly frigate, when you could see nothing but some such matter as a piece of sky, mayhap as big as the mainsail. And then again, there was a hole under your lee quarter, big enough to hold the whole British Navy. Oh, for massy's sake! And weren't you afraid, Benjamin? And how did you get off? Afeard? Who the devil do you think was to be frightened at a little salt water tumbling about his head? As of getting off, when we had enough of it, and had washed our decks down pretty well, we called all hands for to see the watch below was in their hammocks, all the same as if they were in one of your best bedrooms, 
and so we watched for a smooth time, clapped her helm hard a other, let fall the foresail, and got the tack aboard. And so, when we got her afore it, I ask you, Miss Pretty Bones, if she didn't walk, didn't she? I'm no liar, good woman, when I say I saw that ship jump from the top of one sea to another, just like one of these squirrels that fly, jumps from tree to tree. What? Clean out of the water? exclaimed Remarkable, lifting her two lank arms with her bony hands, spread in astonishment. It was no easy matter to get out of the water, good woman, for the spray flew so that you couldn't tell which was the sea or which was the cloud. So we kept her for it for the matter of two glasses. The first lieutenant, he couldn't the ship himself. And there was four quartermasters at the wheel, besides the master with six forecastle men in the gun room and the relieving tackles. But then she behaved herself so well. Oh, she was a sweet ship, mistress. That one frigate was worth more to live in than the best house in the island. If I was king of England, I'd have her hauled up to London Bridge and fit her up for a palace. Because why? If anybody can afford to live comfortably, his majesty can. Well, but Benjamin, cried the listener who was in an ecstasy of astonishment at his relation of the steward's dangers. What did you do? Do? Why, we did our duty like hardy fellows. Now, if the countrymen of Monsieur La Croix had been aboard her, they would have just struck her ashore on some of them small islands. But we run along the land until we found her dead to leeward off the mountains of Pico. And damn me, if I know to this day how we got there, whether we jumped over the island or hauled around it. But there we was, and there we lay under easy sail, for reaching first upon one tack and then the other, so as to poke her nose out now and then to take a look to windward, till the gale blowed its pipe out. I wonder now, exclaimed Remarkable, to whom most of the terms used by Benjamin were perfectly unintelligible, but who had got a confused idea of a raging tempest. It must be an awful life, that going to sea, and I don't feel astonishment that you are so affronted with the thoughts of being forced to quit a comfortable home like this. Not that that body cares m much for it, and there's more houses than one to live in. Why, when Judge agreed with me to come and live with him, I'd no more notion of stopping any time than anything. I happened in just to see how the family did about a week after Miss Temple died, thinking to be back home again night. But the family was in such a distressed way that I couldn't help but stop a while and help him on. I thought the situation a good one, and seeing that I was an unmarried body, and they were so much in want of help, I tarried. And a long time you left your anchors down in the same place, mistress. I think you must find that the ship rides easy. How you talk, Benjamin. There's no believing a word you say. I must say that the judge and Squire Jones have both acted quite clever so long. But I see now we shall have a specimen to the contrary. I heard say that the judge was gone a great board, and that he meant to bring his daughter home. But I didn't calculate on sich carryings on. To my motion, Benjamin, she's likely to turn out a dispute ugly gal. Ugly? echoed the major domo opening eyes that were beginning to close in a very suspicious sleepiness, in wide amazement. By the Lord, Larry, woman, I should as soon call the calling of the Britishy a clumsy frigate. What the devil would you have? Aren't her eyes as bright as the morning and evening stars? And isn't her hair as black and glistening as rigging 
that has just had a lick of tar? Doesn't she move as stately as a first rate in smooth water on a bowline? My woman, the figurehead of the broadishy was a fool to her, and that, as I've often heard the captain say, was an image of a great queen. And aren't queens always comely, woman? For who do you think would be a king and not choose a handsome bedfellow? Talk decent, Benjamin, said the housekeeper, or I won't keep your company. I don't gainsay her being comely to look on, but I maintain she's likely to show poor conduct. She seems to think her too good to talk to a body. From what Squire Jones had told me, I some expected to be quite captivated by her company. Now to my reckon, Louise Grant is much more pretty behaved than Betsy Temple. She wouldn't so much as hold discourse with me when I wanted to ask her how she felt on coming home and missing her mammy. Perhaps she didn't understand you, woman. You are none of the best lingister. And then Miss Lizzie has been exercising the king's English under a great lawn on lady, and for that matter can talk the language almost as well as myself or any native-born British subject. You've forgot your schooling. And the young mistress is a great scholar. Mistress, cried Remarkable, don't make one out to be a nigger, Benjamin. She's no mistress of mine and never will be. And as to speech, I hold myself as second to nobody out of New England. I was born and raised in Essex County, and I've heard say that the Bay State has proverbial from pronunciation. I've often heard that of the Bay State, said Benjamin, but can't say that I've ever been in it, nor do I know exactly where away it is that it lays. But I suppose there is a good anchorage in it, and that it's no bad place for the taking of a ling. But for size it can't be so much as a yaw to a sloop of war compared to the Bay of Biscay, or mayhap Torbay. And as for language, if you want to hear the dictionary overhauled like a long line in a blow, you must go whopping, and listen to the Londoners as they deal out their lingo. Whosoever I see so mighty matter that Miss Lizzie has been doing to you, good woman, so take another drop off your bruise and forgive and forget, like an honest soul. No, indeed, and I shan't do such a thing, Benjamin. This treatment is newity to me, and I won't put up with it. I have a hundred and fifty dollars at use, besides a bed and twenty sheep to good, and I don't crave to live in a house where a body mustn't call a young woman by her given name to her face. I will call her Betsy as much as I please. It's a free country, and no one can stop me. I did intend to stop while summer. But I shall quit tomorrow morning, and I will walk just as I please. For that matter, Mistress Remarkable, said Benjamin, there is none here that will contradict you, for I'm of opinion that it would be as easy to stop a hurricane with a Barcelona handkerchief as to bring up your tongue when the stopper's off. I say, good woman, do they grow many monkeys along the shore of that bay state? You're a monkey yourself, Mr. Penguin, cried the enraged housekeeper. Or a bear, a black, beastly bear. And ain't fit for a decent woman to stay with. I'll never keep your company again, sir, if I should live thirty years with the judge. Stitch talk is more befitting the kitchen than keeping room of a house of one who is well-to-do in the world. Look, you Miss Pity Patty Pretty Bones. Maybe I'm some such matter as a bear, as they will find who come to grapple with me. But damn me if I'm a monkey, a thing that chatters without knowing a word of what it says, a parrot that will hold a dialogue for what an honest man knows in a dozen languages, mayhap in the Bay State lingo, mayhap in Greek or High Dutch, but doesn't know what it means itself, can't answer me that, good woman. 
your midshipman can sing out and pass the word when the captain gives the order. But just send him adrift by himself and let him work the ship of his own head and stop my grog if you don't find all the Johnny Raws laughing at him. Stop my grog, indeed, said Remarkable, rising with great indignation and seizing a candle. You're groggy now, Benjamin, and I'll quit the room before I hear any misbecoming words from you. The housekeeper retired with a manner, but little less dignified, as she thought, than the heir of the heiress, muttering as she drew the door after her, with a noise like the report of a musket. The onobrious terms, drunkard, sot, and peace. What's that you say is drunk? cried Benjamin fiercely, rising and making a movement toward Remarkable. You talk of mustering yourself with a lady. You're just fit to grumble and find fault. Where that devil should you learn behavior and dictionary? In your damn bay estate? Ha! Benjamin here fell back in his chair and soon gave vent to certain ominous sounds, which resembled not a little the growling of his favorite animal, the bear, itself. Before, however, he was quite locked, to use the language that would suit the Della Cruscan humor of Captain Fine Minds of the present day, in the arms of Morpheus. He spoke aloud, observing due pauses between his epithets, the impressive terms of monkey, parrot, picnic tarpot, and lingusters. We shall not attempt to explain his meaning, nor correct his sentences and our readers must be satisfied with our informing them that they were expressed with all that coolness of contempt that a man might well be supposed to feel for a monkey. Nearly two hours passed in this sleep before the major domo was awakened by the noisy entrance of Richard, Major Hartman, and the master of the mansion. Benjamin so far rallied his confused faculties as to shape the course of the two former in the respective apartments, when he disappeared himself, leaving the task of securing the house to him who was most interested in its safety. Locks and bars were but little untended to in the early days of that settlement, and soon as Marmaduke had given an eye to the enormous fires of his dwelling, he retired. With this act of prudence closes the first night of our tale. End of chapter 15 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania In August of 2009
It was quite late in the morning before Elizabeth, observing the faint glow which appeared on the eastern mountain long after the light of the sun had struck the opposite hills, ventured from the house with a view to gratify her curiosity with a glance by daylight at the surrounding objects before the tardy revelers of the Christmas Eve should make their appearance at the breakfast table. While she was drawing the folds of her pelisse more closely around her form to guard against a cold that was yet great though rapidly yielding, in the small enclosure that opened in the rear of the house on a little thicket of low pines that were springing up where trees of a mightier growth had lately stood, she was surprised at the voice of Mr. Jones. "'Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas to you, Cousin Bess!' he shouted. "'Aha! An early riser, I see. But I knew I should steal a march on you. I never was in a house yet where I didn't get the first Christmas greeting on every soul in it, man, woman, and child, great and small, black, white, and yellow. But stop a minute till I can just slip on my coat.' You are about to look at the improvements, I see, which no one can explain so well as I, who planned them all. It will be an hour before Duke and Major can sleep off Mrs. Hollister's confounded distillations, and so I'll come down and go with you. Elizabeth turned and observed her cousin in his nightcap, with his head out of his bedroom window, where his zeal for preeminence in defiance of the weather had impelled him to thrust it. She laughed, and promising to wait for his company, re-entered the house, making her appearance again, holding in her hand a packet that was secured by several large and important seals, just in time to meet the gentleman. "'Come, Bessie, come!' he cried, drawing one of her arms through his own. "'The snow begins to give, but it will bear us yet.' Don't you snuff old Pennsylvania in the very air? This is a vile climate, girl. Now at sunset last evening, it was cold enough to freeze a man's zeal. And that, I tell you, takes a thermometer near zero for me. Then about nine or ten it began to moderate. At twelve it was quite mild. And here, all the rest of the night, I have been so hot as not to bear a blanket on the bed. Hola, Aggie! Merry Christmas! Aggie, I say, do you hear me? You black dog, there's a dollar for you, and if a gentleman met up before I come back, do you come out and let me know? I wouldn't have Duke get the start on me for the worth of your head. The black caught the money from the snow, and promising a due degree of watchfulness, he gave the dollar a whirl of twenty feet in the air, and catching it as it fell in the palm of his hand, he withdrew to the kitchen, to exhibit his present with a heart as light as his face was happy in its expression. "'Oh, rest easy, my dear cause,' said the young lady. "'I took a look in at my father, who is likely to sleep an hour, and by using due vigilance you will secure all the honors of the season.' "'Why, Duke is your father, Elizabeth. But Duke is a man who likes to be foremost.' even in trifles. Now, as for myself, I care for no such things, except in the way of competition, for a thing which is of no moment in itself may be made of importance in way of competition. So it is with your father. He loves to be first, but I only struggle with him as a competitor. It's all very clear, sir, said Elizabeth, you would not care a fig for distinction if there were no one in the world but yourself. But as there happens to be a great many others, why, you must struggle with them all in the way of competition. Exactly so. I see you are a clever girl, Bess, and one who does credit to our masters. It was my plan to send you to that school, for when your father first mentioned the thing, I wrote a private letter for advice to a judicious friend in the city, who recommended me the very school you went to. Duke was a little obstinate at first, as usual, but 
when he heard the truth, he was obliged to send you. Well, a truce, too. Duke's foible, sir. He is my father, and if you knew what he has been doing for you while you were in Albany, you would deal more tenderly with his character. For me? cried Richard, pausing a moment in his walk to reflect. Oh! He got the plans for the new Dutch meeting-house for me, I suppose. But I care very little about it, for a man of a certain kind of talent is seldom aided by any foreign suggestions. His own brain is the best architect. No such thing, said Elizabeth, looking provokingly, knowing. No? Well, let me see. Perhaps he had my name put in the bill for the new turnpike, as a director? He might possibly, but it is no such an appointment that I allude. Such an appointment? repeated Mr. Jones, who began to fidget with curiosity. Then it is an appointment. If it is in the militia, I won't take it. No, no, it's not the militia, cried Elizabeth showing the packet in her hand and then drawing it back with a coquettish air. It is an office of both honor and emolument. Honor and emolument? echoed Richard, in painful suspense. Show me the paper, girl. Say, is it an office where there is anything to do? You have hit it, Cousin Dickon. It is the executive office of the county. At least so said my father when he gave me this packet to offer you as a Christmas box. Surely, if anything will please Dickon, he said, it will be to fill the executive chair of the county. Executive chair? What nonsense! cried the impatient gentleman, snatching the packet from her hand. There is no such office in the county. Eh, what? It is, I declare, a commission appointing Richard Jones, Esquire, Sheriff of the County. Well, this is kind in Duke. Positively, I must say, Duke has a warm heart and never forgets his friends. Sheriff! High Sheriff of... It sounds well, best, it shall execute better. Duke is a judicious man, after all, and knows human nature thoroughly. I'm much obliged to him, continued Richard, using the skirt of his coat unconsciously to wipe his eyes, though I would do as much for him any day, and he shall see if I have an opportunity to perform any of the duties of my office on him. It shall be done. Cousin Bess, it shall be done, I say. How this cursed south wind makes one's eyes water. Now, Richard said the laughing maiden. Now I think you will find something to do. I have often heard you complain of old that there was nothing to do in this new country, while to my eyes it seemed as if everything remained to be done. Do? echoed Richard, who blew his nose, raised his little form to its greatest elevation, and looked serious. Everything depends on system, girl. I shall sit down this afternoon and systematize the county. I must have deputies, you know. I will divide the county into districts over which I will place my deputies, and I will have one for the village, which I will call my home department. Let me see. Oh, Benjamin, yes, will make a good deputy. He has been naturalized and would answer admirably if he could only ride on horseback. Yes, Mr. Sheriff, said his companion, and as he understands ropes so well, he would be very expert should occasion happen for his services in another way. No, interrupted the other. I flatter myself that no man could hang a man better than that is. Ah, uh, oh, yes, Benjamin would do extremely well in such an unfortunate dilemma, if he could be persuaded to attempt it. But should I despair of the thing, I could never induce him to hang or teach him to ride on horseback. I must seek another deputy. Well, sir, 
as you have abundant leisure for all these important affairs, I beg that you will forget that you are high sheriff, and devote some little of your time to gallantry. Where are the beauties and improvements which you were to show me? Where? What? Everywhere. Here, I have laid out some of new streets, and when they are open, and the trees felled, and they are all built up, will they not make a fine town? Well, Duke is a liberal-hearted fellow, with all his stubbornness. Yes, yes, I must have at least four deputies, besides a jailer. I see no streets in the direction of our walk, said Elizabeth, unless you call the short avenues through these pine bushes by that name. Surely you do not contemplate building houses very soon in that forest before us and in those swamps? We must run our streets by the compass, cuz, and disregard trees, hills, ponds, slumps, or in fact, anything but posterity such is the will of your father and your father you know hath made you sheriff mr jones interrupted the lady with a tone that said very plainly to the gentleman that he was touching a forbidden subject i know it i know it cried richard and if it were in my power i'd make duke a king he's a noble-hearted fellow and would make an excellent king that is if he had a good prime minister but who have we here? Voices in the bushes? A combination about mischief? I'll wager my commission. Let us draw near and examine a little into the manor. During this dialogue, as the parties had kept in motion, Richard and his cousin advanced some distance from the house into the open space in the rear of the village, where, as may be gathered from the conversation, streets were planned and future dwellings contemplated, but where, in truth, the only mark of improvement that was to be seen was a neglected clearing along the skirt of a dark forest of mighty pines, over which the bushes or sprouts of the same tree had sprung up to a height that interspersed the fields of snow with little thickets of evergreen. The rushing of the wind as it whistled through the tops of these mimic trees prevented the footsteps of the pair from being heard while the branches concealed their persons. Thus aided, the listeners drew nigh to a spot where the young hunter, Leatherstocking, and the Indian chief were collected in an earnest consultation. The former was urgent in his manner, and seemed to think the subject of deep importance, while Natty appeared to listen with more than his usual attention to what the other was saying. Mohican stood a little on one side, with his head sunken on his chest, his hair falling forward so as to conceal most of his features, and his whole attitude expressive of deep dejection, if not shame. Let us withdraw, whispered Elizabeth. We are intruders, and can have no right to listen to the secrets of these men. No right? returned Richard a little impatiently in the same tone, and drawing her arm so forcefully through his own as to prevent her retreat, you forget, cousin, that it is my duty to preserve the peace of the county and see the laws executed. These wanderers frequently commit depredations, though I do not think John would do anything secretly. Poor fellow, he was quite boozy last night, and hardly seems to be over it yet. Let us draw nigher and hear what they say. Notwithstanding the lady's reluctance, Richard, stimulated doubtless by his sense of duty, prevailed, and they were soon near, as distinctly to hear sounds. The bird must be had, said Natty, by fair means or foul. Hi-ho! I've known the time, lad, when the wild turkeys wasn't over scarce in the country though you must go to the Virginia Gaps if you want them now. To be sure, there's a different taste to a partridge and a well-fatted turkey, though to my eating, beaver's tail and bear's ham make the best food. But then everyone has his own appetite. I gave the last farthing all to that shilling to the French trader this very morning, as I came through town for powder. So, as you have nothing... We can have but one shot for it. 
I know that Billy Kirby is out and means to have a pull of the trigger at that very turkey. John has a true eye for a single fire, and somehow my hand shakes so when I have to do anything extraordinary that I often lose my aim. Now, when I killed the she-bear this fall with her cubs, though, they were so mighty ravenous, I knocked them over one at a shot and loaded while I dodged the trees in the bargain. But this is a very different thing, Mr. Oliver. This, cried the young man with an accent that sounded as if he took a bitter pleasure in his poverty, while he held a shilling up before his eyes. This is all the treasure that I possess. This is my rifle now. Indeed, I have become a man of the woods and must place my sole dependence on the chase. Come, Natty, let us stake the last penny for the bird. With your aim, I cannot fail to be successful. I would rather it be John, lad. My heart jumps into my mouth because you sent your mind so much out, and I'm certain that I shall miss the bird. These Indians can shoot one time as well as another. Nothing ever troubles them. I say, John, here's a shilling. Take my rifle and get a shot at the big turkey they put up on the stump. Mr. Oliver is over-anxious for the creature, and I'm sure to do nothing when I have over-anxiety about it. The Indian turned his head gloomily, and after looking keenly for a moment in profound silence at his companions, he replied, When John was young, eyesight was not straighter than his bullet. The Mingo squalls cried out at the sound of his rifle. The Mingo warriors were made squaws. When did he ever shoot twice? The eagle went above the clouds when he passed the wigwam of Chingachgook. His feathers were plenty with the woman. But see, he said, raising his voice from the low, mournful tones in which he had spoken to a pitch of keen excitement, and stretching forth both hands, they shake like a deer at the wolf's howl. Is John old? One was a Mohican, a squaw, with seventy winters. No, the white man brings old age with him. Rum is his tomahawk. Why, then, do you use it, old man? exclaimed the young hunter. Why will one so noble by nature aid the devices of the devil by making himself a beast? Beast? Is John a beast? replied the Indian slowly. Yes, you say no lie, child of the fire-eater. John is a beast. The smokes were once few in these hills. The deer would lick the hand of a white man, and the birds rest on his head. They were strangers to him. My fathers came from the shores of the salt lake. They fled before rum. They came to their grandfather, and they lived in peace. Or when they did raise the hatchet, it was to strike the bray of a minko. They gathered around council fire. And what they said was done. Then John was a man. But warriors and traitors with light eyes followed them. One brought the long knife, and one brought rum. They were more than the pines of the mountains, and they broke up the councils and took the lands. The evil spirit was in their jugs, and they let him loose. Yes, you say no lie. Young Eagle, John, is a Christian beast. Forgive me, old warrior, cried the youth, grasping his hand. I should be the last to approach you. The curses of heaven light on the cupidity that has destroyed such a race. Remember, John, that I am of your family, and it is now my greatest pride. The muscles of Mohican relaxed a little, and he said more mildly, You are a Delaware. My son, your words are not heard. John cannot shoot. I thought that lad had Indian blood in him, whispered Richard, by the awkward way he had to my horses last night. You see, cuz, they never use harness. But the poor fellow shall have two shots at the turkey if he wants it, for I'll give him another shilling myself, though perhaps I had better offer to shoot for him. They have got up their Christmas sports, I find, in the bushes yonder, where you hear the laughter. 
though it's a queer taste this chap has for turkey, not but what it good eating, too. Oh, cousin Richard, exclaimed Elizabeth, clinging to his arm, would it be delicate to offer a shilling to that gentleman? Gentleman again? Do you think a half-breed like him will refuse money? No, no, girl. He will take the shilling, ay, and even rum, too. Notwithstanding, he moralizes so much about it. But I'll give the lad a chance for his turkey, for that Billy Kirby is one of the best marksmen in the country, that is, if we accept the gentleman. Then, said Elizabeth, who found her strength unequal to her will, then, sir, I will speak. She advanced with an air of determination in front of her cousin, and entered the little circle of bushes that surrounded the trio of hunters. Her appearance startled the youth, who at first made an unequivocal motion toward retiring, but recollecting himself bowed by lifting his cap, and resumed his attitude of leaning on his rifle. Neither Natty nor Mohican betrayed any emotion, though the appearance of Elizabeth was so entirely unexpected. I find, she said, that the old Christmas sport of shooting the turkey is yet in use among you. I feel inclined to try my chance for a bird. Which of you will take this money, and after paying my fee, give me the aid of his rifle? Is this sport for a lady? exclaimed the young hunter, with an emphasis that could not well be mistaken, and with a rapidity that showed he spoke without consulting anything but feeling. Why not, sir, if it be inhumane? The sin is not confined to one sex only. But I have my humor as well as others. I ask not your assistance, but, turning to Natty and dropping a dollar in his hand, this whole veteran of the forest will not be so ungallant as to refuse one fire for a lady. Leather Stocking dropped the money into his pouch, and throwing up the end of his rifle, he freshened his priming and first, laughing in his usual manner, he threw the piece over his shoulder and said, If Bill Kirby don't get the bird before me, and the Frenchman's powder don't hang fire damp this morning, you'll see as fine a turkey dead in a few minutes as ever was eaten in the judge's shanty. I have knowed the Dutch woman on the Mohawk, and Shohari count greatly on coming to the merry-makings, and so, lad, you shouldn't be short with the lady. Come, let us go forward, for if we wait, the finest bird will be gone. But I have a right before you, Natty, and shall try my own luck first. You will excuse me, Miss Temple. I have much reason to wish that bird, and may seem ungallant, but I must claim my privileges. Claim everything that is justly your own, sir, returned the lady. We are both adventurers, and this is my knight. I trust my fortune to his hand and eye. Lead on, Sir Leatherstocking, and we will follow. Natty, who seemed pleased with the frank address of the young and beauteous Elizabeth, who had so singularly interested him with such a commission, returned the bright smile with which she had addressed him, by his own particular mark of mirth and moved across the snow toward the spot whence the sounds of boisterous mirth proceeded, with the long strides of a hunter. His companions followed in silence, the youth casting frequent and uneasy glances toward Elizabeth, who was detained by a motion from Richard. "'I should think, Miss Temple,' he said, so soon as the others were out of hearing, "'that if you really wished a turkey, we would not have taken a stranger for the office.' and such one as Leatherstocking. But I can hardly believe that you are serious, for I have fifty at this moment shut up in the coops, in every stage of fat, so that you might choose any quality you pleased. There are six that I am trying an experiment on by giving them brickbats with— Enough, Cousin Dickon, interrupted the lady. I do wish the bird, and it is because I wish that I commissioned— Mr. Leatherstocking. Did you ever hear of the great shot that I made of the wolf, 
cousin Elizabeth, who was carrying off your father's sheep, said Richard, drawing himself with an air of displeasure. He had the sheep on his hack, and had the head of the wolf between on the other side. I should have killed him dead, as it was. You killed the sheep. I know it all, dear cause. What would have been disastrous for this high sheriff of to mingle with such sports as these? Surely you did not think that I intended actually to fire with my own hands, said Mr. Jones. But let us follow and see the shooting. There is no fear of anything unpleasant occurring to a female in this new country, especially to your father's daughter and in my presence. My father's daughter fears nothing, sir, more especially when escorted by the highest executive officer in the county. She took his arm, and he led her through the mazes of the bushes to the spot where most of the young men of the village were collected for the sport of shooting a Christmas match, and whither Natty and his companions had already preceded them. End of chapter 16 this reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in August of 2009. Chapter 17 of the Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 17 Quote, I guess, by all this quaint array, the burghers hold their sports today. Unquote. By Scott. The ancient amusement of shooting the Christmas turkey is one of the few sports that the settlers of a new country seldom or never neglect to observe. It was connected with the daily practices of a people who often laid aside the axe or the sigh to seize the rifle as the deer glided through the forest they were felling, or the bear entered their rough meadows to scent the air of a clearing and to scan with a look of sagacity the progress of the invader. On the present occasion, the usual amusement of the day had been a little hastened in order to allow a fair opportunity to Mr. Grant whose exhibition was not less a treat to the young sportsmen than the one which engaged their present attention. The owner of the birds was a free black, who had prepared for the occasion a collection of game that was admirably qualified to inflame the appetite of an epicure, and was well adapted to the means and skill of the different competitors, who were of all ages he had offered the younger and more humble marksmen divers birds of an inferior quality, and some shooting had already taken place, much to the compuniary advantage of the sable owner of the game. The order of the sports was extremely simple and well understood. The bird was fastened by a string to the stump of a large pine, the side of which, toward the point where the marksman were placed, had been flattened with an axe in order that it might serve the purpose of a target, by which the merit of each individual might be ascertained. The distance between the stump and the shooting stand was one hundred measured yards, a foot more or a foot less, being thought an invasion of the right of one of the parties. The negro affixed his own price to every bird and the terms of the chance. But when these were once established, he was obliged by the strict principles of public justice that prevailed in the country to admit any adventurer who might offer. The throng consisted of some twenty or thirty young men, most of whom had rifles, 
and a collection of boys in the village. The little urchins, clad in coarse but warm garments, stood gathered around the more distinguished marksmen, with their hands stuck under their waistbands, listening eagerly to the boastful stories of skill that had been exhibited on former occasions, and were already emulating in their hearts these wonderful deeds of gunnery. The chief speaker was the man who had been mentioned by Natty as Billy Kirby, the fellow whose occupation when he did labor was that of clearing lands or chopping jobs, was of great stature, and carried in his very air the index of his character. He was a noisy, boisterous, reckless lad, whose good-natured eye contradicted the bluntness and bullying tenor of his speech. For weeks he would lounge around the taverns of the county, in a state of perfect idleness, or doing small jobs for his liquor and his meals, and caviling with applicants about the prices of his labor, frequently preferring idleness to an abatement of a little of his independence, or a cent in his wages. But, when these embarrassing points were satisfactorily arranged, he would shoulder his axe and rifle, slip his arms through the straps of his pack, and enter the woods with the tread of a Hercules. His first object was to learn his limits, round which he would pace occasionally, freshening with a blow of his axe the marks on the boundary trees, and then he would proceed with an air of great deliberation to the center of his premises, and, throwing aside his superfluous garments, measure with a knowing eye one or two of the nearest trees that were towering apparently into the very clouds as he gazed upward, commonly selecting one of the most noble for the first trial of his power, he would approach it with a listless air, whistling a low tune, and wielding his axe with a certain flourish, not unlike the salutes of a fencing master, he would strike a light blow into the bark and measure his distance. The pause that followed was ominous of the fall of the forest which had flourished there for centuries. The heavy and brisk blows that he struck were soon succeeded by the thundering report of the tree, as it came first cracking and threatening with the separation of its own last ligaments, then threshing and tearing with its branches the tops of its surrounding brethren, and finally meeting the ground with a shock but little inferior to an earthquake. From that moment the sounds of the axe were ceaseless, while the failing of the trees was like a distant cannonading, and the daylight broke into the depths of the woods with the suddenness of a winter morning. For days, weeks, nay, months, Bill Kirby would toil with an ardor that evinced his native spirit and with an effect that seemed magical, until his chopping being ended, his stentorian lungs could be heard emitting sounds as he called to his patient oxen, which rang through the hills like cries of an alarm. He had been often heard on a midsummer evening, a long mile across the Vale of Templeton, when the echoes from the mountains would take up his cries until they died away, in the feeble sounds from the distant rocks that overhung the lake. His piles, or to use the language of the country, his logging ended, with a dispatch that could only accompany his dexterity and Herculean strength. The jobber would collect together his implements of labor, light the heaps of lumber, and march away under the blaze of the prostrate forest, like the conqueror of some city who, having first prevailed over his adversary, applies the torch as the finishing blow to his conquest. For a long time Billy Kirby would then be seen soldering around the taverns, the rider of scrub races, the bully of cockfights, and not infrequently the hero of such sports as the one in hand. Between him and the leather stalking there had long existed a jealous rivalry on the point of skill with the rifle. Notwithstanding the long practice of Natty, it was commonly supposed that the steady nerves and the quick eye of the woodchopper rendered him his equal. The competition had, however, 
been confined hitherto to boasting, and comparisons made from their successes in various hunting excursions. But this was the first time they had ever come in open collision. A good deal of higgling about the price of the choicest bird had taken place between Billy Kirby and its owner, before Natty and his companions rejoined the sportsman. It had, however, been settled at one shilling a shot, which was the highest sum ever extracted. Footnote. Before the Revolution, each province had its own money of account, though neither coined any but copper pieces. In New York, the Spanish dollar was divided into eight shillings, each of the value of a fraction more than sixpence sterling. At present, the Union has provided a decimal system, with coins to represent it. Unquote. The black, taking care to protect himself from losses as much as possible by the conditions of the sport, the turkey was already fastened at the mark, but its body was entirely hid by the surrounding snow, nothing being visible but its red swelling head and its long neck. If the bird was injured by any bullet that struck below the snow, it was to continue the property of its present owner. But if a feather was touched in a visible part, the animal became the prize of the successful adventurer. These terms were loudly proclaimed by the negro, who was seated in the snow in a somewhat hazardous vicinity to his favorite bird, when Elizabeth and her cousin approached the noisy sportsman. The sounds of mirth and contention sensibly lowered at this unexpected visit, but, after a moment's pause, the curious interest exhibited in the face of the young lady, together with her smiling air, restored the freedom of the mooring, though it was somewhat chastened, both in language and vehemence, by the presence of such a spectator. "'Stand out the way, bear boys!' cried the woodchopper, who was placing himself at the shooting point. "'Stand out the way, you little rascals, or I'll shoot you through! Now, Brom, take leave of your turkey!' "'Stop!' cried the young hunter. "'I am a candidate for a chance. Here is my shilling, Brom. I wish to shoot, too!' "'You may wish it in welcome!' cried Kirby. "'But if I ruffle the gobbler's feathers... How are you to get it? Is money so plenty in your deerskin pocket that you pay for a chance that you may never have? You know, sir, how plenty money is in my pocket, said the youth fiercely. Here is my shilling, Brom, and I claim a right to shoot. Don't be crabbed, my boy, said the other, who was coolly fixing his flint. They say you have a hole in your left shoulder yourself, so I think Brom may give you a fire for half price. It will take a keen one to hit that bird. I can tell you, my lad, even if I give you a chance, which is what I have no mind to do. Don't be boasting, Billy Kirby, said Natty, throwing the breech of his rifle into the snow and leaning on its barrel. You'll get but one shot at the creature for if the lad misses his aim, which wouldn't be a wonder if he did, with his arms so stiff and sore, you'll find a good piece and an old eye coming at her you. Maybe it's time that I can't shoot as I used to could, but a hundred yards is a short distance for a long rifle. What? Old leather stocking? Are you out this morning? cried his reckless opponent. Well, fair play's a jewel. I've the lead of you, old fellow, so here goes for a dry throat or a good dinner. The countenance of the negro evinced not only all the interest which his pecuniary adventure might occasion, but also the keen excitement that the sport produced in the others, though with a very different wish as to the result. While the woodchopper was slowly and steadily raising his rifle, he bawled, Fair, pl fair play! Billy Kirby, stand back! Make him stand back, boys! Give a nigger fair play! Pass up, gobbler! Shake a head, fool! Don't you see him taking aim? These cries, 
which were intended as much to distract the attention of the marksman as for anything else, were fruitless. The nerves of the woodchopper were not so easily shaken, and he took his aim with the utmost deliberation. Stillness prevailed for a moment, and he fired. The head of the turkey was seen to dash on one side, and its wings were spread in momentarily fluttering, but it settled itself down calmly into its bed of snow and glanced its eyes uneasily around. For a time, long enough to draw a deep breath, not a sound was heard. The silence was then broken by the noises of the negro who laughed and shook his body with all kinds of antics, rolling over in the snow in the excess of delight. "'Well done, gobbler!' he cried, jumping up and affecting to embrace his bird. I tell him to pass up, and you see him dodge. Give another shilling, Billy, and how but not a shot. No, the shot is mine, said the young hunter. You have my money already. Leave the mark and let me try my luck. Ah, oh, it's but money thrown away, lad, said Leatherstocking. A turkey's head and neck is but a small mark for a new hand and a lame shoulder. You'd best let me take the fire, and maybe we can make some settlement with the lady about the bird. The chance is mine, said the young hunter. Clear the ground that I may take it. The discussions and disputes concerning the last shot were now abating, it having been determined that if the turkey's head had been anywhere but just where it was at that moment, the bird must certainly have been killed. There was not much excitement produced by the preparations of the youth, who proceeded in a hurried manner to take his aim, and was in the act of pulling the trigger when he was stopped by Natty. "'Your hand shakes, lad,' he said, "'and you seem over-eager. Bullet wounds are apt to weaken flesh, and to my judgment you'll not shoot so well as in common. If you fire... You should shoot quick before there is time to shake off the aim. Fair play, again shouted the negro. Fair play, give a nigger fair play. What right at Nat Bumpo advise a young man? Let him shoot clear a ground. The youth fired with great rapidity, but no motion was made by the turkey, and when the examiners for the ball returned from the mark, they declared that he had missed the stump. Elizabeth observed the change in his countenance, and could not help feeling surprised that one so evidently superior to his companions should feel a trifling loss so sensibly. But her own champion was now preparing to enter the list. The mirth of Brom, who had been again excited, though in a much smaller degree than before by the failure of the second adventurer, vanished the instant Natty took his stand. His skin became mottled with large brown spots that fearfully sullied the luster of his native ebony, while his enormous lips gradually compressed around two rows of ivory that had hitherto been shining in his visage like pearls set in jet. His nostrils, at all times the most conspicuous feature of his face, dilated until they covered the greater part of the diameter of his countenance, while his brown and bony hands unconsciously grasped the snow crust near him, the excitement of the moment completely overcoming his native dread of cold. While these indications of apprehension were exhibited in the sable owner of the turkey, the man who gave rise to this extraordinary emotion was as calm and collected, as if there was not to be a single spectator of his skill. "'I was down in the Dutch settlements on the Skokery, said Natty, carefully removing the leather garb from the lock of his rifle, just before the breaking out of the last war, and there was a shooting match among the boys, so I took a hand. I think it opened a good many Dutch eyes that day, when I won the powder horn, three bars of lead, and a pound of as good powder as ever flashed in pan. Lord! How they did swear in German! They did tell me of one drunken Dutchman who said he'd have the life of me before I got back to the lake again. 
but if he had put his rifle to his shoulder with evil intent, God would have punished him for it, and even if the Lord didn't, and he had missed his aim, I know one that would have given him as good as he sent, and better too, if good shooting could come into the count. By this time, the old hunter was ready for his business, and throwing his right leg far behind him, and stretching his left arm along the barrel of his piece, he raised it toward the bird. Every eye glanced rapidly for the marksman to the mark, but at the moment when each ear was expecting the report of the rifle, they were disappointed by the ticking sound of the flint. "'A snap! A snap!' shouted the negro, springing from his crouching posture like a madman before his bird. A snap good as far, Natty Bumpo, gun the snap. Natty Bumpo, miss a turkey. Natty Bumpo, hit a nigger, said the indignant old hunter. If you don't get out of the way, Brom, it's contrary to the reason of the thing, boy, that a snap should count for a fire when one is nothing more than a firestone striking a steel pan and the other is sudden death. So get out of my way, boy, and let me show Billy Kirby how to shoot a Christmas turkey. Give a nigger fair play, cried the black, who continued resolutely to maintain his post, and making an appeal to the justice of his auditors, which the degraded condition of his cast so naturally suggested. Everybody know that snap is good as fire. Leave it to Massa Joan. Leave it to Lady. Sartin, said the woodchopper. It's the law of the game in this part of the country, leather stocking. If you fire again, you must pay up the other shilling. I believe I'll try luck once more myself. So, Brom, here's my money, and I take the next fire. It is likely you know the laws of the woods better than I do, Billy Kirby, returned Natty. You come in with the settlers with an ox goad in your hand and I come in with moccasins on my feet, and with a good rifle on my shoulder, so long back as afore the old war, which is likely to know the best. I so no man need tell me that snapping is as good a firing when I pull the trigger. Leave it to Massa Joan, said the alarmed negro. He know everything. This appeal to the knowledge of Richard was too flattering to be unheeded. He therefore advanced a little from the spot whither the delicacy of Elizabeth had induced her to withdraw, and gave the following opinion with the gravity that the subject and his own rank demanded. There seems to be a difference in opinion, he said, on the subject of Nathaniel Bumpo's right to shoot at Abraham Freeborn's turkey, without the said Nathaniel paying one shilling for the privilege. The fact was too evident to be denied, and after pausing a moment, that the audience might digest his premises, Richard proceeded. It seems proper that I should decide this question, as I am bound to preserve the peace of the country, and men with deadly weapons in their hands should not be heedlessly left to contention and their own malignant passions. It appears that there was no agreement either in writing or in words, on the disputed point. Therefore, we must reason from analogy, which is, as it were, comparing one thing with another. Now, in duels, where both parties shoot, it is generally the rule that a snap is a fire. And, if such is the rule, where the party has a right to fire back again, it seems to me unreasonable to say that a man may stand snapping at a defenseless turkey all day. I, therefore, am of the opinion that Nathaniel Bumpo has lost his chance and must pay another shilling before he renews his right. As this opinion came from so high a quarter and was delivered with effect, it silenced all murmurs, for the whole of the spectators had begun to take sides with great warmth, except from the leather stocking himself. I think Miss Elizabeth's thoughts should be taken, said Natty. I've known the squaws give very good counsel when the Indians had been dumbfounded. If she says that I ought to lose, I agree to give it up. Then I judge you to be the loser for this time, said Miss Temple. 
but pay your money and renew your chance. Unless Bourne will sell me the bird for a dollar, I will give him the money and save the life of the poor victim. This proposition was evidently but little relished by any of the listeners. Even the negro, feeling the evil excitement of the chances in the meanwhile, as Billy Kirby was preparing himself for another shot, Natty left the stand with an extremely dissatisfied manner, muttering, There hasn't been such a good thing as a flint sold at the foot of the lake since the Indian traders used to come to the country, and if a body should go into the flats along the streams and the hills to hunt for such a thing, it's ten to one, but they will all be all covered up with the plow. Hi-ho! It seems to me that just as the game grows scarce and everybody wants the best ammunition to get a livelihood, everything that's bad falls on him like a judgment. But I'll change the stone, for Billy Kirby hasn't had the eye for such a mark. I know. The woodchopper seemed now entirely sensible that his reputation depended on his care, nor did he neglect any means to ensure success. He drew up his rifle and renewed his aim again and again, still appearing reluctant to fire. No shout was heard from even Brom during these portentous movements, until Kirby discharged the piece with the same want of success as before. Then, indeed, the shouts of the negro rang through the bushes and sounded among the trees of the neighboring forest like the outcries of a tribe of Indians. He laughed, rolling his head first on one side and then on the other, until nature seemed exhausted with mirth. He danced until his legs were wearied with motion in the snow, and in short, he exhibited all that violence of joy that characterizes the mirth of a thoughtless negro. The woodchopper had exerted all his art and felt a proportionate degree of disappointment at the failure. He first examined the bird with the utmost attention, and more than once suggested that he had touched its feathers. But the voice of the multitude was against him, for it felt disposed to listen to the often repeated cries of the black to give a nigger fair play. Finding it impossible to make out a title to the bird, Kirby turned fiercely to the black and said, Shut you oven, you crow! Where is the man that can hit a turkey's head at a hundred yards? I was a fool for trying! You needn't make an uproar like falling pine tree about it. Show me the man who can do it! Look this away, Billy Kirby, said Leatherstocking and let them clear the mark, and I'll show you a man who's made better shots afore now, and that when he's been hard-pressed by the savages and wild beast. Perhaps there is one of those rights come before ours, Leatherstocking, said Miss Temple. If so, we will waive our privilege. If it be me that you have reference to, said the young hunter, I shall decline another chance. My shoulder is yet weak, I find. Elizabeth regarded his manner, and thought that she could discern a tinge on his cheek that spoke of the shame of conscious poverty. She said no more, but suffered her own champion to make a trial. Although Natty Bumpo had certainly made hundreds of more momentous shots at his enemies or his game, yet he never exerted himself more to excel. He raised his piece three, several times, once to get his range, once to calculate his distance, and once, because the bird, alarmed by the death-like stillness, turned its head quickly to examine its foes. But the fourth time he fired. The smoke, the report, and the momentary shock prevented most of the spectators from instantly knowing the result. But Elizabeth, when she saw her champion, drop the end of his rifle in the snow and open his mouth in one of its silent laughs, and then proceed very coolly to recharge his piece, knew that he had been successful. 
the boys rushed to the mark and lifted the turkey on high, lifeless, and with nothing but the remnant of a head. "'Bring in the creature,' said Leatherstocking, "'and put it at the feet of the lady. "'I was her deputy in the matter, and the bird is her property.' "'And a good deputy you have proved yourself,' returned Elizabeth. "'So good, Cousin Richard, that I would advise you to remember his qualities.' She paused, and the gaiety that beamed on her face gave place to a more serious earnestness. She even blushed a little as she turned to the young hunter, and with the charm of a woman's manner added, but it was only to see an exhibition of the far-famed skill of leather-stalking that I tried my fortunes. Will you, sir, accept the bird as a small peace offering for the hurt that prevented your own success? The expression with which the youth received this presentment was indescribable. He appeared to yield to the blandishment of her air in opposition to a strong impulse to the contrary. He bowed and raised the victim silently from her feet, but continued silent. Elizabeth handed the black piece of silver as a remuneration for his loss, which had some effect in again unbending his muscles, and then expressed to her companion her readiness to return homeward. "'Wait a minute, Cousin Bess,' cried Richard. There is an uncertainty about the rules of this sport that is proper I should remove. If you will appoint a committee, gentlemen, to wait on me this morning, I will draw up in writing a set of regulations. He stopped with some indignation, for at that instant a hand was laid familiarly on the shoulder of the high sheriff of— A Merry Christmas to you, Cousin Deacon, said Judge Temple who had approached the party unperceived. I must have a vigilant eye to my daughter, sir, if you are to be seized daily from these gallant fits. I admire the taste with which you introduce the lady to such scenes. It is her own perversity, Duke, cried the disappointed sheriff, who felt the loss of the first salutation as grievously as many a man would a much greater misfortune. And I must say that she comes honestly by it. I let her out to show her the improvements, but away she scampered through the snow at the first sound of firearms, the same as if she had been brought up in a camp instead of a first-rate boarding school. I do think, Judge Temple, that such dangerous amusements should be suppressed by statute. Nay, I doubt whether they are not already indictable at common law. Well, sir, as you are sheriff of the county, it becomes your duty to examine into the matter, returned the smiling Marmaduke. I perceive that Bess has executed her commission, and I hope it met with a favorable reception. Richard glanced his eyes at the packet which he held in his hand, and the slight anger produced by disappointment vanished instantly. Ah, oh, Duke, my fair cousin! he said. Step a little on one side. I have something I will say to you. Marmaduke complied, and the sheriff led him a little distance in the bushes and continued. First, Duke, let me thank you for your friendly interest with the council and the governor, without which I am confident that the greatest merit would avail but little. But we are sisters' children, and you may use me like one of your horses, ride me or drive me. Duke, I am wholly yours. But in my humble opinion, this young companion of leather-stalking requires looking after. He has a very dangerous propensity for turkey. Leave him to my management, Dickon, said the judge, and I will cure his appetite by indulgence. It is with him that I would speak. Let us rejoin the sportsman. End of chapter 17 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in September of 2009.
Chapter 18 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 18 Poor wretch! The mother that him bare, if she had been in presence there, in his wan face and sunburnt hair, she had not known her child. Scott It diminished in no degree the effect produced by the conversation which passed between Judge Temple and the young hunter, that the former took the arm of his daughter and drew it through his own when he advanced from the spot whither Richard had led him to that where the youth was standing, leaning on his rifle, and contemplating the dead bird at his feet. The presence of Marmaduke did not interrupt the sports, which were resumed by loud and clamorous disputes concerning the conditions of a chance that involved the life of a bird of much inferior quality to the last. Leatherstocking and Mohegan had alone drawn aside to their youthful companion, and, although in the immediate vicinity of such a throng, the following conversation was heard only by those who were interested in it. I have greatly injured you, Mr. Edwards, said the judge, but the sudden and inexplicable start with which the person spoken to received this unexpected address caused him to pause a moment. As no answer was given, and the strong emotion exhibited in the countenance of the youth gradually passed away, he continued, But fortunately it is in some measure in my power to compensate you for what I have done. My kinsman, Richard Jones, has received an appointment that will, in future, deprive me of his assistance, and leave me just now destitute of one who might greatly aid me with his pen. Your manner, notwithstanding appearances, is a sufficient proof of your education, nor will thy shoulder suffer thee to labor for some time to come. Marmaduke insensibly relapsed into the language of the friends as he grew warm. My doors are open to thee, my young friend, for in this infant country we harbor no suspicions, little offering to tempt the cupidity of the evil disposed. Become my assistant, for at least a season, and receive such compensation as thy services will deserve. There was nothing in the manner of the offer of the judge to justify the reluctance, amounting nearly to loathing, with which the youth listened to his speech. But, after a powerful effort for self-command, he replied, I would serve you, sir, or any other man, for an honest support. For I do not affect to conceal that my necessities are very great, even beyond what appearances would indicate. But I am fearful that such new duties would interfere too much with more important business, so that I must decline your offer, and depend on my rifle, as before, for subsistence. Richard here took occasion to whisper to the young lady, who had shrunk a little from the foreground of the picture. This, you see, Cousin Bess, is the natural reluctance of a half-breed to leave the savage state. Their attachment to a wandering life is, I verily believe, unconquerable. It is a precarious life, observed Marmaduke, without hearing the sheriff's observation, and one that brings more evils with it than present suffering. Trust me, young friend. My experience is greater than thine, when I tell thee that the unsettled life of these hunters is a vast disadvantage for temporal purposes, and it totally removes one from the influence of more sacred things. No, no, judge, interrupted the leather stocking, who was hitherto unseen or disregarded. Take him into your shanty and welcome, but tell him truth. I have lived in the woods for forty long years and have spent five at a time without seeing the light of a clearing bigger than a window in the trees. And I should like to know where you'll find a man in his sixty-eighth year who can get an easier living for all your betterments and your dear laws. And, as for honesty, or doing what's right between man and man, I'll not turn my back to the longest-winded deacon on your patent. "'Thou art an exception, leather-stocking,' returned the judge, nodding good-naturedly at the hunter. 
for thou hast a temperance unusual in thy class, and a hardihood exceeding thy years. But this youth is made of materials too precious to be wasted in the forest. I entreat thee to join my family, if it be but till thy arm is healed. My daughter here, who is mistress of my dwelling, will tell thee that thou art welcome. Certainly, said Elizabeth, whose earnestness was a little checked by female reserve, the unfortunate would be welcome at any time, but doubly so when we feel that we have occasioned the evil ourselves. Yes, said Richard, and if you relish turkey, young man, there are plenty in the coops, and of the best kind, I can assure you. Finding himself thus ably seconded, Marmaduke pushed his advantage to the utmost. He entered into a detail of the duties that would attend the situation, and circumstantially mentioned the reward, and all those points which are deemed of importance among men of business. The youth listened in extreme agitation. There was an evident contest in his feelings. At times he appeared to wish eagerly for the change, and then again the incomprehensible expression of disgust would cross his features, like a dark cloud obscuring a noonday sun. The Indian, in whose manner the depression of self-abasement was most powerfully exhibited, listened to the offers of the judge with an interest that increased with each syllable. Gradually he grew nigher to the group, and when, with his keen glance, he detected the most marked evidence of yielding in the countenance of his young companion, he changed at once from his attitude and look of shame to the front of an Indian warrior, and moving, with great dignity, closer to the parties, he spoke. "'Listen to your father,' he said. "'His words are old. Let the young eagle and the great land chief eat together. Let them sleep without fear near each other. The children of Miquan love not blood. They are just and will do right. The sun must rise and set often, before men can make one family. It is not the work of a day, but of many winters.' The Mingos and the Delawares are born enemies. Their blood can never mix in the wigwam. It never will run in the same stream in the battle. What makes the brother of Miquan and the young eagle foes? They are of the same tribe. Their fathers and mothers are one. Learn to wait, my son. You are a Delaware, and an Indian warrior knows how to be patient. This figurative address seemed to have great weight with the young man, who gradually yielded to the representations of Marmaduke, and eventually consented to his proposal. It was, however, to be an experiment only, and, if either of the parties thought fit to rescind the engagement, it was left at his option to do so. The remarkable and ill-concealed reluctance of the youth to accept of an offer which most men in his situation would consider as an unhoped-for elevation, occasioned no little surprise in those to whom he was a stranger. And it left a slight impression to his disadvantage. When the parties separated, they very naturally made the subject the topic of a conversation, which we shall relate, first commencing with the judge, his daughter, and Richard, who were slowly pursuing the way back to the mansion-house. I have surely endeavored to remember the holy man dates of our Redeemer, when he bids us love them who despitefully use you in my intercourse with this incomprehensible boy, said Marmaduke. I know not what there is in my dwelling to frighten a lad of his years, unless it may be thy presence and visage, Bess. No, no, said Richard, with great simplicity, it is not Cousin Bess. But when did you ever know a half-breed? duke, who could bear civilization. For that matter, they are worse than the savages themselves. Did you notice how knock-kneed he stood, Elizabeth, and what a wild look he had in his eyes? I heeded not his eyes, nor his knees, which would be all the better for a little humbling. Really, my dear sir, I think you did exercise the Christian virtue of patience to the utmost. I was disgusted with his airs, long before he consented to make one of our family. Truly we are much honored by the association, 
In what apartment is he to be placed, sir? And at what table is he to receive his nectar and ambrosia? With Benjamin and Remarkable, interrupted Mr. Jones, you sorely would not make the youth eat with the blacks. He is part Indian, it is true, but the natives hold the negroes in great contempt. No, no, he would starve before he would break a crust with the negroes. I am but too happy, Dickon, to tempt him to eat with ourselves, said Marmaduke, to think of offering even the indignity you propose. Then, sir, said Elizabeth, with an air that was slightly affected, as if submitting to her father's orders in opposition to her own will, it is your pleasure that he be a gentleman. Certainly. He is to fill the station of one. Let him receive the treatment that is due to his place, until we find him unworthy of it. Well, well, Duke, cried the sheriff, you will find it no easy matter to make a gentleman of him. The old proverb says that it takes three generations to make a gentleman. There was my father, whom everybody knew my grandfather was an M.D., and his father a D.D., and his father came from England. I never could come at the truth of his origin, but he was either a great merchant in London, or a great country lawyer, or the youngest son of a bishop. "'Here is a true American genealogy for you,' said Marmaduke, laughing. "'It does very well till you get across the water, where, as everything is obscure, it is certain to deal in the superlative. You are sure that your English progenitor was great, Dickon, whatever his profession might have been? To be sure I am, returned the other. I have heard my old aunt talk of him by the month. We are of a good family, Judge Temple, and have never filled any but honorable stations in life. I marvel that you should be satisfied with so scanty a provision of gentility in the olden time, Dickon. Most of the American genealogists commence their traditions like the stories for children with three brothers, taking especial care that one of the triumvirate shall be the progenitor of any of the same name who may happen to be better furnished with worldly gear than themselves. But here all are equal who know how to conduct themselves with propriety, and Oliver Edwards comes into my family on a footing with both the high sheriff and the judge. Well, Duke, I call this democracy, not republicanism. But I say nothing. Only let him keep within the law, or I shall show him that the freedom of even this country is under wholesome restraint. Surely, Dickon, you will not execute till I condemn. But what says best to the new inmate? We must pay a deference to the ladies in this matter, after all. Oh, sir, returned Elizabeth. I believe I am much like a certain Judge Temple in this particular, not easily to be turned from my opinion. But to be serious, although I must think the introduction of a demi-savage into the family is a somewhat startling event, whomsoever you think proper to countenance may be sure of my respect. The judge drew her arm more closely in his own and smiled, while Richard led the way through the gate of the little courtyard in the rear of the dwelling dealing out his ambiguous warnings with his accustomed loquacity. On the other hand, the foresters, for the three hunters, notwithstanding their difference in character, well deserved this common name, pursued their course along the skirts of the village in silence. It was not until they had reached the lake, and were moving over its frozen surface toward the foot of the mountain, where the hut stood, that the youth exclaimed, who could have foreseen this a month since? I have consented to serve Marmaduke Temple, to be an inmate in the dwelling of the greatest enemy of my race. Yet what better could I do? The servitude cannot be long, and when the motive for submitting to it ceases to exist, I will shake it off like the dust from my feet. Is he a Mingo that you will call him enemy? said Mohegan. The Delaware warrior sits still and waits the time of the great spirit. He is no woman to cry out like a child. Well, I'm mistrustful, John, said Leather Stocking, in whose air there had been during the whole business a strong expression of doubt and uncertainty. They say that there's new laws in the land, 
and I'm sartain that there's new ways in the mountains. One hardly knows the lakes and streams, they've altered the country so much. I must say I'm mistrustful of such smooth speakers, for I've known the whites talk fair when they wanted the Indian lands most. This I will say, though I'm a white myself, and was born nigh York, and of honest parents, too. I will submit, said the youth. I will forget who I am. Cease to remember, old Mohegan, that I am the descendant of a Delaware chief, who once was master of these noble hills, these beautiful vales, and of this water over which we tread. Yes, yes. I will become his bondsman, his slave. Is it not an honorable servitude, old man? Old man, repeated the Indian solemnly and pausing in his walk as usual, when much excited. Yes, John is old, son of my brother. If Mohegan was young, when would his rifle be still? Where would the deer hide, and he not find him? But John is old. His hand is the hand of a squaw. His tomahawk is a hatchet. Brooms and baskets are his enemies. He strikes no other. Hunger and old age come together. See Hawkeye. When young, he would go days and eat nothing. But should he not put the brush on the fire now, the blaze would go out. Take the son of Miquan by the hand, and he will help you. I'm not the man I was, I'll own, Chingachgook, returned the leather stocking. But I can go without a meal now, on occasion. When we tracked the Iroquois through the beech woods, they drove the game afore them, for I hadn't a morsel to eat from Monday morning come Wednesday sundown. And then I shot as fat a buck on the Pennsylvania line as ever mortal laid eyes on. It would have done your heart good to have seen the Delaware eat, for I was out scouting and scrimmaging with their tribe at the time. Lord, the Indians, lad, lay still, and just waited till Providence should send them their game— but I foraged about and put a deer up, and put him down, too, afore he had made a dozen jumps. I was too weak and too ravenous to stop for his flesh, so I took a good drink of his blood, and the Indians ate of his meat raw. John was there, and John knows, but then starvation would be apt to be too much for me now. I will own, though I'm no great eater at any time." "'Enough is said, my friend,' cried the youth. "'I feel that everywhere the sacrifice is required at my hands, and it shall be made. But say no more, I entreat you. I cannot bear this subject now.' His companions were silent, and they soon reached the hut, which they entered, after removing certain complicated and ingenious fastenings that were put there apparently to guard a property of but very little value. Immense piles of snow lay against the log walls of this secluded habitation on one side, while fragments of small trees and branches of oak and chestnut that had been torn from their parent stems by the winds were thrown into a pile on the other. A small column of smoke rose through a chimney of sticks cemented with clay along the side of the rock, and had marked the snow above with its dark tinges, in a wavy line from the point of emission to another, where the hill receded from the brow of a precipice, and held a soil that nourished trees of a gigantic growth, that overhung the little bottom beneath. The remainder of the day passed off as such days are commonly spent in a new country. The settlers thronged to the academy again to witness the second effort of Mr. Grant, and Mohegan was one of his hearers. But, notwithstanding, the divine fixed his eyes intently on the Indian when he invited his congregation to advance to the table, the shame of last night's abasement was yet too keen in the old chief to suffer him to move. When the people were dispersing, the clouds that had been gathering all the morning were dense and dirty, and before half of the curious congregation had reached their different cabins, that were placed in every glen and hollow of the mountains, or perched on the summits of the hills themselves, the rain was falling in torrents. 
The dark edges of the stumps began to exhibit themselves as the snow settled rapidly. The fences of logs and brush, which before had been only traced by long lines of white mounds that ran across the valley and up the mountains, peeped out from their covering, and the black stubs were momentarily becoming more distinct as large masses of snow and ice fell from their sides under the influence of the thaw. Sheltered in the warm hall of her father's comfortable mansion, Elizabeth, accompanied by Louisa Grant, looked abroad with admiration at the ever-varying face of things without. Even the village, which had just before been glittering with the color of the frozen element, reluctantly dropped its mask, and the houses exposed their dark roofs and smoked chimneys. The pines shook off the covering of snow, and everything seemed to be assuming its proper hues with a transition that bordered on the super. Chapter 19 of the Pioneers, or the Sources of the Susquehanna, a Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 19 And yet poor Edwin was no vulgar boy. Beatty. The close of Christmas Day, A.D. 1793, was tempestuous, but comparatively warm. When darkness had again hid the objects in the village from the gaze of Elizabeth, she turned from the window, where she had remained while the least vestige of light lingered over the tops of the dark pines, with a curiosity that was rather excited than appeased by the passing glimpses of woodland scenery that she had caught during the day. With her arm locked in that of Miss Grant, the young mistress of the mansion walked slowly up and down the hall, musing on scenes that were rapidly recurring to her memory, and possibly dwelling, at times, in the sanctuary of her thoughts, on the strange occurrences that had led to the introduction to her father's family of one whose manners so singularly contradicted the inferences to be drawn from his situation. The expiring heat of the apartment, for its great size required a day to reduce its temperature, had given to her cheeks a bloom that exceeded their natural color, while the mild and melancholy features of Louisa were brightened with a faint tinge that, like the hectic of disease, gave a painful interest to her beauty. The eyes of the gentlemen, who were yet seated around the rich wines of Judge Temple, frequently wandered from the table that was placed at one end of the hall to the forms that were silently moving over its length. Much mirth, and that, at times of a boisterous kind, proceeded from the mouth of Richard. But Major Hartman was not yet excited to his pitch of merriment, and Marmaduke respected the presence of his clerical guest too much to indulge in even the innocent humor that formed no small ingredient in his character. Such were, and such continued to be, the pursuits of the party. For half an hour after the shutters were closed and candles were placed in various parts of the hall as substitutes for departing daylight, the appearance of Benjamin, staggering under the burden of an armful of wood, was the first interruption to the scene. "'How now, Master Pump?' roared the newly appointed sheriff. "'Is there not warmth enough in Duke's best Madeira to keep up the animal heat through this thaw?' Remember, old boy, that the judge is particular with his beech and maple, beginning to dread already a scarcity of the precious articles. <laughs> Duke, you are a good warm-hearted relation, I will own, as in duty bound, but you have some queer notions about you after all. Come, let us be jolly and cast away folly. The notes gradually sank into a hum, while the major domo threw down his load, and turning to his interrogator, with an air of earnestness, replied, "'Why, look, you, Squire Dickon, mayhap there's a warm latitude round about the table there, though it's not the stuff to raise the heat in my body, neither.' 
the rail jamaiky being the only thing to do that besides good wood or some such matter as newcastle coal but if i know anything of the weather do you see it's time to be getting all snug and for putting the ports in and stirring the fires a bit mayhap i've not followed the seas twenty-seven years and lived another seven in these here woods for nothing jemmin why does it bid fair for a change in the weather benjamin inquired the master of the house there's a shift of wind, your honor, returned the steward, and when there's a shift of wind you may look for a change in this here climate. I was aboard one of Rodney's fleet, d'ye see, about the time we licked de Grasse, Monsieur Lorquois's countryman there, and the wind was here at the southard and eastard, and I was below mixing a toothful of hot stuff for the captain of marines, who dined, d'ye see, in the cabin that there very same day and I suppose he wanted to put out the captain's fire with a gun-room engine. And so, just as I got it to my own liking, after tasting pretty often, for the soldier was difficult to please, slap came the foresail again the mast, whiz went the ship around on her heel like a whirligig. And a lucky thing was it that our helm was down, for as she gathered sternway, she paid off, which was more than every ship in the fleet did, or could do but she strained herself in the trough of the sea, and she shipped a deal of water over her quarter. I never swallowed so much clear water at a time in my life as I did then, for I was looking up the after-hatch at the instant. "'I wonder, Benjamin, that you did not die with the dropsy,' said Marmaduke. "'I might, Judge,' said the old tar with a broad grin. But there was no need of the medicine-chest for a cure, for as I thought the brew was spoiled for the marine's taste, and there was no telling when another sea might come and spoil it for mine, I finished the mug on the spot. So then all hands was called to the pumps, and there we began to ply the pumps. "'Well, but the weather?' interrupted Marmaduke. "'What of the weather without doors?' Why, here the wind has been all day at the south, and now there's a lull, as if the last blast was out of the bellows, and there's a streak along the mountains to the northard, that just now wasn't wider than the bigness of your hand, and then the clouds drive afore it as you'd brail a mainsail, and the stars are heaving in sight like so many lights and beacons, put there to warn us to pile on the wood. And, if so be that I'm a judge of weather, it's getting to be time to build on a fire, or you'll have half of them there porter bottles, and them dimmijohns of wine in the locker here, breaking with the frost, afore the morning watch is called. Thou art a prudent sentinel, said the judge. Act thy pleasure with the forests, for this night at feast. Benjamin did as he was ordered, nor had two hours elapsed before the prudence of his precautions became very visible. The south wind had indeed blown itself out and it was succeeded by the calmness that usually gave warning of a serious change in the weather. Long before the family retired to rest, the cold had become cuttingly severe, and when Monsieur Lacroix sallied forth under a bright moon to seek his own abode, he was compelled to beg a blanket in which he might envelop his form, in addition to the numerous garments that his sagacity had provided for the occasion. The divine and his daughter remained as inmates of the mansion-house during the night, and the excess of last night's merriment induced the gentlemen to make an early retreat to their several apartments. Long before midnight the whole family were invisible. Elizabeth and her friend had not yet lost their senses in sleep, and the howlings of the northwest wind were heard around the buildings, and brought with them that exquisite sense of comfort that is ever excited under such circumstances in an apartment where the fire has not yet ceased to glimmer and curtains and shutters and feathers unite to preserve the desired temperature once just as her eyes had opened apparently in the last stage of drowsiness the roaring winds brought with them a long and plaintive howl that seemed too wild for a dog and yet resembled the cries of that faithful animal when night awakens his vigilance and gives sweetness and solemnity to its charms. The form of Louisa Grant instinctively pressed nearer to that of the young heiress, who, finding her companion was yet awake, said in a low tone, as if afraid to break a charm with her voice, "'Those distant cries are plaintive, and even beautiful. Can they be the hounds from the hut of Leatherstocking?' 
They are wolves, who have ventured from the mountain on the lake, whispered Louisa, and who are only kept from the village by the lights. One night since we have been here, hunger drove them to our very door. Oh, what a dreadful night it was! But the riches of Judge Temple have given him too many safeguards to leave room for fear in this house. "'The enterprise of Judge Temple is taming the very forests,' exclaimed Elizabeth, throwing off her covering and partly rising in the bed. "'How rapidly is civilization treading on the foot of nature,' she continued, as her eye glanced over not only the comforts, but the luxuries of her apartment, and her ear again listened to the distant but often repeated howls from the lake. Finding, however, that the timidity of her companion rendered the sounds painful to her, Elizabeth resumed her place, and soon forgot the changes in the country, with those in her own condition, in a deep sleep. The following morning, the noise of the female servant, who entered the apartment to light the fire, awoke the females. They arose, and finished the slight preparations of their toilets in a clear, cold atmosphere, that penetrated through all the defenses of even Miss Temple's warm room. When Elizabeth was attired, she approached a window and drew its curtain, and throwing open its shutters she endeavored to look abroad on the village and the lake. But a thick covering of frost on the glass, while it admitted the light, shut out the view. She raised the sash, and then, indeed, a glorious scene met her delighted eye. The lake had exchanged its covering of unspotted snow for a face of dark ice that reflected the rays of the rising sun like a polished mirror. The houses, clothed in a dress of the same description, but which, owing to its position, shone like bright steel, while the enormous icicles that were pendant from every roof caught the brilliant light, apparently throwing it from one to the other, as each glittered on the side next the luminary, with a golden luster that melted away, on its opposite, into the dusky shades of a background. But it was the appearance of the boundless forests that covered the hills as they rose in the distance, one over the other, that most attracted the gaze of Miss Temple. The huge branches of the pines and hemlocks bent with the weight of the ice they supported, while their summits rose above the swelling tops of the oaks, beeches, and maples, like spires of burnished silver issuing from domes of the same material. The limits of the view, in the west, were marked by an undulating outline of bright light, as if reversing the order of nature. Numberless suns might momentarily be expected to heave above the horizon. In the foreground of the picture, along the shores of the lake, and near to the village, each tree seemed studded with diamonds. Even the sides of the mountains, where the rays of the sun could not yet fall, were decorated with a glassy coat that presented every gradation of brilliancy, from the first touch of the luminary to the dark foliage of the hemlock, glistening through its coat of crystal. In short, the whole view was one scene of quivering radiancy, as lake, mountains, village, and woods each emitted a portion of light tinged with its peculiar hue, and varied by its position and its magnitude. "'See!' cried Elizabeth. "'See, Louisa! Hasten to the window and observe the miraculous change. Miss Grant complied, and after bending for a moment in silence from the opening, she observed in a low tone, as if afraid to trust the sound of her voice, The change is indeed wonderful. I am surprised that he should be able to effect it so soon. Elizabeth turned in amazement to hear so skeptical a sentiment from one educated like her companion but was surprised to find that, instead of looking at the view, the mild blue eyes of Miss Grant were dwelling on the form of a well-dressed young man, who was standing, before the door of the building, in earnest conversation with her father. A second look was necessary before she was able to recognize the person of the young hunter in a plain, but assuredly, the ordinary garb of a gentleman. "'Everything in this magical country seems to border on the marvelous,' said Elizabeth. "'And among all the changes, this is certainly not the least wonderful. "'The actors are as unique as the scenery.' "'Miss Grant colored and drew in her head. "'I am a simple country girl, Miss Temple, 
and I'm afraid you will find me but a poor companion, she said. I, I am not sure that I understand all you say, but I really thought that you wished me to notice the alteration in Mr. Edwards. Is it not more wonderful when we recollect his origin? They say he is part Indian. He is a genteel savage. But let us go down, and give the Sachem his tea, for I suppose he is a descendant of King Philip, if not a grandson of Pocahontas. The ladies were met in the hall by Judge Temple who took his daughter aside to apprise her of that alteration in the appearance of their new inmate, with which she was already acquainted. "'He appears reluctant to converse on his former situation,' continued Marmaduke. "'But I gathered from his discourse, as is apparent from his manner, that he has seen better days, and I am really inclining to the opinion of Richard as to his origin. For it was no unusual thing for the Indian agents to rear their children in a laudable manner, and—' "'Very well, my dear sir,' interrupted his daughter, laughing and averting her eyes. "'It is all well enough, I dare say. But as I do not understand a word of the Mohawk language, he must be content to speak English. And as for his behavior, I trust to your discernment to control it.' "'Aye, but Bess,' cried the judge, detaining her gently by the hand, "'nothing must be said to him of his past life. This he has begged particularly of me as a favor.' He is, perhaps, a little soured just now with his wounded arm. The injury seems very light. At another time he may be more communicative. Oh, I am not much troubled, sir, with that laudable thirst after knowledge that is called curiosity. I shall believe him to be the child of Cornstalk, or Cornplanter, or some other renowned chieftain, possibly of the big snake himself, and shall treat him as such until he sees fit to shave his good-looking head borrow some half-dozen pair of my best earrings, shoulder his rifle again, and disappear as suddenly as he made his entrance. So come, my dear sir, and let us not forget the rights of hospitality, for the short time he is to remain with us. Judge Temple smiled at the playfulness of his child, and taking her arm they entered the breakfast parlor, where the young hunter was seated with an air that showed his determination to domesticate himself in the family with as little parade as possible. Such were the incidents that led to this extraordinary increase in the family of Judge Temple, where, having once established the youth, the subject of our tale requires us to leave him for a time, to pursue with diligence and intelligence the employments that were assigned him by Marmaduke. Major Hartman made his customary visit, and took his leave of the party for the next three months. Mr. Grant was compelled to be absent most of his time in remote parts of the country, and his daughter became almost a constant visitor at the mansion-house. Richard entered, with his constitutional eagerness, on the duties of his new office, and, as Marmaduke was much employed with the constant applications of adventures for farms, the winter passed swiftly away. The lake was the principal scene for the amusements of the young people where the ladies, in their one-horse cutter, driven by Richard, and attended, when the snow would admit of it, by young Edwards on his skates, spent many hours taking the benefit of exercise in the clear air of the hills. The reserve of the youth gradually gave way to time and his situation, though it was still evident to a close observer that he had frequent moments of bitter and intense feeling. Elizabeth saw many large openings appear in the sides of the mountains during the three succeeding months, where different settlers had, in the language of the country, made their pitch, while the numberless sleighs that passed through the village loaded with wheat and barrels of potashes afforded a clear demonstration that all these labors were not undertaken in vain. In short, the whole country was exhibiting the bustle of a thriving settlement where the highways were thronged with sleighs bearing piles of rough household furniture studded here and there with the smiling faces of women and children, happy in the excitement of novelty, or with loads of produce hastening to the common market at Albany that served as so many snares to induce the emigrants to enter into those wild mountains in search of competence and happiness. The village was alive with business, the artisans increasing in wealth with the prosperity of the country, and each day witnessing some nearer approach to the manners and usages of an old settled town. 
The man who carried the mail, or the post as he was called, talked much of running a stage, and once or twice during the winter he was seen taking a single passenger in his cutter through the snowbanks toward the Mohawk, along which a regular vehicle glided semi-weekly with the velocity of lightning, and under the direction of a knowing whip from the down countries. Toward spring, diverse families, who had been into the old states to see their relatives, returned in time to save the snow, frequently bringing with them whole neighborhoods, who were tempted by their representations to leave the farms of Connecticut and Massachusetts to make a trial of fortune in the woods. During all this time, Oliver Edwards, whose sudden elevation excited no surprise in that changeful country, was earnestly engaged in the service of Marmaduke during the days. But his nights were often spent in the hut of leather-stocking. The intercourse between the three hunters was maintained with a certain air of mystery. It is true, but with much zeal and apparent interest to all the parties. Even Mohegan seldom came to the mansion-house, and Natty never. But Edward sought every leisure moment to visit his former abode, from which he would often return in the gloomy hours of night through the snow, or, if detained beyond the time at which the family retired to rest, with the morning sun. These visits certainly excited much speculation in those to whom they were known, but no comments were made, excepting occasionally in whispers from Richard, who would say, "'It is not at all remarkable. A half-breed can never be weaned from the savage ways, and for one of its Chapter Twenty of the Pioneers, or the Sources of the Susquehanna: A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty. Away, nor let me loiter in my song. For we have many a mountain path to tread. Byron As the spring gradually approached, the immense piles of snow that, by alternate thaws and frosts, and repeated storms, had obtained a firmness which threatened a tiresome durability, began to yield to the influence of milder breezes and a warmer sun. The gates of heaven at times seemed to open, and a bland air diffused itself over the earth when animate and inanimate nature would awaken, and for a few hours the gaiety of spring shone in every eye and smiled on every field. But the shivering blasts from the north would carry their chill influence over the scene again, and the dark and gloomy clouds that intercepted the rays of the sun were not more cold and dreary than the reaction. These struggles between the seasons became daily more frequent, while the earth, like a victim to contention, slowly lost the animated brilliancy of winter, without obtaining the aspect of spring. Several weeks were consumed in this cheerless manner, during which the inhabitants of the country gradually changed their pursuits from the social and bustling movements of the time of snow to the laborious and domestic engagements of the coming season. The village was no longer thronged with visitors. The trade that had enlivened the shops for several months began to disappear. The highways lost their shining coats of beaten snow and impassable sloughs, and were deserted by the gay and noisy travelers who, in sleighs, had, during the winter, glided along their windings. And in short, everything seemed indicative of a mighty change, not only in the earth, but in those who derived their sources of comfort and happiness from its bosom. The younger members of the family in the mansion-house, of which Louisa Grant was now habitually one, were by no means indifferent observers of these fluctuating and tardy changes. While the snow rendered the roads passable, they had partaken largely in the amusements of the winter, which included not only daily rides over the mountains and through every valley within twenty miles of them, but diverse ingenious and varied sources of pleasure on the bosom of their frozen lake. 
There had been excursions in the equipage of Richard, when with his four horses he had outstripped the winds, as it flew over the glassy ice which invariably succeeded a thaw. Then the exciting and dangerous whirligig would be suffered to possess its moment of notice. Cutters, drawn by a single horse, and hand-sleds, impelled by the gentlemen on skates, would each in turn be used, and in short, every source of relief against the tediousness of a winter in the mountains was resorted to by the family. Elizabeth was compelled to acknowledge to her father that the season, with the aid of his library, was much less irksome than she had anticipated. As exercise in the open air was in some degree necessary to the habits of the family, when the constant recurrence of frosts and thaws rendered the roads, which were dangerous at the most favorable times, utterly impassable for wheels, saddle-horses were used as substitutes for other conveyances. Mounted on small and sure-footed beasts, the ladies would again attempt the passages of the mountains, and penetrate into every retired glen where the enterprise of a settler had induced him to establish himself. In these excursions they were attended by some one or all of the gentlemen of the family, as their different pursuits admitted. Young Edwards was hourly becoming more familiarized to his situation, and not infrequently mingled in the parties with an unconcern and gaiety that for a short time would expel all unpleasant recollections from his mind. Habit, and the buoyancy of youth, seemed to be getting the ascendancy over the secret causes of his uneasiness though there were moments when the same remarkable expression of disgust would cross his intercourse with Marmaduke that had distinguished their conversations in the first days of their acquaintance. It was at the close of the month of March that the sheriff succeeded in persuading his cousin and her young friend to accompany him on a ride to a hill that was said to overhang the lake in a manner peculiar to itself. "'Besides, Cousin Bess,' continued the indefatigable Richard, "'we will stop and see the sugar-bush of Billy Kirby. He is on the east end of the Ransom lot, making sugar for Jared Ransom. There is not a better hand over a kettle in the county than that same Kirby. You remember, Duke, that I had him his first season in our camp, and it is not a wonder that he knows something of his trade.' "'He's a good chopper, is Billy,' observed Benjamin, who held the bridle of the horse while the sheriff mounted. "'And he handles an axe much the same as a forkelsoman does his marling-spike, or a tailor his goose. They say he'll lift a potash kettle off the arch alone, though I can't say that I've ever seen him do it with my own eyes. But that is the say. And I've seen sugar of his making, which maybe wasn't as white as an old topgallant sail, but which my friend Mistress Pettibones within there said had the true molasses smack to it. And you are not the one, Squire Dickens, to be told that Mistress Remarkable has a remarkable tooth for sweet things in her nut-grinder. The loud laugh that succeeded the wit of Benjamin, and in which he participated with no very harmonious sounds himself, very fully illustrated the congenial temper which existed between the pair. Most of its point was, however, lost on the rest of the party, who were either mounting their horses or assisting the ladies at the moment. When all were safely in their saddles, they moved through the village in great order. They paused for a moment before the door of Monsieur Le Quoy, until he could bestride his steed, and then, issuing from the little cluster of houses, they took one of the principal of those highways that centered in the village. As each night brought with it a severe frost, which the heat of the succeeding day served to dissipate, the equestrians were compelled to proceed singly along the margin of the road, where the turf and firmness of the ground gave the horses a secure footing. Very trifling indications of vegetation were to be seen, the surface of the earth presenting a cold, wet, and cheerless aspect that chilled the blood. The snow yet lay scattered over most of those distant clearings that were visible in different parts of the mountains, though here and there an opening might be seen where, as the white covering yielded to the season, the bright and lively green of the wheat served to enkindle the hopes of the husbandman. Nothing could be more marked than the contrast between the earth and the heavens, for, 
while the former presented the dreary view that we have described, a warm and invigorating sun was dispensing his heats from a sky that contained but a solitary cloud, and through an atmosphere that softened the colors of the sensible horizon until it shone like a sea of blue. Richard led the way on this, as on all other occasions that did not require the exercise of unusual abilities, and as he moved along he essayed to enliven the party with the sounds of his experienced voice. "'This is your true sugar weather, Duke,' he cried. "'A frosty night, and a sunshiny day. I warrant me that the sap runs like a mill-tail up the maples this warm morning. It is a pity, Judge, that you do not introduce a little more science into the manufactory of sugar among your tenants. It might be done, sir, without knowing as much as Dr. Franklin. It might be done, Judge Temple. The first object of my solicitude, friend Jones, returned Marmaduke, is to protect the sources of this great mine of comfort and wealth from the extravagance of the people themselves. When this important point shall be achieved, it will be in season to turn our attention to an improvement in the manufacture of the article. But thou knowest, Richard, that I have already subjected our sugar to the process of the refiner, and that the result has produced loaves as white as the snow on yon fields, and possessing the saccharine quality in its utmost purity. Saccharine or turpentine, or any other eyne, Judge Temple, you have never made a loaf larger than a good-sized sugar-plum," returned the sheriff. Now, sir, I assert that no experiment is fairly tried until it be reduced to practical purposes. If, sir, I owned a hundred, or for that matter, two hundred thousand acres of land, as you do, I would build a sugar-house in the village. I would invite learned men to an investigation of the subject. And such are easily to be found, sir. Yes, sir, they are not difficult to find. Men who unite theory with practice. And I would select a wood of young and thrifty trees, and instead of making loaves of the size of a lump of candy, damn me, Duke, but I'd have them as big as a haycock. And purchase the cargo of one of those ships that they say are going to China, cried Elizabeth. Turn your potash kettles into teacups, the scows on the lake into saucers, bake your cake in yonder lime-kiln, and invite the county to a tea-party. How wonderful are the projects of genius! Really, sir, the world is of opinion that Judge Temple has tried the experiment fairly, though he did not cause his loaves to be cast in moulds of the magnitude that would suit your magnificent conceptions. "'You may laugh, Cousin Elizabeth, you may laugh, madam,' retorted Richard turning himself so much in his saddle as to face the party, and making dignified gestures with his whip. But I appeal to common sense, good sense, or what is of more importance than either, to the sense of taste, which is one of the five natural senses. Whether a big loaf of sugar is not likely to contain a better illustration of a proposition than such a lump as one of your Dutch women puts under her tongue when she drinks her tea. There are two ways of doing everything, the right way and the wrong way. You make sugar now, I will admit, and you may possibly make loaf sugar. But I take the question to be whether you make the best possible sugar and in the best possible loaves. Thou art very right, Richard, observed Marmaduke, with a gravity in his air that proved how much he was interested in the subject. It is very true that we manufacture sugar and the inquiry is quite useful. How much, and in what manner? I hope to live to see the day when farms and plantations shall be devoted to this branch of business. Little is known concerning the properties of the tree itself, the source of all this wealth, how much it may be improved by cultivation, by the use of the hoe and plow. Hoe and plow, roared the sheriff. Would you set a man hoeing around the root of a maple like this? pointing to one of the noble trees that occur so frequently in that part of the country. "'Hoeing trees! Are you mad, Duke? This is next to hunting for coal. Po, po, my dear cousin, hear reason, and leave the management of the sugar-bush to me. Here is Mr. Lacroix. He has been in the West Indies, and has seen sugar made. Let him give an account of how it is made there, 
and you will hear the philosophy of the thing. Well, monsieur, how is it that you make sugar in the West Indies? Anything in Judge Temple's fashion? The gentleman to whom this query was put was mounted on a small horse, of no very fiery temperament, and was riding with his stirrups so short as to bring his knees, while the animal rose a small ascent in the wood-path they were now travelling, into a somewhat hazardous vicinity to his chin. There was no room for gesticulation or grace in the delivery of his reply, for the mountain was steep and slippery, and although the Frenchman had an eye of uncommon magnitude on either side of his face, they did not seem to be half competent to forewarn him of the impediments of bushes, twigs, and fallen trees that were momentarily crossing his path. With one hand employed in averting these dangers, and the other grasping his bridle to check an untoward speed that his horse was assuming, the native of France responded as follows. Sucre. They do make sucre in Martinique. Mais, mais, ce n'est pas one tree, ah, ah, that you call, je vous dois que ce chemin pense au diable, but you call, Stick pour la promenade? Cain, said Elizabeth, smiling at the imprecation which the wary Frenchman supposed was understood only by himself. Oui, mademoiselle, Cain. Yes, yes, cried Richard. Cain is the vulgar name for it. But the real term is sacrum officinarum, and what we call the sugar, or hard maple, is acer saccharinum. These are the learned names, monsieur, and are such as, doubtless, you well understand. "'Is this Greek or Latin, Mr. Edwards?' whispered Elizabeth to the youth, who was opening a passage for herself and her companions through the bushes. "'Or perhaps it is a still more learned language, for an interpretation of which we must look to you.' The dark eye of the young man glanced toward the speaker, but its resentful expression changed in a moment. I shall remember your doubts, Miss Temple, when next I visit my old friend Mohegan, and either his skill or that of leather-stocking shall solve them. And are you then really ignorant of their language? Not absolutely, but the deep learning of Mr. Jones is more familiar to me, or even the polite masquerade of Monsieur Lacroix. Do you speak French? said the lady, with quickness. It is a common language with the Iroquois, and through the Canadas he answered, smiling. "'Ah, but they are Mingos, and your enemies.' "'It will be well for me if I have no worse,' said the youth, dashing ahead with his horse, and putting an end to the evasive dialogue. The discourse, however, was maintained with great vigour by Richard, until they reached an open wood on the summit of the mountain, where the hemlocks and pines totally disappeared and a grove of the very trees that formed the subject of debate covered the earth with their tall, straight trunks and spreading branches in stately pride. The underwood had been entirely removed from this grove or bush, as, in conjunction with the simple arrangements for boiling, it was called, and a wide space of many acres was cleared, which might be likened to the dome of a mighty temple to which the maples formed the columns, their tops composing the capitals and the heavens the arch. A deep and careless incision had been made into each tree near its root, into which little spouts formed of the bark of the alder or of the sumac were fastened, and a trough, roughly dug out of the linden or basswood, was lying at the root of each tree, to catch the sap that flowed from this extremely wasteful and inartificial arrangement. The party paused a moment on gaining the flat to breathe their horses, and as the scene was entirely new to several of their number, to view the manner of collecting the fluid. A fine, powerful voice aroused them from their momentary silence, as it rang under the branches of the trees, singing the following words of that inimitable doggerel, whose verses, if extended, would reach from the caters of the Connecticut to the shores of Ontario. The tune was, of course, a familiar air which, although it is said to have been first applied to this nation in derision, circumstances have since rendered so glorious that no American ever hears its jingling cadence without feeling a thrill at his heart. 
The eastern states be full of men, the western full of woods, sir. The hill be like a cattle pen, the roads be full of goods, sir. Then flow away, my sweetie sap, and I will make you boily. Nor catch a woodman's hasty nap, for fear you should get royally. The maple tree's a precious one, tis fuel, food, and timber. And when your stiff day's work is done, its juice will make you limber. Then flow away, my sweetie sap, and I will make you boily. Nor catch a woodman's hasty nap, for fear you should get royally. And what's a man without his glass, his wife without her tea, sir? But neither cup nor mug will pass without his honey bee, sir. Then flow away, my sweetie sap, and I will make you boily. Nor catch a woodman's hasty nap, for fear you should get royally. During the execution of this sonorous doggerel, Richard kept time with his whip on the mane of his charger, accompanying the gestures with a corresponding movement of his head and body. Toward the close of the song he was overheard humming the chorus, and at its last repetition to strike in at Sweetie Sap, and carry a second through, with a prodigious addition to the effect of the noise, if not to that of the harmony. "'Well done us!' roared the sheriff, on the same key with the tune. A very good song, Billy Kirby, and very well sung. Where got you the words, lad? Is there more of it, and can you furnish me with a copy? The sugar-boiler, who was busy in his camp at a short distance from the equestrians, turned his head with great indifference and surveyed the party, as they approached, with admirable coolness. To each individual, as he or she rode close by him, he gave a nod that was extremely good-natured and affable but which partook largely of the virtue of equality, for not even to the ladies did he in the least vary his mode of salutation, by touching the apology for a hat that he wore, or by any other motion than the one we have mentioned. "'How goes it? How goes it, Sheriff?' said the woodchopper. "'What's the good word in the village?' "'Why, much as usual, Billy,' returned Richard. "'But how is this? Where are your four kettles?' and your troughs, and your iron coolers. Do you make sugar in this slovenly way? I thought you were one of the best sugar-boilers in the county. I'm all that, Squire Jones, said Kirby, who continued his occupation. I'll turn my back to no man in the Atsego Hills for chopping and logging, for boiling down the maple sap, for tending brick kiln, splitting out rails, making potash, and parling too, or hoeing corn, though I keep myself pretty much to the first business, seeing that the axe comes most natural to me. "'You be von jack all trade, Mr. Bill,' said Monsieur Lequoy. "'How?' said Kirby, looking up with a simplicity which coupled with his gigantic frame and manly face was a little ridiculous. "'If you be for trade, Monsieur, here is some as good sugar as you'll find the season through.' It's as clear from dirt as the Jarman Flats is free from stumps, and it has the rail maple flavor. Such stuff would sell in York for candy. The Frenchman approached the place where Kirby had deposited his cake of sugar, under the cover of a bark roof, and commenced the examination of the article with the eye of one who well understood its value. Marmaduke had dismounted, and was viewing the works and the trees very closely and not without frequent expressions of dissatisfaction at the careless manner in which the manufacture was conducted. "'You have much experience in these things, Kirby,' he said. "'What course do you pursue in making your sugar? I see you have but two kettles.' Two is as good as two thousand, Judge. I'm none of your polite sugar-makers that boils for the great folks. But if the rail sweet maple is wanted, I can answer your turn. First, I choose.' and then I tap my trees. Say along about the last of February, or in these mountains maybe not afore the middle of March. But anyway, just as the sap begins to cleverly run. Well, in this choice, interrupted Marmaduke, are you governed by any outward signs that prove the quality of the tree? Why, there's judgment in all things, said Kirby, stirring the liquor in his kettles briskly. There's something in knowing when and how to stir the pot, 
It's a thing that must be learnt. Rome wasn't built in a day, nor for that matter Templeton, either, though it may be said to be a quick-growing place. I never put my axe into a stunty tree, or one that hasn't a good, fresh-looking bark, for trees have disorders like creatures. And where's the policy of taking a tree that's sickly any more than you'd choose a foundered horse to ride post, or an overheated ox to do your logging? All that is true. But what are the signs of illness? How do you distinguish a tree that is well from one that is diseased? How does the doctor tell who has fever and who colds? interrupted Richard, by examining the skin and feeling the pulse to be sure. Sartin, continued Billy, the squire ain't far out of the way. It's by the look of the thing, sure enough. Well, when the sap begins to get a free run, I hang over the kettles and set up the bush. My first boiling I push pretty smartly, till I get the virtue of the sap. But when it begins to grow of a molasses nature, like this one in the kettle, one mustn't drive the fires too hard, or you'll burn the sugar. And burny sugar is bad to the taste, let it be never so sweet. So you ladle out from one kettle into the other, till it gets so, when you put the stirring stick into it, that it will draw into a thread, when it takes a careful hand to manage it. There is a way to drain it off after it has grained, by putting clay into the pans, but it isn't always practiced. Some do's and some doesn't. Well, Moonshore, be we likely to make a trade? I will give you, Mr. Etto, for one pound, dix sous. No, I expect cash for it. I never dicker my sugar. But seeing that it's you, Moonshore, said Billy, with a coaxing smile, I'll agree to receive a gallon of rum, and cloth enough for two shirts, if you'll take the molasses in the bargain. It's real good. I wouldn't deceive you or any man, and to my drinking it's about the best molasses that come out of a sugar-bush. Mr. Lacroix has offered you ten pence, said young Edwards. The manufacturer stared at the speaker with an air of great freedom, but made no reply. Oui, said the Frenchman. Ten penny. Je vous remercie, monsieur. Ah, mon anglois. Je l'oublie toujours. The woodchopper looked from one to the other with some displeasure, and evidently imbibed the opinion that they were amusing themselves at his expense. He seized the enormous ladle, which was lying on one of his kettles, and began to stir the boiling liquid with great diligence. After a moment passed in dipping the ladle full, and then raising it on high, as the thick, rich fluid fell back into the kettle, he suddenly gave it a whirl, as if to cool what yet remained, and offered the bowl to Mr. Lacroix, saying, "'Taste that, monsieur, and you will say it is worth more than you offer. The molasses itself would fetch the money.' The complacent Frenchman, after several timid efforts to trust his lips in contact with the bowl of the ladle, got a good swallow of the scalding liquid. He clapped his hands on his breast, and looked most piteously at the ladies for a single instant, and then, to use the language of Billy, when he afterward recounted the tale, no drumsticks ever went faster on the skin of a sheep than the Frenchman's legs for a round or two. And then such swearing and spitting in French you never saw. But it's a knowing one from the old countries that thinks to get his jokes smoothly over a woodchopper. The air of innocence with which Kirby resumed the occupation of stirring the contents of his kettles would have completely deceived the spectators as to his agency in the temporary sufferings of Mr. Lacroix. Had not the reckless fellow thrust his tongue into his cheek, and cast his eyes over the party, with a simplicity of expression that was too exquisite to be natural. Mr. Lacroix soon recovered his presence of mind and his decorum, and he briefly apologized to the ladies for one or two very intemperate expressions that had escaped him in a moment of extraordinary excitement, and, remounting his horse, he continued in the background during the remainder of the visit the wit of Kirby putting a violent termination at once to all negotiations on the subject of trade. During all this time Marmaduke had been wandering about the grove, making observations on his favorite trees, 
and the wasteful manner in which the woodchopper conducted his manufacture. "'It grieves me to witness the extravagance that pervades this country,' said the judge, "'where the settlers trifle with the blessings they might enjoy, with the prodigality of successful adventurers. "'You are not exempt from the censure yourself, Kirby, for you make dreadful wounds in these trees where a small incision would effect the same object.' I earnestly beg you will remember that they are the growth of centuries, and when once gone, none living will see their loss remedied. Why, I don't know, Judge, returned the man he addressed. It seems to me, if there's plenty of anything in this mountainous country, it's the trees. If there's any sin in chopping them, I've a pretty heavy account to settle, for I've chopped over the best half of a thousand acres, with my own hands counting both Vermont and York states, and I hope to live to finish the wool, before I lay up my axe. Chopping comes quite natural to me, and I wish no other employment. But Jared Ransom said that he thought the sugar was likely to be scarce this season, seeing that so many folks was coming into the settlement, and so I concluded to take the bush on shears for this one spring. What's the best news, Judge, concerning ashes? Do pots hold so that a man can live by them still? I suppose they will, if they keep on fighting across the water. Thou reasonest with judgment, William, returned Marmaduke. So long as the old worm is to be convulsed with wars, so long will the harvest of America continue. Well, it's an ill wind, Judge, that blows nobody any good. I'm sure the country is in a thriving way. And though I know you calculate greatly on the trees, setting as much store by them as some men would by their children, yet to my eyes they are a sore sight any time, unless I'm privileged to work my will on them, in which case I can't say but they are more to my liking. I have heard the settlers from the old country say that their rich men keep great oaks and elms that would make a barrel of pots to the tree, standing round their doors and homesteads and scattered over their farms, just to look at. Now I call no country much improved that is pretty well covered with trees. Stumps are a different thing, for they don't shade the land, and besides, you dig them, they make a fence that will turn anything bigger than a hog, being grand for breachy cattle. Opinions on such subjects vary much in different countries, said Marmaduke, but it is not as ornaments that I value the noble trees of this country. It is for their usefulness. We are stripping the forests, as if a single year would replace what we destroy. But the hour approaches when the laws will take notice of not only the woods, but the game they contain also. With this consoling reflection Marmaduke remounted, and the equestrians passed the sugar camp on their way to the promised landscape of Richard. The woodchopper was left alone in the bosom of the forest to pursue his labors. Elizabeth turned her head when they reached the point where they were to descend the mountain, and thought that the slow fires that were glimmering under his enormous kettles, his little brush shelter, covered with pieces of hemlock bark, his gigantic size as he wielded his ladle with a steady and knowing air, aided by the background of stately trees with their spouts and troughs, formed altogether no unreal picture of human life in its first stages of civilization. Perhaps whatever the scene possessed of a romantic character was not injured by the powerful tones of Kirby's voice ringing through the woods as he again awoke his strains to another tune, which was but little more scientific than the former. All that she understood of the words were, And when the proud forest is falling, to my oxen cheerfully calling, from morn until night I am bawling, woe back there, and haw and gee, till our labor is mutually ended, by my strength and cattle befriended, and against the mosquitoes defended by the bark of the walnut trees. Away, then you lads who would buy land, choose the oak that grows on the high land, or the silvery pine on the dry land, it matters but little to me. Chapter Twenty One 
of the pioneers or the sources of the susquehanna a descriptive tale by james fenimore cooper this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. chapter twenty one speed malise speed such cause of haste thine active sinews never braced scott the roads of otsego if we accept the principal highways were at the early day of our tale but little better than wood paths the high trees that were growing on the very verge of the wheel tracks excluded the sun's rays unless at meridian and the slowness of the evaporation united with the rich mould of vegetable decomposition that covered the whole country to the depth of several inches occasioned but an indifferent foundation for the footing of travellers added to these were the inequalities of a natural surface and the constant recurrence of enormous and slippery roots that were laid bare by the removal of the light soil together with stumps of trees to make a passage not only difficult but dangerous yet the riders among these numerous obstructions which were such as would terrify an unpractised eye gave no demonstrations of uneasiness as their horses toiled through the sloughs or trotted with uncertain paces along the dark route in many places the marks on the trees were the only indications of a road with perhaps an occasional remnant of a pine that by being cut close to the earth so as to leave nothing visible but its base of roots spreading for twenty feet in every direction was apparently placed there as a beacon to warn the traveller that it was the centre of a highway into one of these roads the active sheriff led the way first striking out of the footpath by which they had descended from the sugar bush across a little bridge formed of round logs laid loosely on sleepers of pine in which large openings of a formidable width were frequent the nag of richard when it reached one of these gaps laid its nose along the logs and stepped across the difficult passage with the sagacity of a man but the blooded filly which miss temple rode disdained so humble a movement she made a step or two with an unusual caution and then on reaching the broadest opening obedient to the curt and whip of her fearless mistress she bounded across the dangerous pass with the activity of a squirrel gently gently my child said marmaduke who was following in the manner of richard this is not a country for equestrian feats much prudence is requisite to journey through our rough paths with safety thou mayest practise thy skill in horsemanship on the plains of new jersey with safety but in the hills of otsego they may be suspended for a time i may as well then relinquish my saddle at once dear sir returned his daughter for if it is to be laid aside until this wild country be improved old age will overtake me and put an end to what you term my equestrian feats say not so my child returned her father but if thou venturest again as in crossing this bridge old age will never overtake thee but i shall be left to mourn thee cut off in thy prime my elizabeth if thou hast seen this district of country as i did when it lay in the sleep of nature and had witnessed its rapid changes as it awoke to supply the wants of man thou wouldst curb thy impatience for a little time though thou shouldst not check thy steed i recollect hearing you speak of your first visit to these woods but the impression is faint and blended with the confused images of childhood wild and unsettled as it may yet seem it must have been a thousand times more dreary then will you repeat dear sir what you then thought of your enterprise and what you felt during this speech of elizabeth which was uttered with the fervour of affection young edwards rode more closely to the side of the judge and bent his dark eyes on his countenance with an expression that seemed to read his thoughts thou wast then young my child but must remember when i left thee and thy mother to take my first survey of these uninhabited mountains said marmaduke but thou dost not feel all the secret motives that can urge a man to endure privations in order to accumulate wealth 
In my case they have not been trifling, and God has been pleased to smile on my efforts. If I have encountered pain, famine, and disease in accomplishing the settlement of this rough territory, I have not the misery of failure to add to the grievances. Famine! echoed Elizabeth. I thought this was the land of abundance. Had you famine to contend with? Even so, my child, said her father. Those who look around them now, and see the loads of produce that issue out of every wild path in these mountains during the season of traveling, will hardly credit that no more than five years have elapsed since the tenants of these woods were compelled to eat the scanty fruits of the forest to sustain life, and, with their unpractised skill, to hunt the beasts as food for their starving families. "'Aye,' cried Richard, who happened to overhear the last of this speech between the notes of the woodchopper's song, which he was endeavoring to breathe aloud. "'That was the starving time, Cousin Bess.' Author's Insertion the author has no better apology for interrupting the interest of a work of fiction by these desultory dialogues than that they have reference to facts. In reviewing his work, after so many years, he is compelled to confess it is injured by too many allusions to incidents that are not at all suited to satisfy the just expectations of the general reader. One of these events is slightly touched on in the commencement of this chapter. End author's insertion. I grew as lank as a weasel that fall, and my face was as pale as one of your fever and ague visages. Monsieur Lacroix there fell away like a pumpkin in drying. Nor do I think you have got fairly over it yet, monsieur. Benjamin, I thought, bore it with a worse grace than any of the family, for he swore it was harder to endure than a short allowance in the calm latitudes. Benjamin is a sad fellow to swear if you starve him ever so little. I had half a mind to quit you then, Duke, and to go into Pennsylvania to fatten. But damn it, thinks I, we are sister's children, and I will live or die with him after all. More than thirty years since a very near and dear relative of the writer, an elder sister and a second mother, was killed by a fall from a horse in a ride among the very mountains mentioned in this tale. Few of her sex and years were more extensively known or more universally beloved than the admirable woman who thus fell a victim to the chances of the wilderness. "'I do not forget thy kindness,' said Marmaduke, "'nor that we are of one blood.' "'But, my dear father,' cried the wondering Elizabeth, "'was there actual suffering?' Where were the beautiful and fertile vales of the Mohawk? Could they not furnish food for your wants? It was a season of scarcity. The necessities of life commanded a high price in Europe, and were greedily sought after by the speculators. The emigrants from the east to the west invariably passed along the valley of the Mohawk, and swept away the means of subsistence like a swarm of locusts. Nor were the people on the flats in a much better condition. They were in want themselves, but they spared the little excess of provisions that nature did not absolutely require, with the justice of the German character. There was no grinding of the poor. The word speculator was then unknown to them. I have seen many a stout man, bending under the load of the bag of meal which he was carrying from the mills of the Mohawk, through the rugged passes of these mountains, to feed his half-famished children with a heart so light as he approached his hut, that the thirty miles he had passed seemed nothing. Remember, my child, it was in our very infancy. We had neither mills, nor grain, nor roads, nor often clearings. We had nothing of increase but the mouths that were to be fed. For even at that inauspicious moment the restless spirit of emigration was not idle. Nay, the general scarcity which extended to the east tended to increase the number of adventurers. "'And how, dearest father, didst thou encounter this dreadful evil?' said Elizabeth, unconsciously adopting the dialect of her parent in the warmth of her sympathy. "'Upon thee must have fallen the responsibility, if not the suffering.' "'It did, Elizabeth,' returned the judge, 
pausing for a single moment, as if musing on his former feelings. I had hundreds at that dreadful time daily looking up to me for bread. The sufferings of their families and the gloomy prospect before them had paralyzed the enterprise and efforts of my settlers. Hunger drove them to the woods for food, but despair sent them at night, enfeebled and wan, to a sleepless pillow. It was not a moment for inaction. I purchased cargoes of wheat from the granaries of Pennsylvania. They were landed at Albany, and brought up the Mohawk in boats. From thence it was transported on pack-horses into the wilderness, and distributed among my people. Sains were made, and the lakes and rivers were dragged for fish. Something like a miracle was wrought in our favor, for enormous shoals of herrings were discovered to have wandered five hundred miles through the windings of the impetuous Susquehanna, and the lake was alive with their numbers. These were at length caught and dealt out to the people, with proper portions of salt, and from that moment we again began to prosper. AUTHOR'S INSERTION All this was literally true. End AUTHOR'S INSERTION Yes, cried Richard, and I was the man who served out the fish and salt. When the poor devils came to receive their rations, Benjamin, who was my deputy, was obliged to keep them off by stretching ropes around me for they smelt so of garlic from eating nothing but the wild onion, that the fumes put me out often in my measurement. You were a child then, Bess, and knew nothing of the matter, for great care was observed to keep both you and your mother from suffering. That year put me back dreadfully, both in the breed of my hogs and of my turkeys. No, Bess, cried the judge in a more cheerful tone, disregarding the interruption of his cousin. He who hears the settlement of a country knows but little of the toil and suffering by which it is accomplished. Unimproved and wild as this district now seems to your eyes, what was it when I first entered the hills? I left my party the morning of my arrival near the farms of the Cherry Valley, and following a deer path rode to the summit of the mountain that I have since called Mount Vision. For the sight that there met my eyes seemed to me as the deceptions of a dream. The fire had run over the pinnacle, and in a great measure laid open the view. The leaves were fallen, and I mounted a tree and sat for an hour looking on the silent wilderness. Not an opening was to be seen in the boundless forest except where the lake lay, like a mirror of glass. The water was covered by myriads of the wild fowl that migrate with the changes in the season and while in my situation on the branch of the beach I saw a bear, with her cubs, descend to the shore to drink. I had met many deer, gliding through the woods, in my journey, but not the vestige of a man could I trace during my progress, nor from my elevated observatory. No clearing, no hut, none of the winding roads that are now to be seen, were there. Nothing but mountains rising behind mountains and the valley, with its surface of branches enlivened here and there, with the faded foliage of some tree that parted from its leaves with more than ordinary reluctance. Even the Susquehanna was then hid by the height and density of the forest. "'And were you alone?' asked Elizabeth. "'Passed you the night in that solitary state?' "'Not so, my child,' returned the father. After musing on the scene for an hour, with a mingled feeling of pleasure and desolation, I left my perch and descended the mountain. My horse was left to browse on the twigs that grew within his reach, while I explored the shores of the lake and the spot where Templeton stands. A pine of more than ordinary growth stood where my dwelling is now placed. A windrow had been opened through the trees from thence to the lake, and my view was but little impeded. Under the branches of that tree I made my solitary dinner. I had just finished my repast, as I saw smoke curling from under the mountain, near the eastern bank of the lake. It was the only indication of the vicinity of man that I had then seen. After much toil I made my way to the spot, and found a rough cabin of logs, built against the foot of a rock, and bearing the marks of a tenant, though I found no one within it. It was the hut of leather stocking, said Edwards quickly. It was, though I at first supposed it to be a habitation of the Indians. 
But while I was lingering around the spot, Natty made his appearance, staggering under the carcass of a buck that he had slain. Our acquaintance commenced at that time. Before I had never heard that such a being tenanted the woods. He launched his bark canoe and set me across the foot of the lake to the place where I had fastened my horse, and pointed out a spot where he might get a scanty browsing until the morning, when I returned and passed the night in the cabin of the hunter. Miss Temple was so much struck by the deep attention of young Edwards during this speech, that she forgot to resume her interrogations. But the youth himself continued the discourse by asking, "'And how did the leather-stocking discharge the duties of a host, sir?' "'Why, simply but kindly, until late in the evening, when he discovered my name and object, and the cordiality of his manner very sensibly diminished, or I might better say disappeared. He considered the introduction of the settlers as an innovation on his rights, I believe, for he expressed much dissatisfaction at the measure, though it was in his confused and ambiguous manner. I hardly understood his objections myself, but supposed they referred chiefly to an interruption of the hunting. "'Had you then purchased the estate, or were you examining it with an intent to buy?' asked Edwards, a little abruptly. "'It had been mine for several years.' It was with a view to people the land that I visited the lake. Natty treated me hospitably, but coldly, I thought, after he learned the nature of my journey. I slept on his own bearskin, however, and in the morning joined my surveyors again. Said he nothing of the Indian rights, sir? The leather stocking is much given to impeach the justice of the tenure by which the whites hold the country. I remember that he spoke of them but I did not nearly comprehend him, and may have forgotten what he said. For the Indian title was extinguished so far back as the close of the old war, and if it had not been at all, I hold under the patents of the royal governors confirmed by an act of our own state legislature, and no court in the country can affect my title. Doubtless, sir, your title is both legal and equitable, returned the youth coldly, reining his horse back, and remaining silent till the subject was changed. It was seldom Mr. Jones suffered any conversation to continue for a great length of time without his participation. It seems that he was of the party that Judge Temple had designated as his surveyors, and he embraced the opportunity of the pause that succeeded the retreat of young Edwards to take up the discourse, and with a narration of their further proceedings after his own manner, as it wanted, however, the interest that had accompanied the description of the judge, we must decline the task of committing his sentences to paper. They soon reached the point where the promised view was to be seen. It was one of those picturesque and peculiar scenes that belonged to the Otsego, but which required the absence of the ice and the softness of a summer's landscape to be enjoyed in all its beauty. Marmaduke had early forewarned his daughter of the season— and of its effect on the prospect, and after casting a cursory glance at its capabilities, the party returned homeward, perfectly satisfied that its beauties would repay them for the toil of a second ride at a more propitious season. "'The spring is the gloomy time of the American year,' said the judge, "'and it is more peculiarly the case in these mountains. The winter seems to retreat to the fastnesses of the hills, as to the citadel of its dominion, and is only expelled after a tedious siege, in which either party, at times, would seem to be gaining the victory. "'A very just and apposite figure, Judge Temple,' observed the sheriff, "'and the garrison under the command of Jack Frost make formidable sorties. You understand what I mean by sorties, monsieur, sallies in English, and sometimes drive General Spring and his troops back again into the low countries.' "'Yes, sir,' returned the Frenchman, whose prominent eyes were watching the precarious footsteps of the beast he rode, as it picked its dangerous way among the roots of trees, holes, log-bridges, and sloughs that formed the aggregate of the highway. "'Je vous entends. De l'eau country is freeze up for half de year.' The error of Mr. Lacroix was not noticed by the sheriff, 
and the rest of the party were yielding to the influence of the changeful season which was already teaching the equestrians that a continuance of its mildness was not to be expected for any length of time. Silence and thoughtfulness succeeded the gaiety and conversation that had prevailed during the commencement of the ride, as clouds began to gather about the heavens, apparently collecting from every quarter, in quick motion, without the agency of a breath of air. While riding over one of the cleared eminencies that occurred in their route, the watchful eye of Judge Temple pointed out to his daughter the approach of a tempest. Flurries of snow already obscured the mountain that formed the northern boundary of the lake, and the genial sensation which had quickened the blood through their veins was already succeeded by the deadening influence of an approaching northwester. All of the party were now busily engaged in making the best of their way to the village, though the badness of the roads frequently compelled them to check the impatience of their animals, which often carried them over places that would not admit of any gait faster than a walk. Richard continued in advance, followed by Mr. Lacroix, next to whom wrote Elizabeth, who seemed to have imbibed the distance which pervaded the manner of young Edwards since the termination of the discourse between the latter and her father. Marmaduke followed his daughter, giving her frequent and tender warnings as to the management of her horse. It was, possibly, the evident dependence that Louisa Grant placed on his assistance, which induced the youth to continue by her side, as they pursued their way through a dreary and dark wood, where the rays of the sun could but rarely penetrate, and where even the daylight was obscured and rendered gloomy by the deep forests that surrounded them. No wind had yet reached the spot where the equestrians were in motion, but that dead silence that often precedes a storm contributed to render their situation more irksome than if they were already subject to the fury of the tempest. Suddenly the voice of young Edwards was heard shouting in those appalling tones that carry alarm to the very soul and which curdle the blood of those that hear them. A tree! A tree! Whip! Spur for your lives! A tree! A tree! A tree! A tree! echoed Richard, giving his horse a blow that caused the alarmed beast to jump nearly a rod, throwing the mud and water into the air like a hurricane. Van tree! Van tree! shouted the Frenchman, bending his body on the neck of his charger, shutting his eyes, and playing on the ribs of his beast with his heels at a rate that caused him to be conveyed on the crupper of the sheriff with a marvellous speed. Elizabeth checked her filly and looked up with an unconscious but alarmed air at the very cause of their danger, while she listened to the crackling sounds that awoke the stillness of the forest. But the next instant her bridlet was seized by her father, who cried, "'God protect my child!' and she felt herself hurried onward, impelled by the vigor of his nervous arm. Each one of the party bowed to his saddle-bows, as the tearing of the branches was succeeded by a sound like the rushing of the winds, which was followed by a thundering report, and a shock that caused the very earth to tremble as one of the noblest ruins of the forest fell directly across their path. One glance was enough to assure Judge Temple that his daughter and those in front of him were safe, and he turned his eyes in dreadful anxiety to learn the fate of the others. Young Edwards was on the opposite side of the tree, his form thrown back in his saddle to its utmost distance, his left hand drawing up his bridle with its greatest force, while the right grasped that of Miss Grant so as to draw the head of her horse under its body. Both the animals stood shaking in every joint with terror and snorting fearfully. Louisa herself had relinquished her reins, and with her hands pressed on her face, sat bending forward in her saddle, in an attitude of despair mingled strangely with resignation. "'Are you safe?' cried the judge, first breaking the awful silence of the moment. "'By God's blessing,' returned the youth, "'but if there had been branches to the tree we must have been lost.' He was interrupted by the figure of Louisa, slowly yielding in her saddle, and but for his arm she would have sunk to the earth. Terror, however, was the only injury that the clergyman's daughter had sustained, and with the aid of Elizabeth she was soon restored to her senses. After some little time was lost in recovering her strength, the young lady was replaced in her saddle, and supported on either side by Judge Temple and Mr. Edwards, she was enabled to follow the party in their slow progress. 
"'The sudden fallings of the trees,' said Marmaduke, "'are the most dangerous accidents in the forest, for they are not to be foreseen, being impelled by no winds, nor any extraneous or visible cause against which we can guard. "'Their reason for their falling, Judge Temple, is very obvious,' said the sheriff. The tree is old and decayed, and it is gradually weakened by the frosts until a line drawn from the center of gravity falls without its base, and then the tree comes of a certainty. And I should like to know what greater compulsion there can be for anything than a mathematical certainty. I studied math— Very true, Richard, interrupted Marmaduke. Thy reasoning is true, and if my memory be not over-treacherous, was furnished by myself on a former occasion— but how is one to guard against the danger? Canst thou go through the forests, measuring the bases and calculating the centers of the oaks? Answer me that, friend Jones, and I will say thou wilt do the country a service. Answer thee that, friend Temple, returned Richard. A well-educated man can answer thee anything, sir. Do any trees fall in this manner but such as are decayed? Take care not to approach the roots of a rotten tree, and you will be safe enough. That would be excluding us entirely from the forests, said Marmaduke. But happily the winds usually force down most of these dangerous ruins, as their currents are admitted into the woods by the surrounding clearings, and such a fall as this has been is very rare. Louisa by this time had recovered so much strength as to allow the party to proceed at a quicker pace but long before they were safely housed they were overtaken by the storm, and when they dismounted at the door of the mansion-house the black plumes of Miss Temple's hat were drooping with the weight of a load of damp snow, and the coats of the gentlemen were powdered with the same material. While Edwards was assisting Louisa from her horse, the warm-hearted girl caught his hand with fervor and whispered, "'Now, Mr. Edwards, both father and daughter owe their lives to you.' A driving northwesterly storm succeeded, and before the sun was set every vestige of spring had vanished. The lake, the mountains, the village, 